any of you in person. Welcome to the April 23rd, 2022 meeting of the Arlington County Board. I am Chair Katie Crystal. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Vice Chairman Mr. Dorsey, Ms. Garvey, and Mr. DeFerrantis, and Mr. Karen, Mr. <laughs> DeFerranti, Mr. Karen Tonis is remote today, joining us for medical reasons. He has been exposed to COVID-19 and is isolating out of caution. He is joining us from the Columbia Pike area in Arlington. Mr. Karen Tonis, can I confirm that you're on the line? I am. Can Good you hear morning, me? Sir. I, right. I hope so. <laughs> okay. Thank you to those who are here in person today, as well as those remotely on Microsoft Teams. Just a couple of comments before we get underway. Um, notably, about a month ago, or maybe more, the manager did revise the mask policy in county public facilities based on guidance from the CDC and the Virginia Department of Public Health. So of course, masks are now optional. Um, board members or senior staff were continuing to practice social distancing. Um, we encourage wearing masks uh, on your preference and uh, distancing as well to the degree you feel comfortable. Um, some members of the public, as well as county staff and other presenters, will be participating remotely. Um, for those who are speaking today, either a public comment or plan to speak on one of our items, um, a quick operational note, that podium right in front of you can be adjusted up or down using the arrow buttons on the right. We ask that you speak clearly in the microphone, into the microphone. That not only helps us hear you, but helps you get picked up uh, on the microphones so that anybody following along at home can do so as well. If you will be submitting documents as part of your testimony, please hand them to our deputy clerk, Mr. Kirshner. He can take those and distribute those to the board members. If you could include your name and contact information so we know how to follow up with you, that would be terrific. Um, for those speaking remotely, virtually today, please do keep your microphones muted and your cameras off until you're called on to speak. That helps us manage the bandwidth. If you're calling on phone, you will need to unmute yourself using star six. If you are using Teams on an app or your browser, um, please just click the microphone on the toolbar. We have a Spanish language interpreter on the line this morning who can help with individual translation for public comment. Buenos dias, are you with us, our translator? If you could introduce yes. yourself. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Laura Castro. I will be your Spanish interpreter. Buenos dias a todos, Laura Castro, interprete de español. Thanks. <laughs> Gracias, Señor Castro. Okay, occasionally you might see board members get up, stretch our legs, just so you know. Uh, there are speakers and monitors in the back. We promise we are following along, even if you lose sight of us briefly. Um, I believe we are ready now to hear from our public comment speakers. Um, we thank you, public comment speakers, uh, for your uh, support of our one speaker per topic rule that helps us move on to our main items um, in an a, a, a effective manner. So, um, without further commentary, Mr. Kushner, could you call our first public comment speaker? Yes, our first speaker is Alan Gadhar, followed by Jimmy Brown. Good morning, Mr. Gadhar. Good morning. Can you guys hear me? We can. All right. Good morning, Chair Crystal, members of the County Board. The Civic Federation passed a resolution on the impact of the recent spike in real estate assessments and the tax rate, with suggestions for uh, future guidance for the County Manager. By the end of the fourth quarter each year, Arlington can, can accurately project the level of increase in real estate assessments for the coming year. Real estate tax bill increases in Arlington are due to increases in property assessments, producing new revenue to the county, even when the base tax rate has remained flat or been lowered. Arlington has one of the highest median tax rates in the country and ranks 40th of over 3,000 counties in the country, while Virginia tops the list for foreclosure rates associated with property tax increases. The overall value of residential real estate in Arlington has now increased another 5.8% in the last year, and the average assessed value of single-family residences has had a cumulative percentage increase in actual dollar costs of 55% over the past 10 years. The average family now pays $2,700 more per year in additional taxes than were paid in 2012. In places with rising home values, rents also tend to increase, and poor homeowners and renters pay more of their incomes and property taxes than any other income group. In over 10 years, Arlington has not lowered its tax rate to offset successive increases in property assessments, meaning that the effective tax rate has risen every year over the past 10 years. Increasing real estate tax bills via rising assessments and the base rate tax increase housing costs and make home ownership and renting less affordable for all, especially for those living on low or fixed incomes. Additionally, the county manager's budget proposes over 100 county new positions to add to over 400 vacant positions, which is over 10% of the staff, likely resulting in surplus funds due to unfilled positions. Therefore, the Civic Federation urges the County Board to include a provision in its annual budget guidance to the County Manager, 
requiring the manager to take into account the impact of the effective tax rate increase on county residents in order to balance new spending with reasonable mitigation of the growing tax burden. Thank you, Thank you. Mr. Gudger. And our next speaker is Jimmy Brown, followed by William Lawson. Good morning, Mr. Brown. How you doing? I'm a, I'm a little of a mover, so I don't like to sit still. Cracks, holes, loose footing, and long waits, broken fingers, sprained ankles, and hurt knees. I want to give you some numbers. 40 to 2, 26 to 1, 28 to nothing, 30 to 2, 26 to 2. Those numbers were taken at Walter Reed Community Center between pickleball players and tennis players. Of 4 p.m. to 8 p.m., April 11th through the 15th. Now, in any sport, that's a blowout. Pickleball is dominating tennis. I want to give you another number, 86. There are 86 permanent tennis courts in Arlington County. There are zero pickleball courts in Arlington County right now. But Jimmy, what about Lubber Run? Great question. It's not a permanent pickleball situation. There's no permanent netting. And the wind and the sun are a problem every day. Now, here's the deal. This sport is only gonna grow. You know why I know? Because I've been teaching PE for 23 years. And every middle school and high school in this area are teaching the great game of pickleball. It's only going to grow with the next generation. So here's my conclusion, my thought, my question. In the eighth richest county in the country, why do people have to travel to Chantilly, Centerville, Rockville, and even Woodbridge Mr. and Warrington Mr. to play on elapsed. permanent pickleball locations. Brown. Thank, Thank you, you. Our next speaker is William Lawson, followed by Kit Norland. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Barnes Lawson. A couple of my builder clients and an engineering firm that I work with has asked me to come this morning and bring to your attention. Uh, some of our builders are having trouble getting final certificates of occupancy. Uh, based upon some, some site issues. And um, uh, the purpose isn't to come here and criticize staff. Um, <clears throat> we're all well aware of how hard it is to get back to uh, business as usual, given COVID and, and so forth and so on. Uh, what I'm here is to ask if the manager could get somebody with authority to uh, sort through the bureaucracy and solve some of these issues. Uh, we would very much appreciate it. The, the reason they asked me to come this morning is we have purchasers now that are uh, losing uh, loan commitments. Uh, we have purchasers that are having to find temporary housing. And it's a little bit of a strain. We think these are things that could be easily resolved. Uh, when I began my career, uh, we used to meet routinely with the county. Uh, in fact, uh, Nan Walsh used to uh, attend those with me. And we've kind of gotten away from that. And so if maybe we could have a, a start that back up and at least have, have one meeting to try to sort through these immediate things, uh, we would appreciate it. And I'll hand this to the clerk. These are a couple of uh, the issues. And thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lawson. All right, and our final speaker is Kit Norland. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Dorsey and uh, Vice Chair Dorsey, uh, Chair Crystal and Vice Chair Dorsey, members of the board. Earlier this month, the United Nations Panel on Climate Change summarized the latest research on reducing the effects of climate change. The conclusions made by 278 authors from 65 countries are captured in headlines like 
It's now or never to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, and only political will stands in the way of meeting Paris targets. UN Secretary General Guterres stated, the latest report is a litany of broken climate promises. In light of this and Earth Day yesterday, now is an especially opportune time to hear how our local leaders are tackling climate change as the top existential priority. One step taken by thousands of localities across the US and the world is to declare a climate change emergency. Richmond, for example, adopted a resolution last fall declaring the existence of a climate and ecological emergency that threatens Richmond and the Commonwealth. The resolution urges leaders to integrate climate change into the city's master plan. For example, it calls for reducing carbon dioxide emissions by 45% from 2010 levels by no later than 2030 to provide a chance to avoid disastrous impacts. The resolution also commits to mobilizing residents through faith, youth, labor, and racial justice groups, and other allies they recognize are vital to mobilize to address the crisis. Given the UN's alarming reports, it's a critical time for government officials to explain loud and clear how you are leading and meeting the greatest challenge of our time. What steps are being put in place, for example, to ensure a whole of government response? What specific actions, including using the free vehicle of your bully pulpit, are you taking to raise awareness and enact change to lessen the impacts of climate change and give future generations hope of inheriting a livable planet? Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Arlen. Appreciate that. Okay, as is our custom, I'll take a brief moment to respond to public comment and invite my colleagues to do the same. Thank you to everyone who joined us. Mr. Gadjar, great to see you. Thank you for your work leading the Civic Federation, which is always really active stakeholder in budget conversations and appreciate the look forward to fiscal 2024, just as we finish up our 2023 process. Um, appreciate the, the reflectiveness about um, the impacts of rising home values uh, on property taxes. Um, I will note uh, the tax rate, as you noted, is of course separate from the assessed value of your homes. Um, and so you mentioned Arlington having the highest median tax rate. Um, not the case uh, at all. In fact, we have one of the lowest tax rates in the region. It is because property values are growing uh, so quickly in Arlington um, that folks find themselves paying more. Um, one thing to just note, uh, or two things to note rather, um, one of the things we've been particularly keenly aware of is the need for relief from the vehicle property tax as part of this budget. And so um, those who followed our budget uh, wrap up session yesterday or Thursday, and will follow us on Tuesday they will hear us talk about some plans um, for relief from the uh, uh, spikes in the valuation of used vehicles, um, which we so hope will support Arlingtonians whose home values, vehicle values, and others um, uh, have spiked during this uncertain time of inflation. Um, and then just as a final note, uh, you mentioned also low and fixed income homeowners, um, which is a really key consideration of ours. Um, a few years ago, of course, with uh, much input from the Civic Federation, um, we revised uh, the, um, uh, both the rules and also the outreach and efforts underway on our real estate tax relief program. So we really appreciate the Civ Fed's ongoing partnership to make sure um, fixed income and especially low income homeowners, uh, oftentimes seniors, uh, are able to avail themselves of that program. Um, but all of which is to say your broader point about direction for fiscal 2024 is heard and I think will very much be taken under consideration. Um, Mr. Brown, thank you for coming in to talk about pickleball. I can imagine you are an incredible PE teacher uh, based on your dynamism, so we appreciate hearing from you. Uh, I know that this is an ongoing challenge, trying to find the right balance of our public facilities between pickleball and tennis. Um, uh, I know this is one that our Parks and Recreation Department mm -hmm. remains actively involved in. You also mentioned some concern about maintenance of facilities, which is, I think, something we could, can and should focus focus on even apart from uh, conversations about how to um, uh, adequately divvy up resources. Um, Mr. Manager, is there anything you can say for those, or perhaps we have one of our ombuds people on the line about how people um, can report and if necessary escalate problems with maintenance on our recreation facilities? Sure, uh, and we have Ben Aiken on the line, specifically on Walter Reed. The uh, county went out and resurfaced that court um, last season, and the court is in need of permanent uh, fixes because the changes that we made to the court, um, the underlying cracks, the underlying substructure needs to be completely redone. That is an issue for us to discuss during the CIP, and I'll be, be uh, bringing proposals together next month. Tom Mitchler, who's with the Department of Parks and Recreation, has gone out and walked the court um, and taken a look at it, and we'll see what we can do to try to remediate it in the meantime. But people should understand that in order to fix that court, 
it will need to come out of service for an extended period of time to fix it permanently. So that is the choice we face in the interim. Uh, it continues to be used. Uh, it's not a perfect court, but it's certainly a usable court. But I encourage Mr. Brown or other people to get in touch, and we've heard from a number of people on this already, uh, to continue to leave information with us about the status of courts. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Um, speaking of our ombuds people, uh, I think it sounds like we've got Mr. Aiken with us and um, Mr. Lawson, your comments about challenges getting certificates of occupancy. We appreciate hearing from you in that regard. Um, I know both Mr. Aiken and then his colleague, Ms. Thomas, um, often liaise with members of our business community as well. Um, I wouldn't uh, be so bold as to proffer them as the key point of contact, but I think we can follow up and talk with them uh, and find out who the right person for you and your clients could be. Um, Ms. Norland, thank you for coming in. I One of the best places I could direct your attention immediately to hear what the board is thinking and doing on climate change is the tape from Thursday's session. We talked extensively about climate in this budget. It is a key focus for this budget, um, as it is for uh, really all of our work. Um, the manager, uh, in, in partnership with us, um, unveiled plans for a new Office of Climate Coordination and Policy that we are really excited about, working hand in glove to with our air team to help supercharge those efforts, bring a greater focus on climate. Um, if you'd like to stick around later today, we. We are uh, hearing a site plan for a project that um, comes in and I think exceeds our green building standards. We know a lot of our greenhouse gas emissions come from the built environment and so having projects um, that are net zero or reduce and um, otherwise push the envelope of what's possible on environmental efficiency are critical. Um, our community energy plan, you mentioned that call for having climate integrated into master plans. That is incredibly important to us as well. Our community energy plan is an adopted element of our comprehensive plan. We just updated it two years ago and our uh, on the cusp, in fact, I understand a large draft is circulating uh, of the action plan uh, to, to really give life um, and daily practice to some of those values in the CEP update. Um, and the final thing, because I always appreciate the opportunity to talk about it, one of the most important things I believe we can be doing as Arlington, as part of a region uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions is to continue transit-oriented development and allow people to live close to mass transit, live close to where they work. Um, that is why we have uh, so many initiatives underway uh, to expand housing choices in the county, uh, having people's ability to not have to drive long distances um, from further away in our region not only helps our air quality that we breathe on a daily basis, but it's one of the best things we can do to reduce overall greenhouse gas emissions. We really appreciate your advocacy. With that, let me hear from my colleagues. I think I saw Mr. Dorsey first, and then we'll go to Mr. DeFranti. Thank you, Chair, Chair Crystal. Uh, just a couple of comments on a couple of the uh, public uh, speakers this morning. Mr. Gadjahar, you know, I appreciate your uh, bringing the CIFED's attention to tax responsibility and the burden and the impact of year-to-year -year changes on people. Of course, we all feel it. And I'd just like to point out some larger comments that in the Commonwealth of Virginia, this impact uh, is, is by design. Uh, the Commonwealth has decided that it wants to position itself as a fairly uh, low tax burden state in terms of the taxes that are collected by the state. Um, so that it uh, falls in the median as far as state collected taxes, but overall the tax burden uh, in, in, the, in Virginia is fairly high. And that is because the predominance of taxes are collected at the local level uh, through property tax real estate. Without any comment as to whether or not that's fair, efficient, or effective, or I guess I should comment, I don't think it is. Um, but I, I do think that if we wanna talk about overall tax responsibilities in the Commonwealth, while of course this local government has the property tax at this disposal, I'd invite you to include our state representatives in thinking about the overall tax responsibility in the Commonwealth and how it is distributed to see if we can have a, a better mix. And I would invite uh, the CIFVET to join in that level of advocacy and I'd love to participate with you on that. And uh, Mr. Brown, when it comes to pickleball, I just have to share something because it was really or took me back to when I was growing up. Your zeal and passion and fervor for the sport reminds me of a PE teacher that I had in, in, in middle school. And then he uh, said things along the lines of, this is the next big sport, so you all are gonna learn to play it and play it well. Uh, I won't say exactly how long ago that was, but suffice it to say, people could have originated and paid down a mortgage um, in the time, time ago that that was. And this is not to say that you are off base in terms of whether or not pickleball will continue exploding in popularity. 
It's just to say that simply uh, being responsive to demand in, in playing sport and participating in sport is not an exact science. And while at this point in time there is a clear preference for pickleball in Arlington compared to sports like tennis, you know, these, these things shift. And if you'll forgive the local government for not being able to predict the shifts exactly as they occur, I think we're doing a good job in trying to respond to the overall demand, even if we don't have the permanent facilities that you would like. Thank you so much. And Mr. DeFranti, Ms. Garvey after. Sure, just uh, briefly, I think, um, Mr. Gajahar, from, from my perspective, um, the, the, uh, as we balance, we have been uh, lauding the great work of um, our, our public servants and first responders for so long, and we have lost uh, all hotel, uh, a significant part of our hotel tax revenue. So in order to uh, prioritize compensation, the balance for me in this budget was, was lean towards that investment in compensation, but you pointed us towards guidance. I do agree with, with the rate being quite low, um, but I understand the valuations, are, and, and I'm feeling and we're, we're all seeing the valuations uh, increase. So I really appreciate your forward look, and it definitely will, will be something I consider over the coming uh, weeks and, and months. And then, uh, Ms. Norland, um, uh, your comments about the report, the most recent report, resonate for sure. Um, and that's, I am thrilled that we, the, the manager and, the, and our board uh, on Thursday put forward the Office of Climate Response. That's essential. But beyond that, there's a detail that I think you didn't mention in specifically today, but we worked as a board, and I do think it is a component. I think the energy is the biggest component, but certainly um, valuing uh, our trees is a piece of climate response. So in that, if you look at that tape, uh, it's been requested for quite a long time, an updated tree canopy analysis. I don't want to get your hopes up too, too high that it's coming tomorrow, but we did put it in process so we can try and start it as early as possible after the mass, with, in conjunction with the master plan rubric. And um, the staff is going to be able to, we hope, going to be able to start some processes. So early in the next calendar year, there's 150,000 for that study. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Ms. Garvey. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> well, thank everybody for, for coming in and speaking. Um, just a couple things. Mr. Gajadar, I th thank you so much for coming in and speaking. And I realized listening to you that you come here often and we have, and we go, we have you all, the Civic uh, Federation here with us for our first meeting of the year and really appreciate you doing that. I think that's a great conversation. But what I realized was that in, in some ways, you have a lot of committees. I haven't actually sat down and talked with your committees on a whole bunch of different issues. And, and often when we have groups, they come in and kind of talk with us. My colleagues may, you know, I, for myself, and maybe they've met with some of my colleagues, but I'd be very happy to sit down with the folks at your tax committee um, or the government re reform committee. I think we've got a tiger. I think it's called tiger committee. Yeah, I would be happy to sit down and talk with those committees because sometimes that's a more effective conversation than, I mean, this is great, but it's also really good to be able to sit and have some back and forth. So I just, that struck me as you were speaking and I would be happy to sort of volunteer to, to do that and have some good conversations with people because it's always, always helpful. Um, I enjoyed um, uh, Mr. Beans, the, 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 the pickleball advocacy. Thank you very much. Does, does anybody know how many temporary pickleball courts we have? Maybe not. No, I mean, say if you go on the, the county website, there's a listing of our outdoor pickleball courts, and we've just opened recently our indoor pickleball courts, for example, at Walter Reed and La Barone, they've been available. We've also, and I think I mentioned this last time people came in front of the board to talk about pickleball, we did a, a done a survey of users, and we're compiling those results and checking that against our PSMP criteria, and that's all gonna go into our CIP proposal for next month. So um, I know that the, the point was that there's not a specific place in the county where the only thing you can ever do on the court is pickleball, though there was, is one at Lubber Run where the courts aren't, where the nets aren't out there permanently for a reason, but there are uh, a number of locations, and I would encourage people to go into the county website type in pickleball, and there's a calendar there saying exactly when uh, courts are available. Thank you, thank you. And I, and I know the, um, Mr. Bean, the, 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 the point was that it's not permanent, but there are a lot of temporary, and actually given the way we have space, and we'll probably talk about this during our CIP, 
the space considerations, it's hard for us to take some space and just allocate it to one thing only and nothing else can happen on that space. So we'll, more, more, more to come, but thank you for coming in. Uh, Mr. Lawson, interesting to know that there used to be a regular meeting. <laughs> um, that doesn't surprise me. I'm sure we'll, our staff will, will work with you on uh, f looking at those issues. Um, and Ms. Nor uh, Norland, thank you for coming in. Um, climate change, yeah, yesterday was, was Earth Day. I enjoyed listening to a radio show about the first Earth Day, which I remember, because I go way back. Um, but one of the things that struck me in our conversation in the budget um, was, and I, we all know it, but we don't focus on it so much, is how much of um, climate change needs to, it, how much uh, re removing carbon from the, from the atmosphere, et cetera, has to do with private people, not just government. Um, and when I read articles about what governments are supposed to do work, I, we kind of check them all off. Not that we're doing them perfectly, but, but we're doing a lot of what needs to be done. It's the 95% of everybody else that we need to find ways to support and help if we're really going to tackle that. Um, and I think we're going to have some interesting presentations a little later today, and we'll, we'll see about how some, some private uh, uh, companies are, are, are working on this issue. Um, but our, we have a chief climate officer. Is that the proper term? Was did I get that right, Mr. Manager? The new, the new is it Office of Climate Office of Climate Coordination and, Coordination and Policy and Policy. That's right. But there's an office anyway. We do have an office that's going to start, um, and part of their job, a, a large part, is going to be connecting with the public and 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 communicating back and forth about what needs to what needs to be done, how we can support people um, in their own private homes that want to work on this, and I think most people do, um, and I think that's a real step forward and actually a, a change I'm looking forward to because um, so much we do all of our own work, we concentrate on what we do, but there's this really large problem that we have to figure a way, out a way to uh, get a handle on too. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ms. Garvey. Thank and I know Mr. Carantonis has been patiently waiting, so we will go to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, thanks to, uh, to everybody who, who came to speak today. Uh, Mr. Gatner, I, I, um, I appreciate the, the Civic Federation's focus on, on this fiscal issue of, um, of increasing uh, you know, rapidly increasing uh, uh, home values and therefore also of the tax burden. Uh, Ms. Crystal has very eloquently, you know, mentioned that we are actually uh, doing uh, quite a lot for those who are on fixed and low income uh, and who can, who are actually f uh, facing a real financial burden here. We are, we are very sensitive to this. And uh, we are also sensitive to the sources or the, the reasons why we get there, uh, which is, you know, a lacking housing supply, a chronic starvation of our housing market with appropriate uh, supply. We have a demand for housing, which we are not responding to. And you, you mentioned also the, the rents that are going up, and this is <laughs> another. It's not like magically the rents are following uh, housing prices. It's that the demand for housing is expressed both on the uh, property market and on the rental market. So uh, this is a major challenge for us, uh, and this is why we will be, we are focusing on housing. We're doing as much as we can to um, make housing affordable uh, and to uh, smoothen or flatten the curve as it has been uh, you know, fashionable to say during the pandemic, and we learned what this means. So uh, this is the one thing. Another thing that I take from your from your uh, testimony, and uh, something that I think is a, a uh, I will be working on on this in the in the next year, is the balance between the the positions uh, or the the staff uh, positions that we are not able to to fill in those and and these that we are actually adding to the budget because functionally they are really needed it's not that they are exchangeable uh definitely not always most of the times they're not exchangeable but there is an issue of of uh in in our labor market we have uh, been suffering and uh, i have to say that the manager has been doing a incredible uh you know job to uh try to provide uh, the same uh, level of service or even better with uh, less staff or with a you know problem in 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 uh, trying to find uh and to staff the position that we need to staff um finally uh, to mr brown the key question i i take i take uh, i understand why there is a you know there is a fashion right now there is a the pickleball is an extremely popular sport i i believe that the, we learned uh, in the pandemic how important it is to have a responsive uh, 
you know, system where uh, where a physical activity is actually supported. I uh, do think that we have to up our game on maintaining this course, especially because they are used so much and because we are uh, we don't have any alternative but to ask uh, uh, to ask to for these courts to be uh, co-located or co-used by so many, by, by for, for 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 several different sports, uh, this is a this is a logistically you know tall task, and uh, I I am looking forward into the, into the discussions of the CIP uh, and further into uh, you know adding more sophistication uh, and focus uh, with the Parks and Recs Department to find ways to manage this uh, growing demand as we go forward. And final to Ms. to Ms. Nordland's uh, uh, remarks, um, uh, like my colleagues, I will um, you know refer you to the discussion we just had a couple of days ago. Uh, however, um, one of the reasons why political response to climate change has been so viscose, so timid, is that it is very difficult, unfortunately, to convey the level of sacrifice and the level of adaptation uh, every single of us has to make. The, the change of our lifestyles is right now the toughest task. And I appreciate your, your advocacy specifically because uh, I hope that it will move more of our, more our residents to uh, to consider the necessary changes as well. Um, we still have the burden to lead and I accept the challenge. Uh, but uh, this is the uh, use of the bully pulpit, as you said, to say we all have to change and this will be changes that will be not easy. This is not just a small adaptation. This is a major adaptation of, of, of our uh, lifestyles. Thank you. Mr. Kernhorst, thank you so much. And again, thank you to those who came in to speak for public comment and to my colleagues, as well as the manager for helping uh, with that response. We will move next to our consent agenda. Mr. Kushner, have we had any items pulled from our consent agenda? We have not. Okay, terrific. I do believe, um, well, let me begin with a motion and then I'm gonna turn to Mr. Carantona, so I believe as uh, a recusal to make. Um, do I have a motion to adopt the consent agenda? Second. All right, moved by Mr. Dorsey, seconded by Ms. Garvey. Um, and Mr. Carantonis. To you. Oh, Mr. Carantonis, you are on mute. Thank you so much. Here I go. And just let me uh, just pull up the the uh, exact uh, wording. I have it here. Okay. Uh, this is. Uh, a, a, uh, item 12 uh, under uh, constant uh, uh, items on the county board's uh, agenda on, of April 23rd includes a matter that involves the Ethiopian Community Development Council, ECDC. I am advised that under uh, paragraph 2.2-3112.A.1 uh, of the State and Local Government Conflict of Interest Act, I am prohibited from participating in the board's discussion of this matter because of a personal interest in the ECDC arising out of my employment with the Enterprise Development Group, an affiliate of ECDC, located on 901 South Highland Street in Arlington. Accordingly, while I will vote in the affirmative on all other constant items, I will not participate in the vote and or in any discussion regard, regarding item number 12. Great, thank you so much, Mr. Carantonis. Okay, is there any further discussion on the consent agenda? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Terrific. Okay, that carries unanimously. Um, as is our custom, I'm going to feature just a few items pulled from our consent agenda. We put items on the consent agenda because they are non-controversial, not because they are unimportant. And so we appreciate the opportunity to highlight a couple of the more noteworthy actions that the board just took. Um, the first is uh, an important issue for uh, a, a very topical national issue that has a small application locally, which is, of course, voting access. Um, uh, with the census, there are uh, implications uh, to 
split precincts in Arlington um, in an effort to cure them is the technical term. Our registrar uh, and board of elections um, works on amending the ordinance regarding polling places um, to identify alternative locations for polling places affected by construction as well as uh, those um, affected by split precincts um, as a result of redistricting following the census. So um, this of course brings us into code which is most important but I also really wanted to just take a moment and commend our registrar um, and Office of Elections for a significant amount of outreach that they did. I think um, uh, far more so than has usually been past practice to make sure that had some say in where they wanted to vote. Um, and of course, they will have uh, a quite a bit of communication underway between now and um, the June primaries and November elections so that folks know um, where they should be voting. Uh, next, we have, um, next slide. Great. Uh, an important project. This is just one more phase of a very big, very ongoing project, which is, of course, the Columbia Pike Multimodal Improvements. This is an effort to really transform the pike uh, into the boulevard, uh, as imagined by many of us who live there and certainly the community. Um, as part of the form-based code and neighborhoods plan um, about a decade and change ago now. We have just awarded a contract um, for the construction of the street improvements and utility undergrounding between Oak Street um, and South Orm Street, and then between South Oakland and South Wakefield. Um, so generally speaking, mid-pike. <laughs> and uh, for those who've seen what's happening at the West End, that will be coming east, wider sidewalks, much better pedestrian crossings, street lights, um, stormwater improvements, utility undergrounding, which is so important uh, for that visual appearance as well as the resilience of the corridor, more street trees um, and landscaping. So uh, we will perhaps experience a few disruptions along the way, but we are looking forward um, to the continued transformation of the pike. Next, um, a smaller, slightly speaking, project of feature um, is one that is about man managing stormwater um, on county property. But I did want to highlight it. We're really excited. This is the first one to come in or be awarded under our new prevailing wage initiative, which is an ordinance we adopted last year, which is a commitment to make sure um, that all workers uh, supporting county projects uh, under the employee of one of our contractors are paid the prevailing wage, um, which is a an important standard that reflects um, not only the value of their work, but also the cost of living in our very expensive region. So um, this is an effort that, that we are making to ensure um, that, that fair wages and labor standards are an important part of all the work that we do. And we are excited um, that this, this project will be the first, but not by any means the last, to embody it. And then finally, um, a couple of items on the behavioral health side. Um, we are, of course, uh, hardly immune from the opi opioid crisis and certainly um, the fentanyl crisis that has affected uh, uh, really the entirety of the nation at this point. Um, we have a variety of strategies underway um, in terms of our prevention and response uh, to the opioid crisis, and we really appreciate our partners at the Virginia Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services for their grants to help us combat substance abuse. So these are um, two grants. Uh, one is going to help with uh, our continuum of care, so supportive housing and treatment for individuals experiencing substance dependence. Um, and then the other grant will help with outreach coordination and prevention, which is uh, perhaps even more important. So um, we appreciate our partners at the state in that regard and look forward to continuing that work. And if you're interested, um, one of the, the key strategies that we have is training community members um, to, to, uh, be, um, uh, to be able to use and deploy and Narcan nasal spray, um, which is really important to prevent incidents of overdose and, and death as they're happening in the community. So that is something that every Arlingtonian can get trained on and access to. Um, and we have those resources right there if that's something that you're interested in learning more about. Okay, that concludes uh, our consent agenda. Um, and we will move now into our regular agenda. Thank you all for your patience as we get underway. Mr. Kushner, could you call our first item? Of course, give me just one moment. All right, item number 38 is the Penn Place Development and Park Master Plan and Design Guidelines. Um, site plan number 105. That is site plan number 105, phase development site plan amendment to amend the Pentagon City phase development site plan for parcel 1D. Then site plan number 105 site plan amendment for the block known as Penn Place to construct three 22-story office buildings. Site plan 1057-U-22-2, use permit for a public park located at 550 Army Navy Drive. 
um, and Site Plan 105-7-U22-1, use permit for a public high school with a design capacity of 300 students, the Arlington Community High School. All right, thank you so much. We really made you earn your keep with that one. It's a long item. <laughs> All right, um, I am going to turn first to the manager to introduce what I think is a pretty uh, robust staff team on this Ooh. and take it away with a presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, I'm going to mention uh, eight people, and then at some point as we get later in the item, I did want to talk about a few other people who've done some critical work on this. But Peter Schultz, uh, who's wearing the Aflac mask over there, uh, <laughs> will be with us. Marco Rivero, Joanne Gabor, Jeremy Smith. We have Anthony Fusarelli, Aaron Schreiber with us, and then Matt Matuzic and Linda Collier are here virtually. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Manager. I look forward to the headlines about Arlington County officials mocking mask wearing. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Schultz, we think your mask looks great. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Uh, <laughs> my name is Peter Schultz. I am the county planner of the Department of Community Planning, Housing, and Development uh, current planning section assigned to this pen place application. I have uh, numerous assistants here with me that I'll introduce at the end of my presentation. Just a quick summary of the requested actions. There is site plan to uh, amendment to discontinue the hotel, uh, a Pentagon City phase development site plan amendment, a site plan amendment for the development of Penn Place itself, a use permit for the public park proposed for the site, a use permit for the public high school, a park master plan and design guidelines, and I have Marco Rivero of the Department of Parks and Recreation, a planner there with uh, me to speak about the park master plan, and finally, an encroachment uh, ordinance request. Uh, the site location, uh, to take a broad view, is at the edge of Pentagon City, the northeasternmost corner, and an undeveloped site, the last undeveloped site. The last undeveloped site in Pentagon City, uh, on the edge with Crystal City. Thanks. To zoom in. To zoom in on the uh, site itself, uh, it's located in the northeasternmost side of Pentagon City. The hotel that you see in the site has been demolished. Uh, it is in a transit rich and And it is in a transit-rich environment uh, adjacent to numerous transportation, uh, existing and future transportation options. I will not read through all of these statistics, but a quick summary. It is 3.2 million square feet of office gross floor area, which includes the Helix development, uh, 95,000 square feet of retail, a child care center, and a community facility at the ground level of Tower 3, which we will speak about later, and about 1,980 parking spaces, all underground and centralized, as you'll see in upcoming slides. The site layout, you see the entire site being redeveloped with three 22-story office buildings, uh, one special building, uh, the Helix, which is up to 350 feet, does not have stories in the traditional sense. Three one to two story retail pavilions that stand alone. A 2.75 acre public park. All parking and loading, as I mentioned, under the site. Entrances at signalized intersections at the three corners of the site you see there. All the buildings are proposed to be approved at the same time. Key areas of staff review. The one year of public review of this process uh, include reviewing against the design guidelines adopted in 2013 for the original Varnetto proposed uh, iteration of Penn Place and the emergent at the time Pentagon City sector planning process. The developer's presentation will show you more of the architecture and the relationship to the public space and how the design of the site responds to planning guidance for the area, including the sector plan adopted in February and how the site design evolved over time. Here you see Pentagon City sector plan guidance, of course, buildings framing public space, including public sidewalks and public open spaces. 
speaking of the public space, the developer does propose approximately 2.75 acres of contiguous public space with different focus areas. Drawing on the design guidelines that were adopted in 2013 and 2014, however, the open space is consolidated, not broken up by public streets. Uh, the park will be built more or less at the same time as the entire development. And the park developed as a unity. However, the developer during the park design, as you'll hear uh, in the park master plan presentation, incorporates many of the principles that were articulated through the 2013 planning process. The public space incorporates the first segment of the green ribbon concept. The draft sector plan discussed uh, various characteristics of a pathway through the site with multimodal paving, a uh, multimodal pathway through the site with special paving and bordered by planting on both sides. Minimum widths of the street uh, uh, green ribbon segment include, uh, is a 15 feet wide east west through the site. And staff believes that uh, recent adjustments, again, through the public review process of this site plan, bring the proposed circulation pattern and park design in line with the guidance of the sector plan. And the transportation aspects of the plan, the developer made many significant changes to the transportation elements through this plan. They amended their site design and even moved buildings in order to ensure that the site and the area's transportation network functions with this development and accommodates future growth in Pentagon City. You see some of the highlights here, including major internal pathways for both pedestrians, cyclists, and scooters improvements to bike facilities on surrounding streets, and again, underground, uh, entirely underground centralized parking and loading, and coordination with county projects on three sides of this project. Sustainability issues, I will not read through all of these, but the developer is committing to LEED Platinum certification and an Energy Star or equivalent methodology certification minimum score of 90. As you will hear from reports from the commissions, the uh, E2C2 commission uh, gave this their highest rating so far of any development. Other proposed site features and amenities, these are associated with the developer's uh, request for additional density, including the build out, fit out, and cost-free lease for 30 years of a community facility, the Arlington Community High School, which will have a final permanent home, design, build, and maintain the 2.75 acre public park, which will have a public easement on it, a $30 million contribution to the Affordable Housing Investment Fund, a child care center available to the general public, public access to the Helix, county usage of the underground conference center, numerous on-site transportation improvements, and a public art fund contribution or on-site public art. The developer proposes zoning modifications to exclusions from gross floor area, the parking ratio, penthouse screening and height, and that includes to accommodate one of these revisions that were made through the public one year of public review process, uh, solar panels on the roof. Uh, driveway apron, apron widths, those are just to explain, uh, even though they are signalized and have pedestrian crosswalks, uh, technically we consider those parking and loading entrances to be driveways rather than street intersections, so they need a zoning modification, although for all functional purposes they are uh, like street intersections. And then the additional density with the amenities listed in the previous slide. Now I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, uh, Marco Rivero of the Department of Parks and Recreation to have a few words on the park master plan aspect of this application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Uh, again, my name is Marco Rivero with the Department of Parks and Recreation, planner and project manager for the Penn Place Park Master Plan and Design Guidelines process. I'm also joined by DPR landscape architect, Jer Jeremy Smith. The proposed PMP and design guidelines will supersede the Penn Place Design Guidelines Open Space Addendum, which was adopted in 2014, for an approximately two acre public space. The proposed PMP and design guidelines account for the area's proposed site and building layout, as well as the additional public space that may be created under this proposal. An extensive public engagement process commenced in May of 2021. This included two engagement opportunities through the remainder of the year. The engagement process was consistent with the county manager's six-step uh, public engagement guide. In response to health and safety concerns with in-person engagement related to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, all public engagement opportunities were conducted virtually. 
The first public engagement opportunity in May and June of 2021 focused on the review of the applicant's proposed design plan and the changes proposed to the existing Penn Place Design Guidelines open space addendum. During the second online engagement in December of that year, an updated proposed design plan incorporating the community's input was presented, in addition to an introduction of the master plan's design guidelines. Furthermore, additional community comments were provided as part of the parallel LRPC and SPRC processes. The Park and Recreation Commission and the Forestry and Natural Resources Commission reviewed the draft uh, PMP and design guidelines at their March 15th and 24th meetings respectively and provided letters of support. The proposed draft concept expands the two acre area envisioned in 2014 and the 2014 approval to an approximately 2.75 acre public space. The 12th Street Plaza uh, located on the south end includes but is not limited to a pollinator meadow, uh, tree canopy, seating groves among other elements. The central green at the center of the, uh, the graphic contains an approximately 10,000 square foot lawn space for casual use activities and potentially large events like concerts and movie nights. The green will be bordered by a hardscape market promenade which will also serve as flexible public space uh, it will also contain an amphitheater, decorative water feature, dog run facility, casual uh, seating nooks, and forest edge planting. The, Fer the, the Fern Street Plaza, located at the west end, provides a large grove of trees and a flexible use plaza, including opportunities for pop-up events, small markets, or, mar or small gatherings. The Eat Street Plaza, located on the east end, provides sculptural planters and integrated and casual seating opportunities, and is also closest to the proposed bus stop on South Eat Street. The forest at the north end of the site rises along that edge and will contain a, a ramp and stair connection from Army-Navy Drive. At the top of the meandering paths is the Forest Plaza, which will also contain a decorative water feature. Forest rooms are tucked within the canopy and will feature communal tables and natural seating elements. As Mr. Schultz mentioned, the east-west multimodal pathway is an integrated public space element which will be uh, implemented as part of the green ribbons uh, envisioned in the Pentagon City Sector Plan. It contains South Eat Street to the east, uh, it connects South Eat Street to the east with South Fern Street to the west and features distinctive pavers, wayfinding, and other design elements. It provides safe access for pedestrians, bicyclists, micromobility users as well as contains design features, including uh, additional tree canopy, shrub plantings, flowering gardens, a water feature, seating, repair stations with uh, micromobility parking opportunities. The applicant will provide greater details on the proposed park master plan and design guidelines. Um, I will turn it now to uh, Mr. Schultz, who will con uh, conclude uh, staff's presentation. The community review process began over one year ago with a community kickoff meeting, three virtual long range planning committee meetings, two park master plan online engagements simultaneously, a public in person walking tour, an online site plan review committee engagement, and three live virtual site plan review committee meetings, and then numerous commission meetings some of whom you will hear from today, uh, culminating with the County Board public hearing tonight. Uh, in conclusion, the proposed development meets the priorities and planning principles identified in the Pentagon City Sector Plan, as well as the Penn Place Design Guidelines as proposed to be amended today, and it, and as well as with other county adopted plans and policies. I will not read all these over, but it does correspond with the overall arch, arching goals of the Pentagon City Sector Plan. Therefore, again, I will not read all of these. Staff recommends that the county board adopt and approve the subject uh, site plan amendments, ordinances, and use permits. Thank you. Mr. Schultz, and thank you so much. Actually, I do have, yep. Uh, oh. With my colleagues, uh, again, Marco Rivero from the Department of Parks and Recreation, Jeremy Smith of the Department of Parks and Recreation, Joanne Gabor of the Department of Environmental Services, uh, and Aaron Schreiber of DCPHD. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. We look forward to more dialogue with uh, each of those colleagues you mentioned. Um, I'll turn next to the applicant, Mr. Shetler. Welcome. I imagine you'll be kicking things off. Good morning. Ms. Garvey, Mr. DeFrente, Chairman Crystal, 
Vice Chair Dorsey and Mr. Karantosis, it is such a pleasure to be here with you today after two years of uh, a lot of virtual meetings. And um, we are really excited to be here to present the next phase of Arlington's headquarters for Amazon by sharing our vision for Penn Place. You all know me, but for those in the room who I've not met and those online, my name is John Shuttler. I am Vice President for Global Real Estate and Facilities for Amazon. It's been a remarkable few years since we announced our HQ2 plans in 2018 and began opening our first office in Crystal City in 2019. We currently have over 5,000 employees and nearly 4,000 job postings in Arlington. This slide shows the three main phases of growth in phase of growth. In phase one, we leased and renovated over 800,000 square feet of office space in Crystal City. Phase two is our Metropolitan Park project, which consists of two lead platinum office buildings as well as 2.5 acres of new and renovated public park spaces that is scheduled to open in 2013. And phase three is Penn Place, which includes three lead platinum office buildings, the unique Helix building, and 2.75 acres of new public open spaces, along with ample retail, restaurants, a childcare facility, and a permanent home for the Arlington Community High School. All of these projects support Amazon's growth and enable us to deliver upon the job creation promises we made to Virginia and Arlington. This morning, we're excited to share our vision for Penn Place. Presenting with me today are John Savo, our lead architect with NBBJ, and Kate Orff, our lead landscape architect with SCAPE. We started our design process for Met Park and Penn Place by studying and the existing planning for the sites and Arlington's overarching planning principles. From strong alignment with the county's plans and our design goals and created these design precepts as guideposts and inspiration for our design teams. In collaboration with county staff and our community partners, we have designed Penn Place to embrace each of these important design precepts and community priorities. At Amazon, we aim to provide a resilient workplace for our employees and to be a welcoming and sustainable neighbor in the communities where we are located. We partnered with Arlington County to support our respective renewable energy goals through our agreements with Dominion Energy to create an Amazon Arlington solar farm, which will fully offset 100% of HQ2's energy needs and an estimated 83% of the county's government's energy needs. We are excited that our Penn Place design and the Helix in particular will, be, will bring people closer to nature. We prioritize unique programming in our community spaces along with vibrant local retail options. In 2021, we announced District Dogs and Raikau Coffee as our first local small businesses to sign leases at HQ2 as part of Amazon's pledge to bring local minority and women owned retailers to our headquarters. We also know that affordable housing is an important topic for the county and our neighbors. Since launching our housing, housing equity fund in 2021, Arlington County estimates that we have increased long-term multifamily affordable housing stock in Arlington by 22%. Examples of this include partnering to preserve and create over 1,300 affordable units at Crystal House, just blocks south of Penn Place, and to preserve over 1,300 units at Barcroft Apartments. Amazon has already contributed through low rate loans and grants more than $800 million to the affordable housing efforts in the region with more to come. As part of the Penn Place application, Amazon has made a $300 million commitment to fund affordable housing in Arlington, the largest of its kind 
in county history. With regards to the men and women that are bringing our HQ2 site to life as part of the construction workforce, I am very proud of the results of the labor standards we set at Net Park, and I am pleased to continue these construction practices at Penn Place. These labor standards have supported a well-compensated, high-quality, and diverse construction workforce, and they continue to raise the bar in the delivery of our HQ2. We are particularly proud that Penn Place will be the new home for the Arlington Community High School and its diverse student body. This new public high school space will support students pursuing a high school diploma in a non-traditional path with flexible schedules, including evening classes for students who work. We have been inspired by the mission and leaders of the Arlington Community High School and value this new partnership. Over the past six months, we redesigned the first and second floor of Building 3 to provide an expanded space with ample windows and natural light. We're excited that the county has prioritized education for the community facility and this school specifically that seeks to make success possible for every student. We have worked with Arlington Public Schools in a number of other areas, including donations of educational supplies during the initial stages of the pandemic and the creation of the Amazon Think Big space at Wakefield High School, which is set to open to students early next month. Since 2018, we have also committed more than $34 million in monetary and in-kind donations to local nonprofits community groups and businesses in the local community and those in need. Examples include supporting neighbor, neighborhood, neighborhood serving organizations such as the Arlington Community Foundation, La Cochina, Doorways Virginia, and Bridges to Independence. This is one of my favorite views of Penn Place. The elevated view over 12th Street emphasizes how the community is welcomed into the project with its broad entry corridors, lush landscaping, and inviting retail muse. We prioritize public space that allows for casual recreation and community gathering on a black block serviced by complete streets that support all modes of travel and with a focus on bikes and pedestrians. Over the past 14 months, we have worked diligently through the county's public review process and I want to thank the county manager, county staff, and all of the citizen-led committees for their valued input. This past summer, we invested three additional months of design time to respond to community and county requests. Mm -hmm. I can confidently say that our final plans for Penn Place are dramatically improved and that the project delivers on Amazon's, the county's, and community's goals for Penn Place. Now, John Savo with NBBJ will provide additional details on our plans for Penn Place, with a particular focus on the ways we have responded to the county and the community feedback through the LRPC, SRPC, and public space engagement process. I want to thank you for your time and partnership in helping shape this incredible vision for Penn Place. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, this last slide and the one that just preceded it show you the vision for Penn Place. Yeah, but this is the current reality. And uh, essentially, we have a vacant lot. A vacant lot that's challenged, too, by the noise and busy traffic of I-395 by Army-Navy. But it's also a site that, with development, it's going to have spectacular views out looking towards the north, towards the Pentagon, towards the Potomac, towards the National Mall in Washington, D.C. Our team would like to really thank uh, all the hard work that was put in in all the urban planning, this legacy of planning that we adopted and used as our guidelines uh, as we designed this project. And as particularly the Pentagon City Plan, 
which is something that we've, as a, as a project development team, have been part of and learned from and helped influence our design. From the beginning, um, as you look at these few, very few design goals in addition to the precepts that John talked about, our intent for Penn Place has been to contribute to community and to be seen as an integral part of the neighborhood rather than as a distinct campus. This meant making appropriate connections back into the cityscape and ensuring that the site was welcoming to the public as well as the employees, which, in, which included embracing nature as part of the project story. A few basics, and since Peter went through these, I'll go quickly through them. Um, you know, first of all, we have three major office towers the unusual helix and these three low rise uh, timber pavilions. And altogether, there's a little less than 2.77 million square feet. That does not include the helix. So, that's the reason for the difference between the numbers that Peter shared and mine. The helix by itself is an amenity building that amounts to about 392,000 square feet. And then there's additional square footage, as you see, for, for retail, for childcare, Arlington Community High School. Um, we are uh, going after LEED Platinum for the project, uh, and we'll talk a little more about sustainability in a few moments. And you've heard now a couple times, but I want to reinforce that, that over the last year, with community input, the public space is, has grown from 2.0 to 2.75 um, acres. And parking, about uh, 1,980 stalls and ample underground loading. So very early, we recognized an opportunity to break up the large block by creating new connections at mid-block where we could align with already existing streets or driveways. So our master plan proposed four new signalized intersections, three of those with crosswalks that contribute directly to the entry plazas and interior pathways of Penn Place. Three of the intersections include vehicular entries to an underground garage. You can see that with the blue arrows. Another important early decision was to place all loading facilities in a centralized underground location, freeing up the ground level for additional retail and creating an opportunity for large space users like the new high school. But the biggest benefit was the ability to replace the asphalt of streets with additional landscaping and safe through block corridors for pedestrians and multimodal devices. And we coordinated with county staff for the provision of new protected bike lanes on Army Navy Drive and South Eads Street for proposed transitway on a new proposed transitway on 12th Street South and a relocated bus stop on uh, South Eads. The, after we went through all this initial master planning, we really began this, this public process that we've been talking about. Um, John mentioned and Peter mentioned and others. So we, we started the LRPC, SPRC and public space uh, in engagements. And we began the first of what now amounts to more than 50 weekly project reviews with Arlington County staff. Together, these engagements resulted in many significant design modifications and, as you've heard, improvements to the project. I want to talk about those differences that happened after that public engagement, starting with some changes to the site. Examples of site improvements include a 15 foot wide east west, a multimodal path that will start the Green Ribbon in Pentagon City. We agreed to a large, or late, excuse me, a late change to the locations of our build two lines on three of the four surrounding streets, which resulted, as you've heard, in moving buildings and reconfiguring other buildings. Both above and below grade uh, advances, though, that, led, that re resulted from this include new protected bike lanes on South Fern, in addition to those on South Eads and, Navy, and Army Navy Drive a wider sidewalk on 12th Street South, and larger uh, sidewalk shy zones on other streets. A new right turn lane on Army Navy Drive and another on South East Street. And protected intersections at all corners. In response to a request for a more direct north-south connection, we added a generous stair at the Army Navy Drive to complement the forest walk. And with community input during the open space engagements, we also modified our public open space, including adjustments to our planning palette. Community input 
also resulted in major changes to the building architecture. And I'll go through those quickly, but additional sculpting of the towers and increased variety in facade, trees, tr facade treatments in order to create greater distinction between buildings. Clarification of tower base, middle and top. Expanding the amount of on-site solar and exposing the panels to create a much more interesting skyline. With all the changes above grade, that meant that the underground parking and the central plant below grade also had to be significantly altered. Won't be as evident, but was an important part of the design changes. And the late introduction of the Arlington Community High School, which we readily embraced and are very proud to be able to contribute to that, but it resulted in a redesign, as you heard, of Tower 3's podium. And so I also want to mention there are some strong activators at street level and in the public open spaces. So as you can see in this plan, I'm going to just touch on them each briefly. Yellow are the lobbies. And these are through building lobbies with entrances facing both outward and inward. The dominant peach colored areas are retail locations. With no loading docks at grade, there was an opportunity to have a much higher percentage of retail at the ground level and to expand that retail into the center of the site and draw people into it. All bike facilities are at grade, including the commuter bike storage, which you see in brown. So nobody has to take their bike down to a loading dock or through a parking garage in order to park, really encouraging bike use. And the base of the Tower uh, 3 includes childcare in purple and the Arlington Navy High School in lavender. So I said I'd talk a little bit more about sustainability. So we're going after 100% renewable energy and with Amazon going all electric for its energy needs and targeting in addition to that a 30% energy savings from the lead base model. Similarly, we are targeting 100% offset for carbon emissions and a 10% reduction in embodied carbon. We're aiming for a 50% water savings and tree canopy coverage of 46%. We are also collecting stormwater. It's not much on this slide, but we're also collecting stormwater in underground cisterns and treating it for reuse in things like toilet flushing, irrigation, and cooling towers, as well as providing chilled water thermal energy storage in three tanks below the towers they contain 1.2 million square uh, gallons, excuse me, of water, and these tanks will act like a battery and store cooling energy at night, reducing peak energy demand by up to one megawatt during peak times. This view uh, shows the project from Longbridge Park and how it will appear, how these buildings will appear in their surrounding context. Highlights the diversity of the skyline as well as the relationship of the buildings to their immediate neighbors. As proposed in, in the earlier design guidelines approved for the site, the helix is located in the northeast corner, which was identified as the preferred location for a signature building. And up close, the project is a welcoming urban park. And you'll hear more about that from my colleague Kate here in a moment uh, from Sagape. Um, it offers a broad range of experiences and the number of spaces that are intended for many different flexible uses, uh, but with intentional programming as well. And the outdoor spaces are designed to attract and delight all who share the site, including neighbors, retail customers, and visitors, as well as employees and students. So with that, I turn over to Kate Orff, uh, who will take you further through some of the, briefly through the evolution of the landscape design. Thank you. Welcome, Ms. Worf. Thank you so much, John, and good morning, all. Um, Kate Orff, the lead landscape architect for the project. I grew up in this area, and I couldn't be more pleased and proud to share some additional detail on the public open space design. So over the past year, we've worked really hard to incorporate the community's feedback, staff feedback, and I hope you can see uh, in this side-by-side -side comparison uh, the result. It's a welcoming, pedestrian-friendly plan, uh, and you can see the changes, the very dramatic changes that have occurred only in the past 12 months. 
So the site is really characterized by a significant east-west multimodal path and, uh, and a, a, a welcoming network of, of pedestrian pathways. So the evolution of the plan is truly a testament to this successful process. Uh, we heard uh, the community members, we uh, in, in incorporated staff feedback, we, we iterated on the design, and the end result is much improved. Is much improved. So here uh, on the site plan, uh, Mr. Marco Rivera walked you through some of the major elements. So I will um, just take you through uh, some of the main areas uh, on individually. But at a high level, uh, the plazas at 12th Street, Fern Street, and Ede Street are welcoming entries to this site. At the heart of the park, uh, we have a central green, which is really the most programmed and active area. To the north, the forest is the most densely planted location, and it's lifted above the rest of the park to create a unique area intended for relaxation and respite. We heard loud and clear from community members that a sort of nature immersive biophilic experience is desired, and that is really um, emblematic in the forest area to the north. So, this is a zoom into the 12th Street Plaza. It is a broad and expansive welcoming entry that literally, <laughs> visually, and, and physically connects south to Met Park. Uh, you can also see that the corner intersections uh, in this sort of diagonal uh, geometry uh, draw visitors into this active retail corridor and beyond uh, up into the central green. It's welcoming and permeable. Seating opportunities uh, are organized around a lush meadow, and we also have an aquatic pond, which you can see on the bottom left uh, image. Uh, this is designed to be a destination garden to attract people and pollinators alike. So the next slide shows you the central green. This is really the heart of the site, uh, and it, it's the center for the most active and programmed areas, including a lawn, a market promenade, you can see on the right-hand side here, an amphitheater and a dog run. And these are framed by a forest edge uh, with burying native shrubs and a confluence water feature, uh, which you can see on the lower left. This is an engaging display of water that cascades in waves over a stepped surface. And the idea here is not only is it beautiful to look at, but it creates a sort of a buffer uh, from the sound of the traffic uh, beyond. So the market uh, promenade, provides this complementary plaza space to accommodate more frequent and intense activities like farmer's markets. You can see in the, the bubble inset there, or pop-up events, but it really preserves the surface of the natural lawn for more casual gatherings and public enjoyment. Next, uh, the Fern Street Plaza uh, is the western terminus of the multimodal path, and it's characterized by true flexibility, as you can see in the image on the right. It's framed to the east and west by planting areas, and you can see movable tables and chairs and a shady tree grove. It'd be a great place to have a, a, a lunchtime uh, gathering. Next, uh, this is a little bit more detail on the east-west multimodal path. Again, this is a 15-foot wide shared use pass, path. And importantly, it's the first conceptualized link of the green ribbons concept. So the colored lines, as you can see in this diagram, uh, indicate the adjacent conditions, including the planting edges represented by green. So these call-out bubbles, these dark green call-out bubbles uh, and uh, uh, colorful call-out bubbles are really pulled directly from the sector plan. Uh, and they indicate the numerous strategies that we've deployed along its length to achieve an immersive and dynamic landscape. And, and I highlight this slide because it's really an example of the real-time changes that we've made uh, you know, as we're designing. Uh, and these, it's an incredible first test of the Green Ribbon Plan as outlined in this 2022 sector plan. It's a late, sta late st stage change, but you can see how we've embraced that and really applied uh, the ongoing and developing ideas. And I've just feel like this is a truly central aspect of the entire open space design now. It's very exciting. So I'll just spend a few moments clicking through some of the slides uh, that, and a series of views that move from west to east, from Fern Street Plaza to Ede Street Plaza. 
You can see the distinctive paving here. Uh, you can uh, it, see how it uh, works in conjunction with planted buffers, adjacent seating nooks. You can see in the left of this slide, a kind of a pull-out area to sit and rest. Um, and you can see how a slight bend in the route uh, will all contribute to a very, very safe and dynamic experience. There's, there we end on Ede Street. So this Ede Street Plaza is distinguished by raised planters uh, with integrated seating. They create small gathering spaces at the eastern terminus of the path, and you can see how they interface uh, with the retail base of the Helix on the right, and you can see uh, and, and it provides places for people to sit and rest waiting for the nearby uh, bus uh, and, and the bus stop just south of the 11th Street intersection. And finally, um, the Lifted Forest is one of the most beloved areas of the, the site. Certainly, it's one of my favorite areas. And in public meetings, uh, there has been a lot of uh, joy expressed uh, at, for this element. Its meandering walks and small forest rooms will be immersed in planting uh, to create a unique botanical experience of broadleaf evergreens, very large ferns, ephemeral spring bulbs, and really a delightful horticulture experience. The headwaters uh, is a dramatic water feature moment that's situated within the forest plaza, and it has a sloped cascade paired, paired with a quieter portion of moss-covered natural stone and trickling water. And so um, I will close on this slide, and this really zooms out, if you will, to uh, overlook uh, the entire open space and park design on a sunny day, not unlike yesterday, uh, at the Central Green. And you can see how all of these elements come together in a cohesive and welcoming park space. That completes our presentation for you today, and we look forward to your questions and continued discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Orff, as well as thank you to your colleagues. Please do stay close. We will hear now from our commissioners uh, and then from our public speakers. We'll begin, uh, as generally our custom, with the Planning Commission. Welcome, Chairman Weir, um, if you'd like to join our staff at that table. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the County Board. Uh, for the record, I'm Daniel Weir, and I am here, uh, pleased to be here as the Chair of the Planning Commission. I'm especially pleased to be here, I think, for the first time in person in two and a half years. It's good to see Welcome your faces uh, on a Saturday morning. Um, uh, uh, the, the Commission heard this item on April 4 and unanimously supports the County Manager's recommended actions. Uh, there were seven public speakers uh, whose comments are captured in the Commission's letter. Um, the item came to this Commission, to the Planning Commission, after being reviewed by both the Commission's uh, Long Range Planning Committee and Site Plan Review Committee, which were chaired by, uh, uh, between them, Elizabeth Gear and Tenley Peterson and Leo Sarley. I specifically mentioned Commissioners uh, Gear and Peterson and Sarley because this project came to the Commission uh, and now to you about as fully formed as <clears throat> any project I've seen in my decade of service on county commissions and working groups, <clears throat> excuse me, an especially remarkable fact uh, given the size of this project and I want to um, specifically note uh, their leadership in these, in, in, in the, in these roles, roles, excuse me. <clears throat> The Commission's discussion focused on the sufficiency of public space in terms of both quality and quantity, uh, whether the green ribbon was implemented in accordance with the Pentagon City Sector Plan, whether public spaces on the site were sufficiently safe uh, from undue surveillance, whether the existing and considerable sustainability features were sufficient, uh, and whether the Commission supported staff recommendation against a protected bike lane on 12th Street. On the topic of open space, the Commission would have liked stronger confirmation of whether the public spaces would be subject to easement, and if so, the extent of that easement. Uh, there was also a sense that questions of whether the space was successful uh, were questions that would need monitoring and the benefit of hindsight. Uh, that is, after all, um, uh, this is, after all, a very different kind of development for the acreage uh, than nearly every other site in the county. Uh, there was a general consensus that the green ribbon was successfully implemented. 
On the topic of surveillance, uh, commissioners were generally split between a sense that uh, people who use publicly available spaces for uh, generally protected activities should not be subject to heightened surveillance by companies with Amazon's kinds of resources and access to law enforcement. On the other hand, uh, other commissioners noted, and many of the same commissioners noted, that these topics have not really been raised even when the tenant is, for example, um, Boeing or DARPA, uh, or other organizations that don't just have access to government and law enforcement, but are government and law enforcement. Um, uh, <laughs> these are real concerns, and I, you know, I, I note a little bit of, of um, uh, I, I, I speak with a little tongue in cheek, and I, I, I note a little bit of laughter, and I, 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 you know, that it is, it is an amusing fact to point out. Um, but, but these are real concerns, and. And while we have not um, raised these kinds of issues in our comprehensive planning documents in the past, this very well may be the reminder that we need to begin thinking about these kinds of issues in our comprehensive planning documents. But that said, again, the commission uh, did not feel like there was uh, a basis in our comprehensive planning documents to, um, to weigh in on these issues uh, at this point. Um, there was a sense among commissioners that more could be done with respect to EV readiness in the garage, uh, but commissioners were generally happy with the sustainability aspects of the project. Um, finally, uh, the commission struggled uh, with the lack of access of protected bike lanes throughout the um, LRPC and SPRC processes. Uh, and in fact, this was one of the more conspicuous areas without consensus throughout the project. However, um, staff has explained numerous times that the transit aspirations for 12th Street uh, are such that they would be jeopardized by a cross section that invites pick up and drop off in the travel lanes for, uh, for buses, for transit. Um, the commission was eventually persuaded by this explanation, especially following the Transportation Commission's eventual acceptance of said explanation. I'll reiterate uh, that the commission supported the county manager's recommended uh, actions unanimously. Um, uh, that concludes my report. I'm gonna go grab my cup of coffee, but I'll be back here to answer any questions that come up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Weir, appreciate that. Uh, excellent, and thank you too uh, for that recognition of your colleagues. We hear from the Planning Commission, but of course that work builds on um, the many meetings of the LRPC and SPRC, as uh, Mr. Schultz's presentation noted. Um, is Mr. Heminger with us from the Housing Commission, perhaps virtually? Good morning, I'm here, can you hear me? We can, good morning, Mr. Heminger. Good morning, Chair Crystal and members of the board. My name is Mike Heminger, I'm here in my capacity with the Housing Commission today. Uh, the commission met on April 14. The commission voted six in favor with six commissioners abstaining. It's the first time I've ever seen this amount of commissioners abstain from any one vote. And I hope that my comments that follow will help detail some of the concerns that were introduced at the commission's meeting. While the commission is supportive of the overall project, many members expressed sincere concerns about missing information prior to the vote, uh, including the following. Commissioners would like more information about the equity analysis that county staff said they conducted as part of the site plan process. Staff said that this analysis took place, uh, but they did not provide any details to the commission. Some commissioners requested that this information also be included in the briefing to commissioners prior to taking action on future sites. At every meeting, we heard the term, I'm sorry, at every meeting in the county, we hear the term equity tossed around. Commissioners were quite surprised when no one could respond to how the applicant's project uh, stacked against the 2019 equity resolution. We're led to believe that every action um, that our government takes, uh, those uh, questions are a foundational component of the process. Commissioners felt that if there was ever a time and if there was ever a project that the equity resolution should be evaluated against, perhaps it was this project. Commissioners would also like more information on the county's mitigation plan uh, for potential displacement and higher housing cost burden, uh, which I'll talk about later, of residents in the surrounding neighborhoods. Several members of the public did raise concern about the issue and commissioners asked staff to what extent uh, potential, potential displacement had been analyzed and what mitigation strategies were in place. Unfortunately, staff did not have information about any analysis uh, that may be conducted or strategies to prevent displacement or higher cost burdens for residents and surrounding neighborhoods beyond the existing tools uh, already available for all low-income uh, residents of Arlington. Um, commissioners would like more information on how the $30 million AHIP contribution was calculated and why the county negotiated that specific contribution. 
Uh, staff did explain that the contribution was part of a broader analysis of uh, public benefits uh, against the developer benefits, uh, but it did not provide detailed information on how staff settled on the $30 million. Uh, multiple commissioners did ask this question, but uh, remained unsatisfied in the answer. Um, during our commission, I did ask questions on whether or not staffers and planners had reached out to leaders um, in cities like Seattle and San Francisco. Uh, we were surprised to hear that these dialogues have not occurred. I uh, just wanted to kind of give the board a couple of statistics um, in case you're not aware. From 2010 to 2017, the average price of a new single family home in Seattle uh, increased by 83.4%. It's nearly double the national growth rate seen in new home prices, uh, which was about 46% during the same period. Um, my request to you today is to please think about the, uh, what an 83% increase uh, will do in our own community. You know, for people like our seniors and others on fixed incomes uh, that are seeking to age in place, you know, our neighbors with disability, et cetera. Uh, think about uh, what that does to our community as far as who can live here, um, how our small businesses and restaurants and retailers will attract their workforce um, if those people can't live here. And also think about if these items really align with our county's mission statement of Arlington being a diverse and inclusive world-class urban community. Uh, board member Karen Tonis mentioned this earlier, but it's not just the buyers. Uh, we know that due to other factors like student loan debt, Millennials and Gen Zers are not purchasing homes and building generational wealth at nearly the rates that their uh, grandparents and grandparents did. We know that Arlington has a median age of 34. It's important that we're uh, that we're looking out for the interests of these folks as well. Um, at some point, people in my generation and the generation right behind uh, will simply not be able to afford to live here, which is very sad for me. It's well documented that large amounts of people that make well above six figures in Seattle and San Francisco are housing insecure, they live on the street, uh, streets, excuse me, uh, couch surf and more. Again, personally, I found it fascinating that we haven't been collaborating, communicating with those city leaders, uh, those planners and housing experts. Uh, Sharon Lee, who's the executive director of Seattle's Low Income Housing Institute said, uh, we have so many people that have fallen into homelessness or are at the very edge of becoming homeless uh, because of rent increases. They are literally being squeezed out of their home uh, that they have lived in for 10 and 20 years, which we see here in Arlington. Uh, she goes on to say, you could have multiple uh, housing code violations and you could still not to afford to live here. The beauty of following cities like Seattle and San Francisco um, is that if we're smart, we can get out in front of some of these missteps uh, that may have been made at other uh, cities that have resulted in the housing crisis that they're seeing. Um, however, if we do not, uh, I assume that we won't be immune to those macro forces and I also worry that our fate in Arlington will be sealed. Um, I, I think it's very important for us to acknowledge that Amazon, uh, we heard it this morning, has dumped over $800 million into affordable housing in the region. While many of us are celebrating that record amount of money for affordable housing, others of us are wondering why the world's most profitable company has spent almost a billion dollars in affordable housing in the region with more to come. Perhaps Amazon knows something that we don't know or perhaps as board member Karen Tonis mentioned this morning, we're experiencing a chronic starvation of affordable housing um, that's leading to additional disparities in other sectors of our life. Um, to bring it home, according to an article um, in Bloomberg from February of uh, this year, a Seattle suburb that attracted companies like Amazon has seen home prices soar uh, past Manhattan's. Again, just to reiterate, I do worry that that will uh, become the future of Arlington to close, uh, while we're confident that this proposal will sail through today, uh, I do ask board members to consider the following. If you have kids or grandkids or nieces or nephews, I'm ultimately asking you to think about how those little ones um, and those that are not currently uh, in our community, how they will be able to one day afford to live in this community too. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Heminger, for um, those extensive comments about San Francisco and Seattle. I know our Parks and Recreation Commission took this up from the perspective of Arlington County, and so I'm going to welcome uh, Ms. Koopa, uh, who I believe is either virtually or in person, to give us comments on behalf of the Parks and Recreation Commission. Thank you very much. Yes, um, <clears throat> my name is Shruti Koopa, and I am the chair of the Parks and Recreation Commission. Um, I want to just add have a couple of points on um, pen place here. First, um, support for the design concept, engagement process, and resulting site plan. Um, throughout this engagement process and the very various iterations, um, the applicant and staff documents and presentations made available, um, 
PRC representatives have been able to take note of the um, positive contributions um, the current design has gotten due to the public engagement process. Um, we are really pleased by the high priority on user experience, um, both for Amazon employees and the general public, of course. Um, no, we've lost new spaces Ms. and Ms. interaction Ms. of those spaces. If, if I could just pause for a second where you're cutting in and out, maybe one thing that could be helpful is for anybody on our line who is not speaking, if you could turn off your video and mute yourself, which I think most are. And Ms. Kupa, if you're having trouble with the connectivity, if you click the turn off incoming video, sometimes that helps uh, clear as well. We wanna make sure we catch all of your comments. Thank you. No, thank you very much. I'm gonna do that right now. I appreciate it. Um, all right, so continuing, um, we're really, in a, um, enamored by the biophilic design principles, of course. Um, this has been embraced by Amazon since the creation of this project. Um, and uh, we're really excited about how this project will um, contribute to the public spaces mass master plan and the Pentagon City sector plan as well. Um, I think that we, we, we would like to also just mention here that um, population projections for this community and the available public space are still misaligned in Arlington. We will always fight for more public space in our communities. Um, public open space is critical for the growth of Arlington. Um, and so as we're really encouraged by this um, public-private partnership that we're seeing, we want to make sure that it is continued. Um, uh, and, and land acquisition is something that the county continues continues to make a priority. Um, and so I'll close with that. And I just want to say we're really pleased um, with the uh, with the, the, the updates that we've been hearing so far. So thank you. Chair Koopa, thank you so much. We appreciate you. And um, if you and our other commissioners could stay close, we may have questions as well about the dialogues that you and your colleague had have had. Um, all right, Mr. Krishner, I believe we do Definitely. have public speakers. So if you could call those for us, please. Of course, give me just a moment. All right, our first speaker is Alyssa Marlowe, followed by Diana Ortiz. Good morning, Ms. Marlowe. Push it? Sure. Uh, good morning, thank you for your time. Uh, I rented at 12th and Eads for a number of years, and now I own um, a about a $400,000 condo in 22202. I'm here to ask the county board for greater transparency in the financial calculations and how the community benefits government. This would ensure that neighbors and various special interest groups are not left to fight over what benefits our community most with each other. As I asked at the Housing Commission, for example, is $30 million enough for affordable housing when Amazon spent $19 million lobbying last year? With Many county staff now working for Amazon, and I heard that a form, the former Arlington County lobbyist to Richmond is now the Amazon County lobbyist, I'm sorry, I said that wrong, is now the Amazon lobbyist to Arlington County. Please reassure me and other residents that you and their staff have the best interest in mind of the community, not your own or theirs. Since county staff refused to meet with condo owners in 22202 regarding the Pentagon City Sector Plan and condo values have gone down during COVID, I hope that Amazon's partner, JBD Smith, will hear residents' concerns, not just those from special interest groups. One of which is that the Riverhouse parking lots are frequently used for children who are in a very lower income part of Arlington to ride bikes and skateboards. And so I ask Amazon staff here to make sure that those people are, have a place to safely ride rather than on the streets. Um, that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your comments. Our next speaker is Diana Ortiz, followed by Emily Gage. Good morning, Ms. Ortiz. Good morning, everyone. I am, thank you for having me here. I am Diana Ortiz. I am the president and CEO of Doorways. We are the Arlington's response to survivors of domestic violence and sexual abuse. And we also support our families and youth who are experiencing homelessness. After serving Arlington more than 45 years, Doorways commitment to continue this mission is strong as ever. And we rely heavily on that partnership of both public and private <coughs> sectors which ensure that we can to be responsive to those evolving needs of our community. 
In the few years that Amazon has been part of our community, they have demonstrated on their own commitment to serving this community, and we're honored to consider them our partners in these efforts. Since announcing that they will make this their home, Doorways has been honored to be selected by Amazon, in particularly during COVID-19, where the demand and anticipated challenges were over the top for our agency and for our clients. Amazon helped us address those increased needs of those most vulnerable neighbors. We are eager to build this strong foundation on Amazon as they continue to grow and make this part of their home. And we really are excited about the future that we're building together. Again, we look forward to continuing to partner with Amazon in our efforts to end homelessness and to make this Arlington a community that is free of violence and safe for all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Ortiz. Thanks. Our next speaker is Emily Gage, followed by Avril Usuri Sisk. Hi, everyone. I'm Emily Gage, the executive director of Phoenix Spikes. We're an Arlington nonprofit that offers after school and summer programming for middle and high school students. We teach them how to fix bikes and then we get them out riding, racing and volunteering using their mechanic skills in the community. Um, and I would, we always like to say that we have an outsized impact on the community, but we are still a modest size reaching three to 400 students a year. And I would say when Amazon first announced that they were coming to Arlington and calling HQ2 home here, it was easy to assume that we would be kind of overlooked and I'm just so pleased to say that that has not been the case. They've been a tremendously engaged partner, um, similar to how Doorways explained it. Um, and uh, we've just been really pleased to be a partner with them over the past three years. Um, they have talked about you know, integrating their physical space into the neighborhood and the same has extended to their sense of community engagement where they feel less like a giant corporation and more like an Arlington neighbor, really helping us to um, further the goals that we all share of, of growing this region inclusively. I'd say it's been helpful for us to know their clear goals. They've talked about sustainability, affordable housing, racial equity, um, building small businesses, and that they're so bike friendly. All of those are important to us at Phoenix and it's been helpful for us to see them and understand them as a partner in our work um, and to understand how our priorities overlap. I'd say they've worked super hard at relationship building and that's been meaningful for us. They've taken the time to come to our space, to tour our shop, to ride with our students, to attend our events, to really understand what makes Phoenix tick and what our youth um, need and what their lives are like. And that's important for us. we have had a half a dozen Amazon um, team members come through and get to know us. Um, we're celebrating our 15th anniversary later this week, actually, um, with a celebration and we'll have Amazon members there. So really appreciate that they have been engaged with us and they've just had a very accessible team, learning and understanding what we're about and helping us understand them. So I see so many opportunities for the youth that we serve. It's undeniable that they'll have more opportunities in workforce development um, and in after school programming, thanks to Amazon. And we're really grateful for their support. Thank you, Ms. Gage. Our next speaker is Avril Yusri Sisk, followed by Robert Peck. Good morning. Good morning. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with my video. Um, I am here, Avril Yusri Sisk. I'm a resident of Arlington, and I'm appearing in my personal capacity to support the Penn Place development. The area of national landing is exciting and full of promise as it provides opportunity for local businesses. Uh, and my husband and I take frequent walks in the area, and we're very excited to see how it is developing. I'm especially pleased about the new home for the Arlington Community High School, right in the middle of all this activity, as well as the child care facility. Our students and working parents will directly benefit from this investment in our community. Further, there are ripple effects from this engagement. Large businesses like Amazon do a tremendous amount for our local community. They support schools, particularly Wakefield High School, nonprofits and community groups. They also support local businesses. In the public retail space between Penn Place and the Metropolitan Park, I understand that Amazon wants to fill at least 140,000 square feet of retail space, and the focus is to prioritize small, local, minority and women-owned retailers on the ground floors of the office buildings and in re the retail pavilion throughout the site. This focus on cultivating and nurturing women and minority entrepreneurs is both important and necessary and offers lasting economic benefit to this community. 
The neighborhood will have many attractions and will be even more walkable than it is now. National Landing, Penn Place, they all stand to offer so many benefits for Arlington and the entire region. And the growth of this area is something that I look forward to very much. Thank you for your consideration of my remarks. Thank you very much, Ms. Isk. Right. Our next speaker is Robert Peck, followed by Steve Cooper. Hello, good morning, county board members and other attendees. Thanks so much for having me. Um, my name is Robert Peck. I'm the CEO of Commonwealth Joe Coffee Roasters. Our flagship cafe is located in Pentagon City between Met Park and the proposed Penn Place development. And I've been living in Pentagon City for the last six years and in Arlington since 2009. Um, I've also participated in some of the public workshops ops and planning sessions for Pentagon City. Um, as a millennial small business owner and a resident in Arlington, I just wanted to speak in support of Amazon's Pen Place development um, and their plan. You know, one thing that I've really appreciated about Amazon is that they've been very welcoming and they've taken the time to understand and engage with the community. They've been a great neighbor to date. Um, they've patronized our cafe. They've taken the time to get to know us and our business. Even John Schotler, uh, who spoke earlier today, uh, made time to meet with me one-on-one -on -one over coffee to learn more about the neighborhood and about our coffee business. And just knowing how busy John is, it really showed how much Amazon truly cares about the community and local businesses. Um, you know, I think a few of Amazon's guiding principles they had on their slide earlier were to engage with the community, to enrich the public realm, to be open and welcoming, and also to be accessible. And they've done just that with Penn Place. Penn Place is not a closed corporate office park. It's an accessible, park open to the public and it's been shaped and designed by incorporating extensive community dialogue and feedback. It's going to deliver three acres of public space. They're going to plant 500 new trees. Um, you know, it's been designed as much for local residents as it has for Amazon employees. And it's going to be a lead domino for bringing that wonderful green ribbons vision to life. Um, and even the Helix building will be open to the public on a couple days each month. And I think the architecture is thoughtful, sustainable and green. Um, and in addition to delivering this new park, you know, I'm really excited about Arlington Community High School having a new home, the wider sidewalks and bike lanes, and just the commitment Amazon's made to adding 25,000 new jobs to the area. So I think in summary, uh, Penn Place uh, will add significant value to the community, and it's great for small business and good for local residents. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peck. Our next speaker is Steve Cooper, followed by Dave Wilson. Good morning, Mr. Cooper. Good morning. Greeting board members. My name is Steve Cooper. I'm a Arlington resident, longtime Arlington business owner, and I have some strong feelings about Amazon's Pen Place plans. Starting way back in the 80s, I've launched three different tech companies, employed several hundred tech professionals, each one with our offices in Arlington. My current company, Next Up Solutions, our entire purpose and reason for being is to invite a more abundant and diverse population to the tech workforce, specifically as software developers on our Next Up Solutions projects. Using this experiential learning model, some call it apprenticeships, we've launched the careers of over 120 emerging tech professionals with about 30 more every year. Personally, I've dedicated the rest of my career to building the workforce of tomorrow. I've recently advocated for Arlington to become known as an apprenticeship zone, a place where every business, no matter its size, throws open its doors to open learners and apprentices, interns, to its workplace. Every team should have at least one learner on its team at all times. Not just hospitals and law firms where this has happened for decades, but every company, Main Street, defense contractors, and yes, mega tech firms. Well, the reason I'm excited about Amazon's Pen Place and all of Next Up Solutions is excited about it is because when you see it, you know it's the workplace of tomorrow. And the best place to build the workforce of tomorrow is in the workplace of tomorrow. That's Pen Place. I'll continue to press for Arlington to be an apprenticeship zone, and I see Pen Place as the hub where thousands and thousands of new tech careers will be launched, cultivated, and advanced. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cooper. Our next speaker is Dave Wilson, followed by Christina Armstrong. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, uh, 
Madam Chair and fellow board members, uh, my name is Dave Wilson. I'm a longtime uh, resident of Arlington, and I also work in Arlington, where I'm Vice President of uh, Technology and Standards at the Consumer Technology Association. And uh, I'm here today to speak on behalf of CTA, uh, which is located a short walk down South Eid Street from the proposed uh, Pl Penn Place uh, development. Uh, we're uh, very enthusiastic about uh, this plan, and uh, we, th we you know, recognize that one of the most important things that uh, all employers face is recruiting good people. And uh, good people, uh, when they are looking for a place to work, you know, see, uh, consider a number of different factors, uh, and one of those is the neighborhood and what's, you know, what's around. Uh, are there good places to go for lunch? Are there good places to go to, you know, after work to shop? Uh, are there places to go for walks? And uh, are there places to have, uh, you know, exercise? And we have an active uh, after work boot camp where people, you know, go around the neighborhood and, and uh, jog and do various different activities in the evening. And uh, so uh, all of those things are um, important to employers uh, looking for good people, and Penn Place is going to deliver, we think, on all of those activities. Plus, we're, we're very happy about the new bike lanes that the county has put down uh, South Eid Street, and we're really excited about the emphasis that uh, Amazon is putting on bike commuters uh, at Penn Place. And uh, so thank you for your time, and we're really happy to endorse this. Thank you. Our next speaker is Christina Armstrong, followed by Raul Castro. Good morning. Good morning, <clears throat> Madam Chair Crystal, Mr. Vice Chair Dorsey, and members of the Arlington County Board. My name is Christina Armstrong, and I'm the Chief Philanthropic Partnerships Officer for Bridges to Independence, which is a local nonprofit working for the past 37 years to help families experiencing homelessness and our neighbors in need, many of whom are living at very low income levels. Did you know of those living below the poverty level in Arlington County, about half live in Green Valley and the surrounding neighborhoods in South, just about three miles from Penn Place? Of the single mothers with children under five living in Arlington County, almost 75% live in Green Valley and the surrounding neighborhoods. And just within Green Valley, one in four households have less than $35,000 annual income. There is double the unemployment rate, and one third of working age residents have a high school diploma or less. Green Valley is a microcosm of some of the most difficult social issues and where families have faced generations of systemic poverty and systemic racism. As of last year, Bridges to Independence now operates the Bonner and Amanda Johnson Community Services Center in Green Valley where we continue to meet the needs of the community. However, we would not be able to provide more robust workforce development and youth development programs nor expand our services to the 500 individuals we now serve annually if it had not been for the community partners like Amazon. On behalf of Bridges to Independence, we are here today to stand alongside our partners at Amazon to share our appreciation for what they have done thus far in terms of community investment, time, talent, and treasure. We are all more aware that we have more work to do, and it will take public-private partnerships working alongside our safety net partners to address systemic poverty. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Armstrong. Our next speaker is Raul Castro, followed by Freddie Lutz. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Raul Castro. I'm with the Eastern Atlantic States Regional Council of Carpenters. I'm here to uh, testify in support of the Amazon headquarters uh, phase two. Uh, the implementation of the labor standards for the first phase has brought equity and hundreds of uh, good paying jobs to folks in the construction industry. It has also prevented wage theft in the underground economy, which are huge issues for workers and contractors in the area. The Amazon headquarters project has set the benchmark for what the construction industry should be. It also created a model for other building owners and developers to follow, bringing much needed hope to an industry with decades of deteriorating working conditions. One thing I do hope for is for Amazon to expand the labor standards to uh, warehouses and data centers uh, projects in the area. This concludes my testimony and thank you for the time. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is Freddie Lutz, followed by Stephen Marku. Good morning, Mr. Lutz. Hi. <laughs> nice to see familiar, friendly faces. Uh, my name is Freddie. 
I own uh, Freddy's Beach Bar and Federico Ristorante Italiano on 23rd Street. I live up the hill in the house I grew up in since I was three years old and have seen a lot of changes in the area. Um, early on in the pandemic, Amazon reached out to me and said, we love Freddy's Beach Bar, and we'd like to partner up with you to serve 10,000 meals to the first responders. With the help of all the restaurants on 23rd Street, we were able to do that. And it was a moving, wonderful experience. Um, I've experienced impact from the loss of jobs in Crystal City with the Patent Office and Navy moving out. This impact. Uh, this impacted the remaining businesses with fewer patrons. The 25,000 jobs that Amazon will bring to the area will help businesses grow, continue to grow. Being a graduate of the Rhode Island School of Design, I look forward to the modern architecture that Amazon will bring, and with Amazon's commitment to sustainability, they are furthering Arlington's established values and goals, setting the stage for Arlington in the 22nd century. As an artist myself, I look forward to the artists in residence program that will be established. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lutz. All right, our next speaker is Stephen Marcoux, followed by Frank DeMarco. Hi. My name is Stephen Marcoux, and I'm the Government Affairs Director for the Arlington Chamber of Commerce. I'm here to speak in support of Penn Place. Penn Place is a key part of Amazon's headquarters, and it'll bring thousands of new jobs to Arlington, helping reduce our high office vacancy rates. And it represents a significant step in enhancing the strength of our commercial sector, diversifying our economic base, and growing this region inclusively. Now, as we see tremendous business growth along the Silver Line, uh, Arlington has to work harder to compete with our neighbors to maintain dynamic and job-rich destinations that are more attractive than these alternatives. And Penn Place does just that. The Helix is a signature building that'll distinguish National Landing for decades to come. The acres of adjacent green space will draw in the surrounding neighborhood, making this a centerpiece of National Landing. And the biophilic design will bring much needed greenery to the neighborhood. The office buildings will bring thousands of customers to the new existing retail in the area. Now here at the Chamber, we've seen firsthand the positive impact that Amazon has brought to our small business community. Uh, what we anticipated and hoped for leading up to the performance agreement has come to fruition, and then some. Uh, Amazon has directly supported a number of small businesses, such as Freddy's Beach Bar, who you just heard from. Uh, you know, during the pandemic, uh, Amazon and Freddy partnered to deliver 10,000 meals to essential workers in vulnerable populations. And to deliver 400 meals per day, Freddy uh, brought in the help of about a dozen other restaurants on 23rd Street. And that effort helped keep Freddy's and other restaurants in business uh, at a time uh, when they were in real trouble from the pandemic. Uh, and it also helped support people in the community who needed a good meal. Now, in addition, Amazon has partnered with the Chamber to create programs supporting small businesses that would not, uh, not otherwise have been possible. Just a few months ago, uh, we completed the first cohort of our Early Childhood Education Financial Resiliency Accelerator. Now, we were able to teach childcare providers the business skills they need at no cost because of the support we received from Amazon. Amazon also supported Arlington Restaurant Week. Uh, in the past, that ha event had included a charge, but during the pandemic, we knew that the restaurants were going to need a new model. And with Amazon's help, we were able to make it uh, possible for them to participate at no cost, giving them the opportunity to bring back more of the customers that they lost during the pandemic. So the Arlington Chamber is very excited for what Amazon's HQ2 will continue to bring to Arlington. And we're grateful for the work the county has done to make this happen. Uh, since its arrival, Amazon has quickly become part of the Arlington community, uh, supporting local businesses and nonprofits. Penn Place is a critical project for the future of National Landing and for Arlington. We're thrilled about its creation. We thank you for your work to bring this forward, and uh, we urge you to approve the application. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Frank DeMarco, followed by Tracy Gabriel. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and fellow board members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. Uh, my name is Frank DeMarco, and I'm the Executive Director of the Arlington Soccer Association. And I'm here today to speak on behalf of the 9,000 families of Arlington who support our program each year. For over 50 years, Arlington Soccer has focused on serving the community. 
As a community leader in Arlington, we are committed to growing this region. This work requires collaboration across nonprofits, civic associations, small businesses, large corporations, and government. When Amazon chose Arlington for its second headquarters, we were pleased to see them commit to being a trusted business partner and community partner in the region. Over the past three years, we have been happy to see that Amazon has followed through on its commitment. Collectively, we are working together with Amazon on a number of shared priorities. Amazon has supported our mission of providing inclusive soccer programs for the youth of Arlington, players of all abilities, backgrounds, regardless of their financial means. Amazon's commitment to help fund financial aid for families has helped remove the barriers to being part of Arlington soccer. In the spring of 2021, our focus was on returning kids to play and providing safe and accessible experiences and to get kids off of screens and back to physical activity, which we know is important for their development both on the field and in the classroom. Amazon's commitment to help fund financial aid for families has helped to remove that barrier. As Arlington County considers the approval of Penn Place, we believe that our partnership and Amazon's commitment to the Arlington soccer community, both now and in the future, can serve as an indicator of their willingness to invest in the community and put Arlington first as the region continues its incredible growth. We are excited about the future we are building together, and we believe that this is day one of the partnership between Amazon and the Arlington community. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to speak today on behalf of the 9,000 families of the Arlington Soccer Association in support of the, of the Penn Place project. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tracy Gabriel, followed by George Armendariz. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the County Board. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I'm Tracy Saya Gabriel, President and Executive Director of the National Landing Business Improvement District. On behalf of the Crystal City, Pentagon City, and Potomac Yard business community, the bid expresses its support for the proposed Penn Place development and park master plan and strongly encourages the board to approve the county manager's recommended actions. Approval will enable the fulfillment of Amazon's commitment to deliver at least 25,000 new jobs as part of their HQ2 while helping to realize the collective community vision for a vibrant, interconnected, and inclusive downtown. Penn Place will serve as an anchor for innovation that will attract additional investment and jobs to National Landing, Arlington County, and the region. The development will deliver on so many shared goals, a robust public realm complete with vibrant retail amenities and opportunities for small businesses, a robust a world-class public open space grounded in biophilia and sustainability, a connected multimodal mobility network focused on people, and signature urban design and architecture exemplified by the Helix, which will serve as both a destination and an iconic element of a rising skyline. The Penn Place project is not a closed corporate campus, but rather intentionally designed to be an integral and accessible part of a richly textured urban center. On every level, the proposal improves upon the phased development site plan that was approved nearly a decade ago. The proposed plan benefited from a robust and informative public engagement process that provided a forum for the community to share ideas and concerns, as well as a responsive applicant in Amazon that was willing to make revisions that delivered a much improved and ultimately more compelling project. The bid also commends county staff and the applicant for ensuring the key tenants of the Penn Place development were aligned with the concurrently developed Pentagon City sector plan. Finally, this project builds upon the efforts of the applicant and the county to realize a more inclusive community through key public benefits. Amazon's $30 million investment in the county's affordable housing investment fund will help provide committed affordable housing for a diversity of households in National Landing and Arlington, essential for ensuring that all residents can benefit sharing the benefits of growth and development. The inclusion of Arlington Community High School at Penn Place will create a centrally located home for this APS school and help expand exposure for its diverse student body to Amazon and the tech economy. In closing, the Penn Place plan was shaped by extensive community dialogue and succeeds in delivering on a shared vision for our district. 
the National Landing Bid encourages the County Board's approval of this signature development that will anchor Arlington's position as a future center of the region's innovation economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is George Armendariz, followed by Susan English. Good morning, Madam Chair, board members, and attendees. Uh, my name is George Armendariz, and I'm the owner of Elements Massage in Pentagon City. My apologies, by the way, for uh, the virtual presentation rather than in person as originally planned. Uh, I think uh, I'm a bit under the weather today, and I think it was due to a bad restaurant meal. Not an Arlington restaurant, I should add. Certainly not on 23rd Street. <laughs> Definitely not. Um, I, uh, I opened uh, uh, Elements Therapeutic Massage in the Pentagon Row Shopping Center on Joy Street in July of last year. Uh, when I fled the corporate world uh, a couple of years ago and aimed for a business of my own, a small business of my own, uh, the, the area now known as National Landing was high on my list of, uh, of target areas. And the driver for that was the announcement of Amazon HQ2. Uh, wellness uh, activity is a part of many of our lives. Uh, massage, though, sometimes is considered a dispensable luxury. And the success of our business depends a lot on the existence and our, our presence in a vibrant, progressive, diverse and professional demographic that can live, work, and play uh, in close proximity to the business. Uh, Amazon's pen, uh, pen Place development contemplates this, as well as the uh, other plans that they have for National Landing. Although my roots are firmly established in Arlington, uh, I am from Seattle, and uh, I have seen the transformation of uh, a once decaying area uh, known as the South Lake Union area to an area very much alive with commerce and residences. As uh, mentioned by a previous speaker, it's not been without controversy, uh, and I certainly don't mean to compare Seattle and Arlington. That would be like comparing apples and oranges. Um, uh, however, uh, not only are there are, are there very different starting points uh, with different demographics and a different economic base. I think, though, that many lessons have been learned uh, by the uh, Seattle uh, experience. I'm heartened to see the positive embrace that Arlington has uh, has made of those. And I think Amazon uh, has shown a commitment to be a good corporate citizen in, in this kind of an environment. We as small businesses need this kind of stimulus. Without this kind of, uh, of activity and, uh, and, and uh, environment, the economic viability of a small business like mine is, uh, is, is in question. Uh, so I heartily endorse the program and uh, look forward to uh, working uh, along with uh, our other business uh, neighbors as well as Amazon. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, and we hope you feel better soon. <laughs> well, thank you very much. All right, our next speaker is Susan English, followed by Bernard Byrne. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Susan English, 40 year resident of Arlington Ridge. We always inherit the choices of those who precede us. We've inherited the land use patterns of the 20s, 30s, and 40s, and the further exclusionary zoning of the 70s. We've inherited over-reliance on federal and military contracts for office space, which left that job sector eroded by relocations and now office vacancies. Like other major job centers, we're also faced with increasingly cruel and counterproductive lack of housing for workers at the lowest incomes. I welcome Amazon's Penn Place development as a tech job center and an example of truly sustainable building, and also an important investment in urbanism, which I believe remains key to our future livability as a region. But I have significant disappointments. By not building streets within its superblock, Amazon gained significant land and avoided the need for typical public access. Instead, it has provided connectivity through its campus with public paths in a retail and very green setting, but designed in a way that allows surveillance of all who casually move through or come to enjoy the open space. By not including a bike lane on the north side of 12th Street in order to gain curb access, that connection to the Metro on this crucial east-west link is set back by over a decade, 
while we test whether such a massive confluence of modes can succeed here. But the most prominent disappointment is Amazon's relatively small contribution to workforce housing with an AHIF amount of only $30 million, potentially spread out, together with loans and grants for other sites. The huge number of retail, maintenance, childcare, security, landscaping, and other workers needed for all of HQ2, as well as county service workers, argues for a larger contribution. However, and equally significant, the restricted land, restrictive land use and zoning policies of Arlington itself have as much to answer for the extreme housing shortage we face, one that has resulted in huge rent increases, displacement, and unsustainable cost burdens for the workers we depend on countywide. Amazon did not cause our housing crisis. It already existed. But I believe Amazon could do much more to mitigate it. I hope the board will approve this welcome, sustainable new development, but with a renewed focus on the equity pledges the county has made for all residents. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. English. Our next speaker is Bernard Byrne, followed by Mr. Gregory Ackerman. Uh, hello. Um, can you hear me? We can. Good morning, Mr. Byrne. Yes, how are you? How are you? If you, may, you may not be able to see me because my, I, for some reason, Teams isn't showing my visuals. Uh, this is the best site plan that I've seen in Arlington, and that's saying a lot. The Helix provides a unique form of architecture. The, the project has a large public open space with a variety of plantings, including forest and meadow areas. The planting plan is exceptional, showing more than 50 species of plants, including four species of milkweed. This will include 800 common milkweed, which monarch butterflies prefer when laying eggs and which thrives in Arlington's natural areas. This is the first site plan that has provoked planting some milkweed. The, the tree trenches in the sidewalk will also contain milkweed and other plants that support pollinators. Again, this is unusual for our only project. Nevertheless, the project needs improvement. Only 40% of the, uh, of the public open space is, uh, is green space. 60% uh, is hardscape. Uh, this is really, this will, of course, be, is impermeable. It may be captured by the stormwater retention area, or it may not. Uh, this should be at least 50%, especially when you talk about green plat a plat a plat a lead platinum. Uh, Amazon needs to reduce the number and width of paved walkways. There's no reason some of these, well, you need all these paved walkways, and the plazas can be smaller. It should also replace the paved centrally lo located market promenade with a planted area. That's a, as you, You'll see that right next to the central green. It really doesn't need... The, 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 the primary art is not needed, as the project will contain much ground for retail space. Uh, you just don't need more retail in, in, uh, to, to occupying an open space. Uh, the central lawn, which is, as you can see in the middle of the project, is too large. It replicates nearby large lawns in Amazon's Metropolitan Park project and in the county's planned park at Army Avenue Drive at South Lead Street. Uh, there's really no reason to have large lawns in all of these three parks right up within a two blocks or three blocks. Because, of course, there will be few large public events that will require a, la large, a, la a lawn of this excessive size. Part of the lawn could become an, a, a meadow or forest area. We'd much better use that area for that purpose. The solar panels on two large buildings have space in between them. These should contain shade tolerant plants but, uh, rather than just being empty. This was brought up in one of the meetings, but uh, it wasn't ever uh, said. Additionally, it is not certain whether all the plants, the, the plants will be native. Uh, the, at, a, at one of the meetings, uh, these uh, two meetings, actually, the, the applicant stated that they were, these will be adapted plants, a native adapted term was used. Uh, these can be invasive. Uh, so, and, and in addition, they won't support native pollinators. Uh, so therefore, all plants should be native. This should be a small change, which should be easy for the, for the applicant to make. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Byrne. All right, our next speaker is Greg Ackerman, followed by Audrey Clement. Good morning. Good morning, um, Madam Chair and members of the board. Uh, I wanna, uh, my name is Greg Ackerman. I'm with the DC Metro Building Trades. We represent 17 construction trade unions in the region. Annually, we spend around $30 million on apprenticeship and workforce development, uh, much of which we were able to put the use on the first phase of 
uh, this project. We really appreciate all of the work that you all did in working with Amazon to adopt these top of the line um, industry setting labor standards, including the payment of prevailing wage rates, responsible contract criteria, uh, anti-wage theft measures, and um, <coughs> um, these types of labor standards were incredibly successful. We were able to partner with the county school systems as well as community groups representing justice-involved citizens to get them opportunities in their first job in the construction industry. Um, you know, sometimes folks look at construction as a temporary job, um, and the neat thing about being in the union is that once you have that first job, once you're able to get that first opportunity, as so many were able to do uh, with the construction of Met Park, you have a job for life. It's our job to find you the next job through our hiring hall. And so we're very grateful um, and thankful that um, we're able to continue that uh, with the Penn Place project and hopefully other projects in the region as well. Uh, so we really want to thank the county board uh, for, for working through the first phase and then also want to thank Amazon as well for being uh, tremendous partners in this process. So we urge you to, to uh, support this measure. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Hi, can the you speaker is Audrey Clement, followed by Benda Avanza. Good morning. Can you hear me? Hello. We can hear you. Good morning. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, welcome, members of the board and the county manager. I'm Audrey Clement, the independent candidate for county board. The Penn Place approval process strikes me as a ritualistic exercise where boards, commissions, and civic leaders outdo themselves heaping praise upon Amazon for its civic and environmental contributions. Yet they studiously avoid the question, who is actually going to pay for the benefits Amazon plans to bestow upon us? Arlingtonians for Our Sustainable Future, ASF, stands alone among civic groups in taking a hard look at the numbers, concluding that Arlington taxpayers will pay heavily for the impacts of Penn Place. For example, in, revealing, in a revealing slide deck, ASF reports that of the 3.3 million square feet County Board will approve today, 1.7 million square feet consists of excess bonus density that Amazon demands in addition to what is currently allowed under the zoning ordinance. To get an idea of just how much space that is, consider that the One World Trade Center occupies the same square feet. Amazon proposes to earn its bonus density with green building credits, affordable housing, a new community high school, a daycare center, a 2.75 acre park, and assorted transit infrastructure. That may sound like a lot, but the difference between the benefits package, which ASF values at $75 million, and the estimated $488 million value of the bonus density it will acquire from county board is $413 million. When County Board approves today's deal, more than $400 million needed to address the impacts of Penn Place will evaporate, and taxpayers like you and me will pick up the tab. <laughs> to get an idea of what those impacts will be, ASF reported that Arlington's population is likely to increase by 63,000 in another 20 years even before Amazon hires and spinoff contractors are factored in. These new residents will require dozens of schools and parks, more libraries, police and fire stations, and a dozen new transit routes, more than enough to absorb the $413 million in community benefits that County Board will forego today. ASF concludes, quote, any way you look at this in square feet in dollar terms, Penn Place is not a fair deal for Arlington residents, end of quote. It's actually worse than that. According to Just Taxes, in 2021, Amazon paid $2.1 billion in taxes on record profits of $35 billion for a tax rate of just 6%. If Amazon can dodge the IRS corporate tax rate of 21%, it should have no difficulty extracting unearned benefits from Arlington County in perpetuity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Clement. Our next speaker is Ben Devonzo, followed by Connie Erickson. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. My name is Ben Devonzo, and I have represented Aurora Highland Civic Association in this project within which Penn Place resides. 
Overall, this feels like a good product with some important caveats. I think the unified underground parking with off-street loading is excellent. The Helix will be a welcome break from the often stagnant architecture in our neighborhood. And the addition of significant new retail will bring life to the area. I do hope that Amazon follows through on its statements around locally owned businesses and that the retail serves residents' needs. I appreciate important pieces of the site plan conditions uh, also reflected in the MET Park plan, such as ensuring the daycare facility will be open to the public and requiring that Amazon has a community liaison. I do wish that the primary office buildings were less imposing, but I appreciate that the developer has taken more steps to take and make improvements and in fact more steps than I've seen from other developers after the 4.1 was initially filed. I want to first speak to two interconnected areas of concern. First, while the park space, while quite nice and biophilic, has the feel of a corporate campus. Without significant wayfinding and placemaking, residents may feel that it is primarily for the use of Amazon employees, particularly considering it is surrounded by their office buildings. I suspect given that uh, Amazon is the primary uh, occupier of the park, it will be primarily used by its employees. Amazon will use its park as a recruitment and branding tool. It's hard to feel like this park is truly the community benefit that the site plan makes it out to be. Second, as well as was raised in the last SPRC meeting and the Planning Commission, Amazon is well known for its investments in surveillance technologies. If this park is going to be patrolled by private security or observed by security cameras that can track the identity of every user, that is a major chilling effect on free public use. Strongly encourage the board to discourage this type of behavior. I also want to point out, finally, on the park, that the ratio of public screen space to develop land may be actually lower than in the PDSP, although we haven't seen that data, because of the exclusion of the public streets and because the inclusion of the hotel site. A flagger continued disappointment about the lack of bike lanes on 12th Street, and that's going to lead to conflicts between cars, pedestrians, and bikes. I hope the county will look at measures to avoid that if there cannot be bike lanes. The additions of protected lanes on Ferd and Eads, though, are very appreciated. This plan represents the first implementation of the green ribbon. I do appreciate that some of the park improvements that were made on the margin better align this multimodal pathway with the standards under the Pentagon City Sector Plan. Although I also hope that the developer will consider adding public art elements like green walls to better align with the design guidelines. The home of the Arlington Community School is certainly welcome given its underserved students, although I hope that its location is accessible by its users. However, the decision to place a school rather than a community center highlights a growing unmet need for community space in our neighborhood, and I hope the county will take this into consideration during the CIP process. I also want to acknowledge that the deep impact that Amazon is already having on housing in our neighborhood. Property assessments, meaning the taxes we pay, have been skyrocketing, and homes in my development have been selling for hundreds of thousands of dollars more than they did prior to Amazon's announcement. Although that all pales in comparison to the double-digit rent increases that have been reported across the board in our neighborhood this year. Amazon's use of low-interest loans, as well as the AHIP contribution under this project are good, but not nearly enough. And I think the opaque nature of the community benefits and bonus density process certainly reflects some anxiety in the community about whether a fair deal was negotiated. The comments of the Housing Commission stated earlier this, this morning really resonated with me, and I do hope we are learning from similarly, similarly situated cities and that we do not experience some of the skyrocketing rates of homelessness and housing costs that we saw in the Pacific Northwest. I do want to thank all involved for a very smoothly run process. I think the high profile of this nature of the I think that the high profile nature of this development may be the cause, but I hope staff developers and planning commissioners look to the way that this process was run with a lot of chances for public input, at least into the site plan itself, as a good example under the process. So I'll conclude by saying that this addition, especially considering the vacant nature of the current pen place site, will be a positive uh, and welcome uh, amenity for a neighborhood. But I certainly hope that both in terms of the uh, need for community infrastructure, the need for housing affordability, and the uh, ensuring that park space feels truly welcoming for all users, that the county, the developer, and all involved will consider uh, what can be done to address those concerns. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Devonzo. Our next speaker is Connie Erickson, followed by Joan McIntyre. 
Hello, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Can you hear me? We can. Good morning. Okay, good. My name is Connie Ericks, and I'm here representing Audubon Society of Northern Virginia, a chapter of the National Audubon Society. We are glad to have the opportunity to publicly thank Amazon and its architects for measures they have taken in the design of Penn Place to mitigate the harm that the built environment can cause birds, both resident and migrating. They met with my Audubon chapter, National Audubon, and the American Bird Conservancy early in the process to discuss concerns and solutions. They answered our questions and requested our comments as the process moved forward. Some of the resulting design features, in fact, can and should serve as a model for other developments in the future and necessary improvements to the county's green building incentive policy. Collisions with buildings are a leading cause of bird mortality, exceeded only by habitat loss and predation by cats. The American Bird Conservancy estimates we lose 1 billion birds per year to building collisions. The collisions are caused by a number of factors, but window glass is a major element. Birds do not see transparent glass and can slam into it. If glass is reflective, they also do not see the reflection as anything different from the surrounding unbuilt environment. The problem can be particularly acute when buildings are adjacent to natural elements such as trees and other vegetation which attract birds. Fortunately, there are measures building designers can take to prevent most of those collisions, and I'm pleased to report that the Penn Place design incorporates a significant number of them. The county's green building incentive policy includes some requirements, but the Penn Place design meets and exceeds the limited requirements in the policy. The policy requires bird safe glass only from eight to 36 feet above grade. What is important to note is that the policy does not require bird safe glass at the ground level. This is the unfortunate result of a too restrictive reading of the county's retail policy, suggesting, suggesting that glass at ground level must be completely transparent. The Penn Place towers will have bird safe glass from ground level to 50 feet above grade, as well as at levels where design features include vegetated balconies. The Helix building will have bird safe glass from ground level to the top because of the interior and exterior plants that also go from the ground to the top. And the ground level retail pavilions all will have bird safe glass. The bird safe glass in the case of the pavilions is glass with a two inch by four inch frit pattern. It provides an acceptable level of threat deterrence and meets the intent of the retail policy by allowing for easy visibility into the retail space from the outside. The design of the helix and some of the tower features also recognizes that height alone is not the sole criterion for determining where bird safe glass is recommended. Everywhere the design includes plantings near windows, which can confuse birds, the design includes bird safe facade. Audubon looks forward to having an opportunity to work with staff and the board on improvements to the green building incentive policy in the future. I also want to take this opportunity to thank Ms. Garvey for acknowledging our concerns about ground floor windows at the county board hearing when that policy was most recently amended. We'll do better next time, particularly given the example we have from the bird safe features in the pen place design. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ms. Eckerson. Our next speaker is Joan McIntyre, followed by Ann Bodine. Good morning, Ms. McIntyre. Good morning. I'm Jen McIntyre, Chair of the Climate Change, Energy, and Environment Commission. Overall, C2E assesses this project to be an exemplar in achieving the county's community energy plan and sustainability goals and serves as a model for other developers. The LEED Platinum Project's energy-related commitments exceed the baseline requirements for the green building incentive policy and demonstrates what can be achieved when these goals are built into the design process from the outset. Energy efficiency gains over the ASHRAE baseline are the highest we've seen at over 30%. The buildings are designed to be all electric with the exception of first floor retail and backup generation and will be powered by on-site and off-site solar renewable energy. 
The project also includes numerous additional sustainability elements that are commendable. Biophilic elements are included throughout the project and will offer Amazon employees and the general public appealing public spaces. Reductions in both indoor and outdoor water use are impressive. Bird-friendly glass and dark sky compliance lighting will reduce the threat to bird collisions as we just heard. That said, C2E2 recommends that Amazon be encouraged to commit to zero carbon certification. The zero carbon assessment suggests that this could easily be achieved with the current building designs by identifying and working with retail tenants willing to adopt all electric e cooking equipment, seeking additional opportunities to reduce embodied carbon. Well, we haven't talked much about embodied carbon. This is something that's really critical if we're going to meet a goal of reducing carbon emissions by 50%, which is what the experts say we need to do by 2030. And finally, um, exploring zero carbon alternatives to backup generation. Uh, also, we our, uh, Amazon should be encouraged to build the necessary electrical, inf electrical infrastructure to support EV charging for up to 50% of parking spaces to support the tr transition to electric vehicles. The world is facing a catastrophic climate crisis which requires immediate actions by individuals, governments, and businesses to avoid the worst consequences, and all future development needs to align to these goals. We commend Arlington, Amazon for designing a project that adheres to standards that will advance Arlington's energy and sustainability goals. We encourage the county and Amazon to showcase the project as an example of other, for other developers of what can be done when sustainability is prioritized and integrated into the design from the beginning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair McIntyre. And our team will follow up with you to make sure we can get you on the commission's list for the future. Thank you. Sorry, our next speaker is Ann Bodine, followed by Eric Cassell. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Good uh, hello, Weekend, thank good you. Hello, hello from uh, snowy Bozeman, Montana. Madam Chair, Mr. Vice President, members of the board, good morning. I'm Ann Bodine. I represent Arlingtonians for our sustainable future. I'd like to address bonus density and community benefits at Penn Place. ASF will show the need today to amend the site plan to get the best deal for Arlington. We'll also call for better transparency in all future site planning. Next slide. Arlington projected in 2018 it would add 63,000 residents with then current zoning. That compares with the populations and amenities of Charlottesville and Culpeper combined. But no one is looking to secure land or pay for added services we need, as shown here. Next slide. The Penn Place deal involves extreme levels of bonus density, perhaps a world record. Amazon seeks 1.7 million square feet of bonus density, which equals the size of one and a half Chrysler buildings. 1.4 million of this number, still more than a Chrysler building, must be traded for community benefits. Next slide. Penn Place and the team presenting it are extremely impressive, and the plan has received a lot of public attention, but not the bonus density. We're here to change that. The site plan application was accepted last January, but community benefits only came out this February, giving us two months to weigh in. And the affordable housing benefit was a mystery until April 1st. Such timelines are short-circuiting debate, and site plan deals also marginalize commissions who play no role in negotiations. Next slide. Residents, beware of Amazonians bearing gifts, or really not bearing enough gifts, nor bearing them on time. We've seen many examples of site plans that delayed, amended, or avoided public benefits to the benefit of developers. The 10th Street Park and the revised Clarendon Sector Plan is a good example. Also, Boston Bridge and the Kitco site plan near Costco. And what if Amazon changes its plans? If it was 100% certain Amazon will do the full build out, then let them pay the AHIF contribution now, not starting in four years. And let's tie the bonus density to each building's construction. The bird in the hand is worth two in the site plan. Next slide. So we are giving away Chrysler buildings. What will we get in return? The county has said Arlington will receive the benefits shown here. The main ones, the high school, the child care center, affordable housing contribution, Penn Park, are worth about $75.5 million. Next slide. It looks like the county is preparing to leave substantial funds on the table. I'm going to anticipate skeptics here. 
Our team wasn't given any dollar values, and we found it harder to assess the bonus density than the benefits. That is surreal because we own that density and we should know what it's worth. Please don't tell us that you know its value and we can't. To be fair though, let's look at the deal from a different perspective than land value. We'll get 40,000 square feet of facilities divided between two buildings that we don't own, and they'll get 1.4 million square feet of buildable space forever theirs. We'll also get $30 million for affordable housing and a shared use park. Compare that 30 million, however, to the $19 million Amazon spent to lobby the federal government last year. Yes, it's a raw deal from this vantage point as well. Back to the slide, our team consulted recent area deals and using the mid range of $350 a square foot, 1.4 million square feet is worth about 488 million, substantially more than our benefits. Next slide. So ASF asks you to secure 413 million more in benefits. At the very least, we should ask Amazon to fund a new elementary school and at least one additional environmental equity and transportation benefit from our list. These items reflect communi community wishes expressed in the Pentagon C City sector planning process and would improve infrastructure, diversity, and environmental outcomes for all residents. Next slide. No one believes Amazon needs charity from this county and ASF welcomes P Amazon and Penn Place. Our critique is not unique to Amazon, but the extreme level of bonus density here exposes gaps in Arlington's overall site planning process. ASF has often noted that the county is not planning nor funding major capital improvements as part of regular budgeting, nor is it getting close to what's needed from developers. But this hasn't slowed board approvals of denser land use, zoning, and bonus density, already bringing in thousands more people than the 63,000 we mentioned. This is not sustainable for our community, whether it's diversity, environmental viability, or financial solvency we are seeking. So instead, take our suggestions and let's celebrate the headline. County Board approves Penn Place site plan, adds bonus density contingencies, gets more and more immediate community benefits, and agrees, agrees to improve site planning more broadly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Bodine. Have a nice trip in Montana. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, our final speaker is Eric Castle. Good morning. Good morning. How are you, everybody? Um, I'm the last one, so I'm going to take a little at the end, hopefully. Uh, first of all, I want, I'm Eric Castle. I'm president of Crystal City Civic Association. I'd like to thank uh, Judy Freshman and all the other people in our association who went to many of these meetings, who commented. Uh, many, many of us have spent many hours looking through the documents, seeing what's there, what's not there, and having comments and, and passing them through to our representatives. We, first of all, our, we want to thank Amazon for doing a major building, the Helix, which is different and unusual. One of our criticisms of the other buildings were they were kind of similar. And so they have made some changes to the design and everything else, but we're really pleased to see the Helix. We're excited. We can't wait till it's built. Um, it's going, it's, I think it's going to be something that Crystal City and our area and all of Arlington are really going to enjoy and it's going to be an iconic building and we're really pleased with that. The second thing we're really pleased with is Livability 2202 had an idea of green ribbons and we're very, very pleased to see they changed the design to include it. Part of our idea is that a community is important as, at the pedestrian and bike and other small mobility level. And we need to plan that transportation just as well as we plan automobiles. And so the idea of green ribbons is really, really important. And we're likely to see it in the future on Route 1, which is a, related to this project, um, and at, at 18th Street especially. So we're really concerned about making sure all the future development plans include something like a green ribbon in this area so that we can connect these and allow pedestrians and bikes to have a real way of trans moving about the area easily. Lastly, that br or next that brings uh, one concern of ours is 12th Street. You heard from at least one other commission about the problems of 12th Street. We think we're, um, we're concerned that we're putting too much on 12th Street, it's going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. We think future county boards might say, come back and say, well, why didn't they make the street a little bigger or, or move other things to other places? So we're concerned about putting too much transportation emphasis on one street and it becoming overloaded and, and being a problem in the future. Hopefully we're wrong and you know, our negative thoughts aren't, aren't, don't come true, but we're concerned about that. 
Lastly, um, open space is another concern. Um, as mentioned by the Parks Commission, open space is really, really important for the mental health, the physical health of all the residents. We can't emphasize enough the importance of open space, and we're likely to be um, against some of the developments coming down uh, the road in other places. We're likely to be really object uh, have strong objections based on open space. So we're, uh, we want to make sure that JBG and all the other people who are coming with other proposals are aware that we're really, really concerned about open space, and we're not going to take um, uh, measures that are inappropriate and we really want enough open space. So to kind of conclude and kind of summarize everything, you'll notice one of the things that you, you did not hear today, you did not hear anybody from our Civic Association come up in, against this proposal. You did not hear one single voice against it, and I think that says volumes for both their process and Arlington County's process, and our civic association being out there and being part of this. So one of the things is, again, I want to mention is, you know, what you didn't hear. What you didn't hear is the Mrs. people complaining. And you heard lots of positive comments from people. So all that is good, and I, I want to thank uh, Amazon for that. And I think uh, the county board's process and the planning process was an important part of that. So thank you again. And have a great day, and I'm glad to be the last speaker. <laughs> we are too. Thank you. All right. So I believe that is our final speaker. Conversation is now with the board. Uh, a quick programming note. I know a number of folks have joined us for the next item, which is the Clarendon Sector Plan update. We are um, going to take a recess between this item and that item for lunch. So if you need a minute to get some lunch yourself, uh, we will probably, um, almost certainly, in fact, not be hearing it until 1245 at the earliest. Okay, colleagues, um, I, uh, as I hear it, I think we've got a few items for discussion that I can go ahead and get on the table before we look for a motion. Um, broadly, I'd suggest they fall into the buckets of um, open space and park, which I will also lump in any conversation we want to have about the environmental features of the project. Um, uh, discussion about uh, architecture, massing, circulations, or sort of standard site plan pieces. Um, uh, and then I think the third bucket that I heard was community benefit. That would be inclusive of um, housing impacts as well. So unless there are any other broad areas to highlight, I think we could launch into the first. Um, would anybody like to kick us off with questions about open space or the park? And Mr. Carantonis, we are uh, keeping an eye on your raised hand via our clerk, so I'll try to make sure that I don't leave you behind in the conversation. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm, oh, Ms. Garvey, please take sure, it Sure, sure, I'll, I'll start out. I, I, I want to see... I, my sense listening to this hearing and looking at it and sort of sitting back a little bit is this is about a whole lot more than just buildings and a site plan. And we'll sort of get into that in some comments, but I'm going to start out with a real specific um, question that just occurred to me. The tree canopy, 46%, could you talk a little bit about how that's calculated? So does it calculate with the trees going up the helix? And I've, I'm just kind of curious. I don't know if that's for you actually or for staff. Yeah, I'm going to have uh, Grace from Scape respond to it. Yep. Go up to the podium. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, thanks. My name is Grace Stiles. I'm the project manager with Scape Landscape Architecture. So the tree canopy coverage is actually calculated using the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Ordinance. Uh, so that's the recommended guideline uh, from the county arborist. And so we basically do a straight calculation of the number of trees times what their um, canopy coverage number is. And so it's calculated at actually a 20-year maturity. Um, so it's not necessarily on day one, but it lo does look at that canopy coverage over time. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a lot of other questions, but I'll just let okay. colleagues Fantastic. go. Fantastic. Mr. Mr. Garcia, we'll let you know if we need you to come back. <laughs> so this is in the open space bucket, right? Yes, Madam please. All right, yeah. sure. So as part of the, uh, you know, the forest walk area and other features of the site, is there a plan to uh, provide descriptions of the species that are planted and some of the environmental ele elements so that in some ways, this could also function as in, uh, you know, a nature, a nature center as one explores and utilizes the site. Uh, let me see if this is on. If not, John, can I borrow yours? Thank you for that question. Uh, yes, part of the 
features of the forest walk is the meandering pathway. And we see this as a tremendous opportunity for both public art and also what I would call ecological interpretation and educational signage. Um, we do, um, you know, by way of also addressing partly Mr. Burns' question, we have largely native species, species that are uh, part of this region, part of everybody's um, uh, natural environment. And so we imagine, uh, for example, interpretive signage on the handrails and things of that nature. I wanted to also emphasize that we have zero invasive plants. We have a native, largely native, and native are uh, plant palette. So I think it'll be a great both, you know, place to rest and relax and also a place to learn about our, um, our, our environment. Thank you. Thank you. And Madam Chair, may I follow up since you, you. you helpfully broached my, my other question regarding the uh, conversation around uh, adaptive, adapted and native plants. It seems like from Mr. Burns' interpretation, he's concerned that, that adapted plants can, can become invasive. And I also know from a cursory view of the a review of the literature that the, the use of the term adapted is is too distinguished from plants that while not native uh, do not become invasive okay, so, so can you speak a little bit more to to what you mean and what you intend and why you have included adapted plants uh, as opposed to all natives yes well um, as has been noted um, uh, this region, you know, it is, for example, a little bit warmer than it was. We have um, heat island gain. So we really choose very carefully the plant palette to be able to thrive in the environment in which it is placed. Um, and I'll give you an example, but I wanted to emphasize again that we have zero invasive plants in this plant palette has been reviewed by, by experts in the region. One example is, for example, I love a plant geek, so I'll share, but uh, Viburnum dentatum is a native plant species, our native arrowwood. Um, it grows to 10 to 15 feet high. Um, so for example, in addition to that plant, we have planted where appropriate, we have um, Viburnum dentatum autumn luster, which grows only seven to 10 feet high and also has greater heat tolerance. So that's just one example of what I would call a native R or an adapted plant species that are very, very highly appropriate, non-invasive, and that provide a little extra fall color and uh, survivability. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Um, I have a couple questions about the functioning of the park space. That'll be, I think, a mix for the um, applicants team as well as for Mr. Rivera. Um, so definitely some good conversations. I think apropos of a point Mr. Devonzo had made, and I think was one discussed in PC as well, um, which is this this question of how can we ensure um, that this the central green especially feels and looks and is experienced like a public space instead of a private one. Um, so uh, I think a, a couple of questions there would be um, partly for our staff, I think, the wayfinding, what planned wayfinding we have. Um, and then uh, if you could maybe talk to us a little more about, um, you showed us a couple of slides, I think, but, but a little bit more about what the views to that central green look like um, from the street, um, how obstructed they are, what the experience would be, um, how someone walking by on the street would see that the central green and know that it is for them. So to start with wayfinding. Thank you, Madam Chair. So with wayfinding, uh, one of the things that we've worked on um, with Met Park as well as with this project is to identify those opportunities in order to make the space uh, welcomed, either from the outside or, or within. Uh, one of the ways that we're able to do that is through the final landscape plan review, have an extensive review of wayfinding opportunities, signage, uh, potential artistic design elements, and other features that would enhance that, uh, that atmosphere for, for users. Um, I think it's also specified um, in language within the public park easement, condition number 55. So there are um, ways in which we work with the design team as well as within our staff in order to uh, provide those opportunities. Thank you. And I don't know if the applicant wanted to add about the, the view into Central Green and welcoming passersby. Oh, sorry. sorry. We all no, here we go. That now this on. one is on. Thank you for that question. Um, we have a 3D model of, of the site, and we've designed the public open space with a lot of specificity to really have 
very open, unobstructed, and clear view corridors uh, from uh, Fern Street, Eads Street, and particularly 12th Street. And so these, um, you can really see into the heart of the site. This is a great image to speak to because you can see the, the sunlight on the, on the central green. I mean, it will really be both a visual, per, visually permeable and actually very literally accessible in terms of a network of pedestrian paths. Um, and so, yes, these view corridors are open and welcoming and really stretch out to the sidewalk and the surrounding public realm. Thank you. And speaking of those paths, one more question if, uh, before I turn to Mr. Carantonis. Thank you for your patience. Um, Ms. Marlowe made a, a, a comment, you know, observing the, the number of young people in the neighborhood um, enjoy biking, for example, in River House uh, currently. Uh, and I know you've thought too about, in some ways, this will be kind of a transit corridor, right, for those trying to get from one end to the other. Could you talk to us a little bit about the thought that went into separating or ensuring there's sufficient room for um, very active recreation or uh, transit, I suppose, with some um, uh, bike in particular and, um, you know, passive, uh, particularly when it comes to accessibility on those paths? It comes and goes, this mic, but we'll get there. Uh, I did want to highlight, if, if we don't mind going back to that last image for a moment, uh, something to add on to what Kate was saying about visibility and accessibility, because uh, it's very important that uh, all those factors and accessibility be one of the most important mm -hmm. that people not, I mean, not just those of a disability, but of all generations feel comfortable and can find their way here. And one of the things I wanted to point out with this drawing, because it's probably our best one that we have here today with us, you can see the main entrance from, from Elm Street up across 12th at the mid block. Uh, that's really between those two uh, timber pavilions. But you're also you're seeing the mews on the left that comes all the way to the corners. Uh, both of the mews come almost to the corners of 12th with Eads and 12th with Fern. So this being the main transit street, uh, 12th Avenue, not just for the buses, but because this is the path you would take from Pentagon City Mall. Um, you would come here and right from the corner, not have to wait till the mid block, be able to see into and find your way into the site. Um, the, the multimodal path itself is a key element because if you've heard, some people are still concerned about not having a bike lane on 12th because of the transit corridor. And so there is the option always of going down um, Army Navy Drive, turning on Eads, well, probably the most convenient way for a commuter. But they can, if they're taking their time, come down Fern, go through the site, enjoy the public, public spaces and the outdoor programming that's there. And all those spaces are very flexible in their programming so that uh, not only the people that are on the site, but people that are coming to the site have opportunities to create different events over time. And um, Scape has done a rather wonderful job and also trying making sure with our team that the infrastructure is there for those events to occur. So I'm not sure I heard the full question. Uh, I apologize, but it was, I missed, did I miss anything you needed to hear? No, I think you did. I was sort of interested in the um, opportunities for, uh, well, maybe not literal, but, but separation between the, the more um, active recreation and the passive on those paths. Yeah, and all that. I didn't address that as well as I yeah. could have. So uh, we started out really promoting the idea of an all pedestrian zone, frankly. Um, that said, uh, the, you have regulations and rules here in the county and mm -hmm. your, uh, all, not only bicycles, but more importantly, perhaps now multimodal devices, uh, mm -hmm. scooters, for example. So we worked very hard in SCAPE in, in particular and with the county staff in terms of designing this 15 foot wide area that could be used by all different uses. And as you can see the imagery here, it's very distinguished from the other paving. So when you're coming as a pedestrian or whether you're pushing a stroller or you're in a wheelchair, you'll know when you're getting close to that path and vice versa, oh. the people that are on the path will be able to see where pedestrians are crossing. And that includes even lighting. So um, that is something we paid a lot of attention to. That's very helpful. That visual is uh, worth a thousand words in that regard. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Carantonis, thanks for your patience. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Actually wanted to to ask exactly the same on how the the multimodality of this path would be actually managed. Uh, I can see in this uh, slide 
very well how this serves pedestrian strollers, uh, people with disabilities, etc. That's that's very good. I'm not so sure that a higher. I mean, what would be the uh, bicycle, the cyclist volume uh, that uh, that we could afford to have there. Um, Mr. Sabo, I agree with you. I, I, if I see this uh, campus as, as it evolved, I would first um, assume that this is a pedestrian place. It's a pedestrian domain. This is what the, the intention is, and this is what we want this to be. Um, so is do you see any conflict there or any, any need to, to mitigate or to manage? Um, frankly, when I was, uh, you know, struggling with the issue of 12th street protected bike lanes i was immediately seeing that uh, you know as a cyclist myself i would probably cut through the block uh, if i don't have a bike lane or a safe environment on 12th street so i anticipate that this will be a popular place for cyclists to go through the block so I'll start the answers that you directed to us. I also would encourage staff who's been working with us closely in the design of this multimodal pathway. You see in this image on the screen, for example, um, the series of almost looks like dots down the middle of the path, which will help kind of bring directionality to one side or the other. And then you see the those horizontal, uh, the um, darker lines, which also then show you when you're coming to an intersection uh, with pedestrians uh, so that there, and as I mentioned, there's some lighting as well in, in the path at, at certain locations where they cross in order to make sure that everybody is very clear when they're entering or crossing. But we do, you know, we rather intentionally didn't make it this a straight line through the site like a street. Uh, it has some curvature to it. It has activity at the edge of it. It has plants and art along the path is the intention. And so it, we really don't want the commuter using this as a principal route, frankly. And this would be a place, though, for we want people to feel comfortable coming in on their bicycle and using it in a safe and responsible manner. Uh, but as I say, we've been working closely with the county to come up with a scheme that everybody feels comfortable with that meets your own regulations about what should be allowed and uh, doing it in a way, though, that we're not creating a through way through the middle of the site. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Carantonis. We'll do another round of questions on the same topic. Ms. Garvey. Oh, I'm sorry, oh, no, Mr. 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 we're next there. Sure. Uh, it's uh, it's just a quick question. Um, I thought that wayfinding and placemaking, that really struck me as a helpful, and I, I just wanted to follow up a little bit there, um, just to see if I can clarify on um, condition 55 and, and the final landscaping plan. Um, trees will fill out, so, you know, the view into the center of the site will be different five, eight years down the road, and if you have a sense of the timing of the final landscaping plan and whether I think that wayfinding and as well, the signs to get through it, through into the site uh, could also change. My impression is that we don't have authority post final landscaping plan to encourage, you know, to, uh, signs to make sure people can get in, to offer thoughts um, with respect to trees at the outside. But I, I don't know if that's the correct impression of, of our process or if you can speak at all to when the final landscaping plan uh, might come forward. So with the review of the final landscaping plan, uh, we have the authority to adjust when that comes in and how we review it. So one of the things that we can encourage, um, the coordination is with the developer on trying to figure out when and where these lo the locations of, of these potential wayfinding opportunities are and signage opportunities are. So. You know, we will be working alongside with the design team and also within our staff to identify these potential opportunities and make sure that we're coordinating that in such a way that makes sense with the overall plan. Great. That helps me. I'm not trying to add a condition or add a contingency, but it does seem to me that with the amount of work into the site, um, that cooperative spirit after or, or having the final landscaping plan be sufficiently um, far into the process so we can see, we know what it's gonna look like. I'm just sort of expressing a sentiment. Um, I wanna hasten to say that is not 
a contingency. It's just a, a thought that we put so much work into it mm -hmm. that Mr. Advanza's points are worth following through on. Thanks. Mr. I just Schultz. want to add that, um, of course, since we are getting a public park easement, the county has a bundle of rights to go in at any time, 5, 10, 15 years from now, and amend things as conditions warrant, uh, of course, in cons consultation with the neighborhood and with the developer. But the county has the right post-approval to adjust things that seem not to be working. To do that, to that end, if I may just follow up on exactly that question, I know the Parks and Recreation Commission, in a, their letter to us, had suggested, um, you know, given how effective the engagement to date had been, that perhaps another community engagement post-approval, um, as those pieces come into final place, would be worthwhile. So um, I'll just suggest, you know, whether that needs to be a community meeting quite on the same scale we've already seen, or maybe just a conversation with the Parks and Recreation Commission um, about how that's coming forward, I think would be um, very helpful in ensuring that, that those uh, ideals are carried out. And actually, uh, Chair Crystal, I did want to follow up with that. So when it comes to a lot of our uh, public space projects, we actually do provide routine updates to the commission regarding a lot of them. So this would potentially be one of those projects where we're going to provide um, you know, significant updates and uh, just uh, any, any sort of a, either whether it's within written form or as a presentation to the commission, but it would be something that we would follow up on. Terrific. Thank you so much. We'll look forward to hearing from the commission then, too, then. All right, Ms. Garvey. Thank you. I'm going to be a little contrary. I don't mean to be. I know signage is important, but looking at this site, try to keep people out. Just try. I mean, everything to me from the vision looks like, come in here. This is really interesting. Um, the helix, people are going to see that when they land on the airport forever. And if anybody's like, if I'm like other people, and I think I sort of saw something, oh, let's go see that. So. You, you're, you're baiting it. I mean, you're pulling people in. That's, that's, that's what I see. You may want a little wayfaring so people can find their way out. Um, but it seems like the path, you've kind of got a yellow brick road sort of effect here so people can find that. And I actually think part of the pleasure of this is going to be getting lost in it um, to some extent, which I think is one of the biophilic principles, if I, if I remember. So I, I, I don't have the concern about people wanting to come in. And you, you started out talking about how this is um, part of the community, not a campus. And that's part of it. If there was a big sign that said Amazon or something, that, that might make people feel uncomfortable. Um, but, I, but I think you're, I, I don't see that as being a problem. I'm really looking forward to seeing the water feature. Um, and then some of you haven't been here as long as some of the others. The praise from Bernie Byrne to say that this is the best <laughs> site plan he's ever seen is pretty amazing. I don't think Bernie Byrne has ever seen, Mr. Byrne, excuse me, has seen a site plan that he actually ever liked. So um, you're, 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 you've done well on that one. I did have a question, and it actually is on bird-friendly glass. Um, so when I asked the, the, the session that actually Ms. Erickson referred to, sort of what I hear is bird-friendly glass is expensive, it's too hard to do, we don't really need it. Could you talk a little more about the cost of the bird-friendly glass, how difficult it is to do, and whether it really isn't needed at a certain height? Happily. And first of all, thank you for the, your insightful comments. Um, yes, people will be attracted to the site. And they'll be welcomed, and they'll find their way in there easily. Um, I, I would even say that it's, uh, it's going to be something, as you say, that people are going to, it's going to be hard to keep them away. And that's really the intent, though, is to make sure that everybody is, uh, feels safe and comes there whenever they need to or want to. So bird-safe bird glass. And I may even turn to my colleague over here at the computer. He's, uh, he's the lead designer of the towers. Uh, his name is Travis Allen. Uh, but the bird-safe glass... Uh, is something that we actually went through a big learning curve on this project. We've done it before, but it's kind of the Wild West right now. Well, that's maybe a little too strong, but the idea is it's a, a fast emerging industry. So, and, and without getting into the specific costs, because I wouldn't have them right on the top of my head, it's true that it's more expensive, and many clients are nervous about the fact that it does obscure vision somewhat. But the industry is improving and getting more cost-effective all the time. And so, for example, the dot pattern that was described is found that we researched to find the, the most effective with the least amount of impact on people's view from the interior and the most impactful for the birds on the exterior. So that's kind of what we're trying to learn and do as we go. As far as where it's located, um, uh, Connie was absolutely correct about the fact that um, you know, the retailers are nervous. You know, this is new to them. Why do I want dot patterns or something else on my glass? There's also a UV version. 
that they, they feel that might not show their wares as well. But as they get more sophisticated in the glass itself and, the, and, the, and as more retailers start to use it, New York now obligates, you, if you build a building in New York City right now, you would have to do it on your retail as well. So more and more people are getting comfortable with it as they get exposed to it. The industry is getting more cost effective. Architects and engineers are getting more knowledgeable about its importance and how to use it. That's really helpful. That's what I was hoping sort of to hear. So we'll just keep, I'll keep asking about um, bird friendly glass. Just a warning to our staff. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. DeFranti. Um, this question, there's sort of, it's focused on the park. Uh, acreage and the change that, that came. It sort of bridges between your two categories, Madam Chair, which is the parks and then the massing and circulation. Um, pretty rare there are four or five in, with concerns who spoke, but so many people spoke in favor of the project. And I, I guess I just, I, I think there are two questions. One is we changed the size of the acreage of the Central Park, that might be a question, and then the massing shifted. This is all back to, there were references to last summer where staff was working with you. And I, so I think there's maybe two questions as to if you can speak briefly to the process that led to that change. You've spoken to our overall process with SPRCs and virtual, et cetera. But I think it's important just to um, make sure our public knows that there was some, there wasn't always perfect harmony on every little issue. And so there was some discussions there. And I, I pro probably thought I would start with a park uh, piece of it. How did we get to that larger acreage? And um, if you can add any context to the community concerns that led to the larger size. Sure. Some of it had to do with the you know shrinking of buildings and things that we did, but that was not necessarily the major part of it. Uh, the major part of it, frankly, was areas that were being preserved for security or other purposes, or for a potential outdoor use by restaurants for spill out and things like that, that ultimately we felt more of it should go back to the public and uh, for the public's use. And then that doesn't mean they can't go to those other areas, but now it's become part of the public easement. In the meantime, and, and I know that um, my colleague Kate or Grace could speak to it in more detail, but as you can see by the plan up on, on the screen at the moment, there was a lot of input about the amount of green in particular relative to hardscape. And you can see how not only more green occurred in the park over time, but also more tree canopy. Um, people like Dr. Byrne were very influential on that, but many others. I mean, many others who you know, you know, recognize the importance of, sh of trees for shade and cooling in the summer. Um, and the more we got into it, uh, the more we saw the value as well. Great, and, and I, I'm certainly happy, but with your permission, Madam Chair, is there anything that maybe Mr. Shuttler, maybe others might want to speak to the to the massing discussion that, you know, that evolution. And I don't know who the right person with the applicant is, and it certainly could also be Mr. Schultz, but if you wanted to speak a little, I know there was, a, if you look at the slide and, and you follow the conversation, there was a little bit of a shift in the massing just to, to make sure things fit as far as the building envelope. I'm actually gonna ask too that Travis bring up the slide of, it's in the appendix of Tower One and the before and after. You can kind of get an idea of what really happened. Um, just one of the three towers. Uh, this definitely came from community in the LRPC process and reinforced in the SPRC. That because the buildings have a large footprint and you know offices want to have a consistent footprint, footprint to some degree, um, that they were really encouraging us though to find more variation in not only the massing but in the facade treatment to differentiate between towers. And that was uh, coming late in the process, admittedly, but at the same time, our client was willing to step back with us and take some time to, we knew it would improve the overall tower as well as find more community support because of what it addressed specific concerns. Great, thanks. And thanks, Madam Chair, for indulging a little bit of a well, vague question. We might get back you... to those uh, massing and architecture questions later, too. Uh, Mr. Carantonis, on uh, parks and open space or the environmental attributes. Uh, to, to the degree that this uh, belongs to this chapter of conversation, mm -hmm. is about the green roofs. I, I, oh, um, I, uh, I really applaud the, uh, the green roofs on the pavilions. Um, so what is the overall, what was the 
the, we were there, they're very well visible on this slide. So what is the overall concept about green roofs? Uh, maybe also, you know, what made it less uh, practical or less feasible to include uh, green roofs uh, uh, at the top of the towers? Certainly. Um, so the policy we, we took here or this direction was green and the client not only supporting but encouraging us uh, with their horticulture team. This is a very unusual client. They have a horticulture team. And they're uh, part of who we worked with. We did this HQ1 in Seattle and they've, they've evolved as we have evolved. And so from the beginning, the idea of green roofs or occupied uh, landscaped roofs were the norm for everything that could be seen from above in the towers themselves or from neighboring buildings. So the pavilions, all the terraces, I have landscaped elements and uh, green roofs on the pavilions themselves. On the very tops of the buildings, we did study green roofs. Um, first of all, well, it would be kind of cool to see it from an airplane and no question about it. Um, nevertheless, very few people other than those traveling by air are going to be, it's going to be visible to them. And we made a, a very intentional decision um, as we were dealing with the change in massing to the buildings and to give it a more distinguished skyline that, this, that let's show off some of the sustainable attributes of the project. And we not only then um, exposed the solar panels, we expanded them by a considerable amount. And so we we're highlighting the solar panels rather than green up there. And when you put solar panels up there, it's gonna cause a lot of shading and other things below so that the green roof really doesn't work with that in a reasonable way. I'm not saying you can't absolutely do it, but you're kind of double investing in your roofs in that respect. And we're still getting all the benefits of, of, um, of the right kind of roof together with the solar panels. Thank you. Uh, a very short question, uh, and, and that would be my last one on this, uh, on, uh, on, the, on the central green. Uh, so somebody will be programming events, et cetera. This has a lot to do also how we invite public into a place. Uh, when the place is programmed, there are many reasons to come in and explore. Uh, so who will be in, in charge of that? Would, would this be the, the Crystal City, oh, sorry, the National Landing Bid or Amazon itself or other entities? Uh, thank you, Mr. Carantona. So uh, the Department of Parks and Recreation will have um, the opportunity to program activities within that space, but also if there are um, requests uh, for other programming, other sorts of programming that could come in as part of the spe special events permitting process. So that would be another way in which we could, we could do that. But it's entirely controlled by the county. That's correct. Yeah. Yes, I understand that. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, and I have just one comment in conclusion. There, there was, uh, as we conclude this topic, rather, um, there was some interesting discussion, as Chair Weir indicated, um, about um, security and cameras and parks, I think echoed by some of the other commenters. Um, I think this is a particular concern, right, when it comes to a community space that we want people to feel very welcome in. Um, Mr. Rivera, this is, might be a challenging question. Do we have any existing standards or practices when it comes to um, uh, cameras or security, either in county parks or parks where we have a public easement? I am not personally aware of them, uh, but that is something that I could certainly see as being a, you know, potential con controversial issue for for many folks. And but it's not something that I that I can speak more to. Okay, that I mean that may be an area for potential policy development, particularly as we try to realize more of that land acquisition um, or uh, land expansion goals through private development and with public easements. Um, I imagine this might not be the last time that comes up. I don't know if there's anything the applicant um, would have to say on the topic in terms of you know the general practices um, you have for building security and how you think that might interact with it, what is uh, quite obviously intended to by everyone's account function as a very public space. Right. I, I think there is a distinction between uh, private space and security and the public realm. Mm -hmm. So the focus by the applicant would be within the building, which would be lobby areas, okay. elevators, other publicly accessible areas, um, usually approximately a 30-foot perimeter around the site a zone around the building, and that also allows for maintenance of windows, retail areas, et cetera, and also, of course, the parking garage. Um, so those are the focus points for the applicant. 
Um, the other areas, which are public sidewalk easements, public street and utility easements, and in this case, a 2.75 acre public park easement are within the public realm. Mm -hmm. And I think the important distinction is the applicant has no enforcement abilities within the public realm. It is within the county's control and the police department. Thank, Thank you. you, Madam Chair. Appreciate that, Mr. Durst. But, <clears throat> but if I could, Madam Chair, I was going to discuss this later, but since the topic has been broached, you know, our, I think our public, uh, and this is not intuitive to, to everyone, and, you know, I don't mean to sound like I'm lecturing Mr. Weir, who is an attorney who knows this much better than I do, but the, the expectations uh, to privacy are very different once you leave your private home and you enter the public realm. And regardless of what this applicant or any other applicant who's engaged in the development and, de and deployment of technology may utilize, uh, right today as we walk on the street, we are subject to uh, surveillance and sensing from aerial drones, from ground robots, or anyone who has a modern iPhone or equivalent who may want to uh, surveil us and we have no recourse um, to stop that from happening. So I do want to temper expectations that what we might be able to do in terms of policy and law are quite different than I think a lot of people would expect. And for those who believe that they enter the public realm today and are protected in a way that would be different once Amazon or any other tech entity uh, occupies a site plan in Arlington, you, well, you just need to know that that's not the case. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Carantonis, did you want to follow up? Oh, just a s small addition to Mr. Dorsey's uh, comments. I think that this is a very good conversation to have. It's not particularly relevant to what we have on the table today, but it's a good moment to think about that. Uh, soon I understand that we soon we will be receiving a, a report on the pilot uh, with you know sensors and smart street uh, uh, devices in Clarendon. So this is in, in the public space, and this is a technology that we, the Arlington County, uh, would be controlling. It has to do with you know. Uh, response times, um, uh, fire department, EMT uh, response. Uh, so I do believe that this is a, a valid point to raise in this case. It's not particularly tailored to be an Amazon relevant thing or only Amazon relevant thing. It affects us as well. Uh, as from the point of view of the pop of the government, uh, because we install, um, you know, sensors around uh, town as well, many of them. So uh, I, I look forward to have this conversation uh, further down the road uh, when we will have to think about uh, the level of surveillance and what is, you know, the balance between what is reasonably expected or unavoidable and what is actually, uh, what would be actually, uh, you know, regulable. Yeah, thank you. And Ms. Garvey, final comment? Yeah, just, just really quickly, I, I was thinking about this as Mr. Weir was talking that it might be useful for the Planning Commission to get together with our Technology Commission, ITAC, because that's, that's a real intersection here. It's a huge issue, but as Mr. Dorsey points out, everybody in this room has got, I mean, it's just, it's really, privacy is a huge, and I think we're kind of unaware of it because we sort of slipped into it, but those discussions probably as a community to kind of process it would be a good idea. Thank you. That's an interesting suggestion. Okay, I think um, that wraps up uh, open space park environment and a few ancillary topics. Um, uh, architecture, massing, circulation, any questions or comments on this? Uh, Ms. Garvey, did you wanna start? I guess I'll start again. <laughs> um, so it's, it's kind of a drug. Could you talk a little more about, it, it, it's all kind of, what's going on on the site? Like. Often we get a lot of kind of ingress, ingress and egress and where the, uh, the tr trash is going to go and all. What's going on underneath this site? There's some big cisterns. There's some garage space. Are we going to have EV charging? I'm assuming we are, if you could talk about that. And then just to fold it all in real quick so I don't have to talk more after this. Um, could you talk about what the on-site solar will do? So there's off-site solar that's doing so much, but you also have on-site solar. So th could Correct. you try that? Uh, yeah. And if I forget one of these as I go along, catch me and we'll, uh, I'll try. we'll address it. Um, the, the buildings are office buildings themselves, and with the exception of the pavilions and the ground floor, as you saw when I showed you that we have a lot of ground floor available for retail, for uh, bike storage, for the school, etc. One thing I want to point out about the lobbies themselves is that 
this is something we, we've learned working with Amazon in the past is, and we worked out together, the security or the turnstiles don't happen at the ground level. You actually have a through lobby that the public can walk into and you have to go up a stairs or take an elevator or an escalator before you encounter security. So you don't have these buildings where you just walk in and hit the turnstiles and a guard looking in your face. And that's something we've really liked about working with this client. Um, so that's one aspect. Below grade, I mentioned it was a really big decision. I mean, everybody's moving in larger buildings now, of course, to underground parking. That's not unusual. But moving your loading for, uh, for this amount of square footage and have all that underground, um, that is something that is very unusual. But it also meant that we had to create then pathways between the underground loading, which is near the center of the site, to not only the towers for service, but also to the retail for service. So there's actually a corridor system of, um, on the first level down that kind of uh, are at the loading level, which is the B2 level. It allows you to go in different ways to get to retail support and bringing trash out. So all the trash, all those elements are being um, uh, taken to that loading dock uh, and where we also have an ample number of recycling and trash areas. Um, and what will typically happen for the retailer is that uh, especially in the pavilions, they will hold their trash in a room that we've designed, be able to take that, and um, and then at night, that's taken uh, by another group of people down to the loading dock area and taken out, so that we never have um, trash bins, we don't have dumpsters out in the on the street, we don't have them on the uh, mews. And then the solar array, the solar array so the vast majority is in uh, another site in Virginia, off-site, as you know. Uh, and we are going for 100% electric and 100% renewable energy. But when we decided to expose the tops of these buildings, and as I mentioned, we added solar panels, so we can now get to 1.2 megawatts per hour just on the, on the rooftops. Uh, that's enough, for example, to service all the kitchens on the site that Amazon has. So. Uh, there's another ways you, other ways that you could cut it, but it's a significant amount. And that's being more and more encouraged, of course, to try to have it on site when you can. But on site for, this, uh, for large buildings or towers, you're going to have to go off site to create other renewable sources, find other Th renewable sources. Thank you. That, that's very helpful. Sometime later, I'm going to ask for a briefing, I think, on the cisterns and the cooling and all that. We won't, do, we won't go into that here. Um, I'd love to talk about it. No. Well, I, 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 it, it's a deal. It's a deal. We can do that. Um, but anyway, I, and I'm glad you've got a lot of solar on site. I do think that's the best if you can, if you can. It. And then I'll just, <laughs> apropos of our other discussion, those underground, that's where you're going to need really good wayfinding, I suspect, so people don't get lost under there. But that's your problem, not ours. <laughs> I think so. Thank you. Thanks. Great. I'll go Mr. DeFranti and then, um, yes, Mr. DeFranti. Um, so this question is for Mr. Weir, but also perhaps for Mr. Schultz. It's regarding, if you could um, tease out a little bit more of the discussion um, at the Planning Commission regarding 12th Street and the ultimate conclusion um, that the, the effort to get additional um, protected bike lanes, you know, what led to the conclusion that this, that this is the, the Transportation Commission but also the Planning Commission's conclusion this is the right, uh, this is the maximum map that could, could be there and thus um, sort of rendered that issue a little bit, a little bit less of a concern? was working. Um, thank you for that question, Mr. DeFranti. I think that it, it became a balancing issue, right? Uh, I think that a majority of, of members of the commission, certainly myself, are of the opinion that the default, um, that, 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 that the starting place for designing a street uh, includes protected bike lanes. Um, uh, there was certainly a sense among um, members of the SPRC and LPRC, LRPC uh, that, that a successful environment for pedestrians also required protected bike lanes uh, because it separated mm -hmm. um, people who were commuting and then traveling at speed uh, from pedestrians. <clears throat> 
the concern, and and I, I think that you know Ms. Gabor is here, and she was very persuasive <clears throat> over a number of meetings. Um, so I I, I want to limit the extent to which I put words in her mouth uh, uh, with, and and, and I want to give her credit. Um, I think that the concern was that this is. Uh, a make or break block for a transit network um, that absolutely has to connect and bring people quickly and efficiently uh, between the, um, the the Pentagon City Station and and other parts of uh, of um, the, the the bus rapid transit uh, uh, connector, uh, and that one of the you know an, an interesting pivot point here is that one of the reasons that we need protected bike lanes is that motorists and uh, delivery vehicles will often park in the bike lane for pickup and drop off. But it's also that uh, illegal parking that became, I think, one of the animating concerns uh, it, against a protected bike lane in this particular cross section, which was <clears throat> if there isn't a dedicated space for pickup and drop off, then uh, motorists and delivery drivers and and uh, Uber and Lyft drivers, et cetera, are just going to park in the travel lane, mm -hmm. and and you're going to grind the. <clears throat> this would then become the limiting uh, a throttle point that would that would bring uh, a vital transit network to a halt. I think that there's a very real counterpoint to that, which is well, come on, they're going to do that no matter what. Right, um, and and that becomes an enforcement and a design issue, uh, but but it is a you know it, it ultimately was a was a, a a matter of balancing the interests, and I think that um, you know certainly by the time it came to the planning commission and and the and the the transportation commission, including the um, commissioner want to tell me who's jointly appointed to both commissions, was uh, supportive of staff's recommendations. I think that there was very little interest even among um, maximalists like myself in in second guessing mm -hmm. uh, the recommendations that were coming from uh, from the other commission. Thank you. I think maybe Ms. Gabor, if you wanted to speak a little bit to your rationale, that'd be helpful for me. Thank you again. My name is Joanne Gabor. I'm with Arlington County DES. Um, I first wanted to talk a little bit about the 12th Street Corridor. We are finding that in the summer of 2023, we will have the 16M bus line that will be, provide a one seat ride from Bailey's Crossroads all the way to Crystal City Metro. Uh, that is gonna be running every six minutes at the peak hour. We also have the Transitway extension that will be extending the Transitway all the way from Braddock Road Metro to the Pentagon City uh, Metro Station. This will be completed in the summer of 2024. Currently, we are seeing 12-minute headways during the peak hour, 20-minute headways during non-peak hour, but we do anticipate that being a six-minute uh, <laughs> six frequency at the peak hour in future years. Um, with this confluence of all of the transit operations, we feel very strongly that 12th Street does need to remain the transit pedestrian corridor priority that has been identified. This identification actually has gone back from 2010 when the Crystal City Sector Plan and the Crystal City Multimodal Study was adopted. Um, this did identify 12th Street as the transit corridor um, priority section, and that is something that we have been using as policy guidance from that statement forward. When we did look at the design for 12th Street, it is a challenge. We do wanna provide modes, uh, the ability for all modes to travel through this area effectively. Um, and it did provide the opportunity for us to make some hard choices, which we did have to make. You know, when we look at this block, we also have to look at 12th Street in totality. We are providing the two-way cycle track on Army-Navy Drive with the Army-Navy Drive Complete Street Project that will start construction later this year. Um, this will provide the two-way cycle facility from 12th Street, just at Route 1, all the way over to Joyce Street. We also are looking at expanding the cycle facilities on 15th Street to, through the Pentagon City Sector Plan. As part of the Met Park project, there will be some separated facilities completed with, um, again, with Met Park on 15th Street, and we think that will be the best option for folks to cycle through this area in the east-west uh, direction. So it is something that we are aware of, um, and we appreciate the community uh, trusting the county to figure out the best way to figure out how to provide access for all these modes in this area. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Gabor. And I know that it's an area that the chair and, and others have dug into a little more deeply, but it's yeah. very helpful to hear here. No, Thanks. I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> 
think about how many times I've remarked uh, apropos in a site plan of the issues of the delivery vehicle or whomever else parking in the bike lane, that we just need to create better physical structure to, to, to um, uh, stop that behavior and, and realizing now, in fact, how challenging that can be in terms of the balance of modes. I do find myself uh, thinking that, my goodness, we'd be in such better shape if people would just cut out that behavior. So <laughs> in true vision zero fashion, right, there's some onus on us to build the right built environments. And then there is a lot of onus on um, users, particularly operators of vehicles, to, uh, to park responsibly so that uh, we can share our streets with all modes safely. All right, Mr. Karen Tonis. Yeah, Madam Chair, thank you. The, um, the 12th Street discussion is a very significant one because the, the, the hardest, and I, and I agree with Ms. Gabor on this, yes, we have to make very hard choices. And in this case, the hard choice was whether the model that would have to dial back a little bit would be cars. And we would opt for uh, bicycles on top of that. I, I do think that uh, that 12th Street is a major connector. If you, if the way I, I experience 12th Street today is a place that is just booming. Uh, it's very well used. It's very popular, and it's a an extreme, an important opportunity that I believe we're missing there. But this is not, was not my my question. My question was about architecture, uh, and this is for for the architects. How about the, you know, these four towers? This is a northeast um, uh, facing site. Uh, so it has some microclimate or local climate challenges. So how do we, what can we say about, you know, the, the wind, moisture, light uh, that this place will, will help? What do we know about the climate in this campus uh, after the uh, four buildings will be completed? Well, it, it, I'm not sure this is exactly what you're asking, but I, I hope it is because it's. Uh, will be, for example, will it be very drafty? Uh, will it be, com you know, comfortable uh, in the in the summer? Certainly, it will be very comfortable because Western light here in Virginia is extremely hot, so this will be mostly protected. Uh, but what about, you know, the, um, you know, fall and spring, uh, and and the windy. Uh, you know, the, the, the way the wind uh, will be uh, finding its way through these buildings. It's also very close to the river and it's open on, on, on completely open on the northern side. Yes, no, I, I understand the question better. Thank you for expounding on it. Um, we, we did um, some of the normal uh, evaluation that we would do around climate for any project, and we did a little extra as well, partly because of the scale and partly because of the uh, of this climate here is very different than some others that we have done these scale of buildings. So we wanted to make sure, starting with sun and shadow, that we would have sun at the right time of year and particularly at middle of the day. Uh, the wind studies, we end up going a little bit deeper than usual. Usually we do wind studies on taller buildings at the very least to understand the wind impacts on the upper portions of the building where the winds are <coughs> highest. In this case, we also made sure we understood what the winds are gonna be like at the pedestrian level. Uh, and including on that unusual building of the helix, because the helix with its hill climbs, you're going literally up the whole building, up around 350 feet. Uh, that was a particular concern to make sure that the wind loads weren't gonna be something that were gonna be an issue about the usefulness of the building. So we were very pleased. Uh, we had to do minimal kinds of uh, carving or shading of our buildings to make sure the wind loads were appropriate at ground level, where most people will be using it. And we found three locations on the hill climb where the winds could, for a very short time in winter in a storm, <laughs> have a wind that would be an issue. And we've created some extra sheltering and wind barriers at those locations to help people uh, navigate that portion. So um, yes, uh, it's very important. And of course, humidity. And we have operable windows. And we, you know, there's insects and there's other aspects. Climate and, and, and locale, all those things have been addressed in the design. Thank you. Thanks. OK, um, let's move broadly into the last category, which is uh, broadly defined community benefits. So that's either the specific benefits we've been have been under discussion, um, which are uh, many, uh, the community high school, uh, the park, I believe we've talked about at some great length already, um, uh, housing contributions or others. Um, Mr. Dorsey, we'll start with you. So uh, Madam Chair, I appreciate that. If, if anyone has any questions about specific outline benefits, my comments and conversation are largely going to be about community benefits writ large. I think that's probably most appropriate. Yes, please, go ahead. 
Please, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so first, uh, this question for, for staff, really, I think it would be helpful for, to, to hear from you all uh, exactly how we approach the uh, process of negotiating community benefits with developers. Um, if you could talk a little bit about how the public's role in uh, planning documents and efforts inform the uh, benefits that we negotiate, how you approach uh, valuation uh, and the like, just to give a broad overview without attaching any specific details to this, this particular site plan. So I'm going to take that in two parts. The uh, second part I'm going to ask Aaron Schreiber, who uh, works on this closely with me, to address the actual mechanics and math of it. But the first is the policy point. Um, so we, uh, in addressing the impacts uh, of any project, which is the place where we go to look at to see what kinds of uh, mitigating um, payments or, or facilities we want to get for benefits. We work closely with the county attorney on that. And we first place we look is to the guidance that the county board has provided. Uh, in this case, dating back to 2010 and to the Crystal City Sector Plan, the focus on housing, the focus on transportation, and the focus on uh, mitigating the uh, impacts of large projects. So that's where we, we start. Uh, we had a, an opportunity here, especially with a partnership with the uh, Arlington Public Schools and a conversation with uh, Amazon to, I think, do something which is not only within the spirit and the scope of what the county board provided initially in guidance, but is consistent with the mission of what we want to do as a county and also what Amazon wants to do, which is create a space, the Arlington Community High School, which I think is going to be unparalleled as, a, as an opportunity. So having said all that, I know there's been some questions raised about whether we are getting, quote, the value that we should be getting. And um, maybe I'll turn to, maybe the county attorney can talk a little bit about what the legal criteria are, but let Mr. Schreiber talk a little bit about how we actually go through the negotiations. And rest assured, I'll address that value question. And Mr. Schwartz, before we get to Ms. Okay. Core, if I could just uh, restate simply what I heard you say, that primarily in terms of the composition of the things that are negotiated, the public is participates through the, the planning process for, in, in this case, the Crystal City Sector Plan and other area planning, and also through our broad public engagement to establish meeting the facilities needs for our schools, among other community needs that it were ex an extensive part of the community facilities and JFAC process that has been ongoing for the last decade. Those are the ways the public has informed how we've negotiated community that, benefits. That is correct. Okay, thank you. No, no. Mr. Schreiber. Sure. So good afternoon. I, I think we've crossed that hour. Um, and uh, I'm Aaron Schreiber with the um, planning division. And just to speak uh, about mechanics, um, the zoning ordinance, and, and just to get wonky for a second, um, in, in section 1559, it provides very specific guidance in terms of how a site plan applicant can earn additional uh, density and height. And so the way the ordinance is structured is that additional density uh, may be earned over the base amounts, but within the height parameters as identified in the uh, governing zoning district or in an area plan. In this case, the Pentagon City uh, PDSP has a maximum height limit of 22 stories. Um, and so the applicant did request a certain amount of density, which is over the amount previously allocated by way of board actions. Um, so there is a delta from what was previously approved up to the maximum 22-story heights and what the applicant was requesting. Uh, that was approximately 1.8 million square feet. Again, that is something that is permissible by the zoning ordinance. But the ordinance does also place very specific criteria on ways in which that additional density can be earned. And those are for contributions to um, affordable housing, uh, sustainable design commitments, affordable housing. Uh, the community facility component is also broad in that it could be anything from a, you know, a true public amenity like a library, a school, something like that. 
Um, so, so that's a specific guidance from the ordinance that, that gives us a legal structure to um, have that discussion. Um, and then as the manager alluded to, we do take our cues from adopted plans and other board policies. Um, so we did start to focus on um, goals from the Pentagon City uh, PDSP and specifically to the Penn Place site that um, identified very specific elements um, for how you could earn density on this site. Um, that was through things like sustainable design, through affordable housing, through the park, um, and through a community facility. Um, so we had that as our basis, and we then continued to look at some of our other adopted plans and policies, and that's how we landed on some of these uh, commitments and contributions. Um, the affordable housing commitment um, directly relates to uh, specific goals from the affordable housing master plan. Uh, the public space that's being provided here, the 2.75 acres, directly addresses goals from the public spaces master plan. This is uh, three quarters of an acre um, larger than what was previously committed to for the site. Uh, that does address the 30 acre uh, goal of the public spaces master plan. Um, also, the developer is uh, building out this open space and committing to maintain it in perpetuity, so still addressing more goals there. Um, they are providing a child care facility that will be available to members of the public, not just Amazon employees. They'll also be accepting um, subsidies um, as forms of payment. Um, so addressing our child care initiative goals. Um, and then the community facility um, is something that was originally identified as a very broad 20, up to 20,000 square foot space that had a range of options. And as the manager mentioned, this was you know, really focused on through our partnership with um, the public schools to really find a permanent home for the community high school, knowing that it was um, probably gonna be challenged to stay at the career center. Um, and so really pleased to find um, a really, um, you know, it's just an awesome you know, facility, um, everything about it and finding that permanent home, um, really embedding that program on this, um, on this site and, and the opportunities that those students will have. Um, each one of those categories, I think, uh, directly relates back to the ordinance and how you can earn the density and the adopted uh, policies um, that the board has adopted over the over the years. Well done, thank you. And you, please do, Madam Chair. Yes, thank you. So, you know, I just want to address. I believe there was a Ms. Uh, Bodine. What's that? Bodine. Ms. Bodine, and then one of our public speakers earlier, whose last name I can't remember, who, who have essentially brought this issue to the forefront today. I want to first reflect that uh, I'm glad you brought the issue, because one of the more important things that members of our public should be aware of and hopefully have confidence in are that publicly owned uh, assets are, um, are, are dealt with responsibly, and that what is owned by the public is not given away for private use for a value that's less than it's worth. It's important for us to have that conversation. Uh, that said, the conclusions that people have reached that somehow the valuation of what has been given has been insufficiently accounted for by what we have received uh, has some concerns from my initial read. Uh, and I'd like to point those out and, and, and leave as my ultimate point, I am happy to engage further with Arlingtonians for a Sustainable Future and anyone else who has questions about these details. But one of the things that uh, unfortunately has become a part of this public conversation are the uh, publishing of numbers that have at least the appearance of being valid numbers, but uh, are arrived at through, through very suspect methodologies, which I'd be happy to work with those groups to to better understand, but to, uh, to have this slide that was displayed today, which for example values the uh, community benefits at a, a specific dollar figure of 75.5 million connotes some, a precision that is not there. And I'll just, not to deconstruct everything, but the Amazon donation to AHIP in terms of $30 million cash uh, leverages usually about I, I believe it's how many? Four to, one. four to one additional dollars in terms of what can be produced. That's not reflected here. The Arlington Community High School valued at 12 million. I don't know where that number comes from, given that the uh, it's not only going to be constructed by Amazon in the present, but is going to be made available and no cost to the public schools for, I believe, 30 years. Um, the bike lanes and, and, and the park and, and the utilities. Again, these, these methodologies for valuation are, 
are, are quite uh, concerning. And just with the initial math, they just don't make any sense. For example, when we think about TDM, uh, which is one element of our TDM program, the cash payment to, to transportation management partners, that's about $180,000 per year with a cost escalator each year for a period of 30 years. You do that math, you've almost eaten up that 10 million. You don't include anything when it comes to transit payments. You don't include anything when it comes to van pulls. The, the numbers are, are just not helpful for public conversation. So I would encourage uh, groups to stop publishing with precision things that are not only not precise, but are really by orders of big magnitude not anywhere close to right. And that's not even to speak to the methodologies ascribed to the commercial valuation and the inclusion of what might be a speculative residential uh, valuation for a project that's entirely not residential. And I would also invite our community to understand that the community benefits package uh, also includes uh, access to this Helix public building, which we haven't talked about, it also includes the macroeconomic benefits that come from uh, employees being able to, able to spend money in our community, and it also includes the sustainability elements that we've talked about. So again, you know, this is a, a complex conversation. We don't expect that everyone would, would fully get and absorb this. That's why I, I am happy to engage with people on it, but it also kind of uh, underscores why we don't have these conversations fully in the public, because in order to reflect the public's best interest, there's a lot of detail and perspective that needs to come into it. And if we just simply invited people to mobilize on community benefits on an ad hoc basis without being consistent with past community generated priorities, we would simply be creating an inequitable power structure where those who can mobilize and be loudest would get what they want and broad community benefits would go underrealized. So anyway, thank you for that extended conversation, Madam Chair. I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Mr. Dorsey. Okay, Mr. DeFranti. And then I think we might be closing in on closing comments. Yes, um, so I'll keep this, this part of it short. I think um, on the macroeconomic point that you made, fundamentally, um, we lost, as, as Mr. Lutz mentioned, we lost thousands of jobs on the order of 10,000 jobs due, the, due to the Navy leaving and the, the security uh, restrictions. For so long, Crystal City has helped fund the county as a whole for our schools, our parks, our housing. And we have seen a seismic shift in how we live because of the pandemic. And so we will see escalating office vacancy rates. Um, this is about growing our economy so that we can in invest in the future in, the, in these key services that all Arlingtonians prize. And so I, I just think it's sort of an opportunity cost point. I, I think that to say that it's inevitable that Arlington's economy will grow without re recognizing that some of the choices we make are critical to that growth um, is just a piece that I, I think is, is also relevant to the to the analysis of the few people that we've um, uh, that have come forward with with uh, concerns about uh, about this project. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm going to look for a motion on the table, actually, and Mr. DeFranti, um, we can give you just a minute to do that once you have the opportunity to pull it up. And we've got a second. I'm going to look to colleagues to make concluding comments. Um, and in fact, if you need a second, I can. I just need one more. Take second. your time. I, we we could. Uh, I think uh, parliamentary order will still stand if we take maybe a concluding comment while we let Mr. DeFranti prepare with what is going to be a very long motion. So it is going to be very long, but I think he's got it. So we don't want to break up the, if okay. that, have you got it? Sure. Okay, if that's all right, Madam Chair. I didn't give you enough notice. <laughs> Thank you. Madam Chair, I'd like to move um, the county manager's recommendations with respect to item 38. And there are um, uh, 38A through 38G. Um, uh, so give me just a minute and I'll, I'll go through those so that we can make sure we've done this correctly for, for uh, correctly. Um, so item A, um, site plan amendment to discontinue a site plan for a hotel located at 550 Army Navy Drive. Um, item B, uh, phase development site plan amendment to amend the Pentagon City phase development site plan for parcel 
1D to convert an existing allocated hotel density to office and commercial density, permit public, civic, and institutional uses, and a child care center, permit additional building height for four office buildings, and adopt an amendment to the Penn Place design guidelines located at 550 Army Navy Drive. Uh, item C, um, site plan amendment for the block known as Penn Place to construct three 22-story office buildings, one office building that is approximately 355 feet in height, and three buildings of up to two stories, the whole consisting of approximately 3.2 million square feet of office density, approximately 94,500 square feet of retail, um, and retail equivalent uses, approximately 28,600 square feet of public, civic, and institutional uses, and approximately 15,000 square feet for a child care center use, with modification of Arlington County's or zoning ordinance, including required parking, additional density, additional building height, exclusions from gross floor area, penthouse height, driveway opening widths, and other use modifications as necessary to achieve the proposed development plan located at 550 Army Navy Drive. Item D, use pin permit for a public park located at 550 Army Navy Drive. And item E, use permit for a public high school with a design capacity of 300 students. Um, we'll move the county manager's recommendation um, as reflected um, that includes uh, specific pieces with re respect to it. I believe that's sufficiently s specific unless, Madam Attorney, um, y you have that's any. Not. That's good, great. And so item. We just need a second. Oh, oh sorry. sorry, there are two other pieces. Item F, I believe. Okay. Uh, item F, which is uh, uh, the county manager's recommendation to approve the ordinance of encroachment to permit the encroachment of three portions of a multi-level underground garage into an easement for public street and utility purposes on lot 12C Pentagon Industrial Center and item G, adopt the Penn Place Park Master Plan and Design Guidelines. Second. Fabulous, well done with that motion. Would okay. you like to speak to your motion? Sure, I'm happy to, to kick off clo closing comments. I will be fairly succinct. Um, first, your buckets that you outlined, one of them was the environment. And on the environment, um, it is not every project where the, our C2E2 chair, uh, Ms. McIntyre, speaks to this as, as a, a model that should be socialized with other places. Uh, I can't say um, how um, thrilled I am. This is sustainability in action. This is following through on Amazon's adopted plans. This is helping Arlington County reach our goals for 2025 and will reach, help reach our goals for 2035, I believe. So um, just uh, that's an ex extremely important piece. Um, with respect to the community benefits, uh, I think uh, Vice Chair Dorsey put it well. Um, there are about 300 students in Arlington Community High School. About 85% of them are Arlingtonians of color. And about a high percentage, well over 50%, uh, are low-income Arlingtonians. They will go to school in a facility that looks outstanding, that values their economic opportunity and futures in an extraordinary way. Couldn't be more happy about that. I think of the, the school that I started teaching in, um, which was a, not the physical facility that this school is, and I'm thrilled about that. Um, child care, uh, I know that's deeply held an important piece that it will be open to subsidies. Um, affordable housing, uh, I think that um, uh, we absolutely have to continue to value that, and we do. It's um, a key piece of our budget discussions, and. This contribution is significant. I think this is part of helping us to reach our affordable housing master plan goals. The park um, is the last place, uh, last piece I kind of wanted to mention. Um, and just, I, I think you're right that it will attract people to this place. And I'm very eager uh, for, uh, for us to move forward. I think there are some good comments by, um, by speakers. I will sort of reiterate the opportunity cost of this is going to help us enable the inclusive economic growth that is possible. Four years, or three years ago, when we considered the performance agreement, I closed by saying, we have to close the distance between the world as it is and the world as it should be. The evidence from the last three years of partnership is that we, the county, and Amazon, and the community are helping get us closer to the world as it should be. Voting for this will help that too. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Garvey. Yeah, thank you. I, I actually find myself um, 
my comments are going to build right on where you left off, Mr. DeFranti. So um, one, boy, have we come a long way since that meeting in 2019. Um, that was quite a meeting, and a few of you have been here from the beginning. It's great to see everybody here. Um, I feel like this is partway on our journey, and we've come a long way. We've got a long way to go. Um, as I sort of said at the beginning, I do feel this is about way more than just a building and a site plan. I think we are a little bit changing a paradigm, as you kind of talked about. The world as it is, and the world as we want it to be. Um, and part of that paradigm, one is it has to be adversarial. There's sort of a sense if we're not like upset with you and criticizing you and there's not a whole lot of sort of fights going on back and forth, we must not be doing our job. Um, but actually, I think the way this went and what we've come out with, the product we've come out with, shows how good actual cooperation is. And that doesn't mean there weren't disagreements. I wasn't part of them. I got a little sense of some of them. Um, and you showed how things changed. And I know our staff has worked really hard. This is a good time to throw out bouquets to our staff, um, to our community who's worked so hard. Um, I think it's really cool having the livability 22202 up there. That's a volunteer group, and they do incredibly professional good, good work um, looking out for their community. So thank you for the whole process. I think we're getting a new paradigm on what the Arlington Way looks like for these kind of processes, and that's a good thing, because I think we come out with a better product, um, and everybody feels better in the end. Um, I, a couple of other paradigms I was thinking about, besides being adversarial, one is that urban has to equal concrete and bad for the environment. I actually see this site and the work you're doing, um, all the talk about um, native plants and things, as, and a water feature, which I love, kind of as a, an effort to heal the planet and heal people who are trying to live all together in sort of an urban, an urban place. We've got to learn how to do this in the 21st century, onto the 22nd as well. I think this is a real start on how to do it. I hope it's going to be a model for here, for the region, and I think for the world, which I think is probably part of your purpose, um, knowing how Amazon maybe works sometimes. And I think you might have nailed it on some of this, particularly the biophilia. So thank you so very much. Um, I think it's going to be, I hope, um, changing another paradigm that profitable for a business has to mean bad for labor and bad for the community. It was great. You did well having a couple of the labor representatives come in here. Um, and it's a start. I, I won't even go. We won't talk about warehouses and things, because that's not what we're doing here. But how, you're, how it's working out here seems to be working really well and improving standards for our workers here and setting, again, a model for the region. Because wage theft and things was a really huge problem in the region. I'm sure it hasn't gone away but we're helping to make some students. So, so that's another paradigm that we're going to change. It doesn't have to be bad for people. You can work together. Um, another one I think that we're working together on, not so much about this site, is that attractive, building an attractive community has to mean building a community where poor people can't live. Um, and we are working, there were criticisms about, you know, a, a lot of discussion about San Francisco and Seattle. I think we've all been learning lessons about how that goes there. And we all want to keep Arlington a welcoming place for everyone. It's actually a healthier community that way. And I think we're going to start to change that paradigm, too, with the work we're doing on the missing middle. Um, nobody even has yet mentioned all the help you gave us with Barcroft Apartments is affordable and, and being able to purchase that large, large uh, set of units of affordable housing and make that uh, stay affordable. Um, and that preserves what we need to preserve. So you, you, you're great partners. A lot of nonprofits have come to talk. Um, and that, again, is changing this paradigm. So. Um, I think this is great. I'm really pleased to, to approve it. As I say, I think we're going on to a very, um, we're working on changing the paradigm of how a successful community works. And I really, really appreciate that. And I'm going to take you up on that briefing, if you would. OK, <laughs> Mr. Sabo, thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Ms. Garvey. Uh, Mr. Carantonis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so a, a project of the, the impact and, and, and the importance of Penn Place cannot I mean, it's very logical that it will stimulate community thoughts that transcends the the site plan discussion that we have before before us today. Uh, therefore, I think that um, definitely the comments that came from the Housing Commission, from Parks Commission as well, uh, as well as from several members of our community uh, who testified today, uh, both reflect the excitement and the expectations, but also the concerns. And this is a good thing. This is appropriate when we discuss a project of that size. In fact, I uh, think that Amazon uh, itself as a company has been well responsive and uh, to to these to to their impact uh, and to the impact of their arrival here in Arlington, and uh, hence the uh, you know we've seen the investments in housing and education. Uh, in, in social services, in philanthropy. Uh, of course, all this doesn't settle 
their discussion about how to digest the so-called Amazon effect uh, on the long term, but it gets us to a very high place, it sets a very high standard from which we uh, have to uh, depart now and, and continue. Uh, after all, the full benefit of uh, of the of this development can only be realized uh, if we, as a community, uh, continue to make the commensurate investments uh, to preserve diversity, to to enhance and advance equity. So, uh, so I th I think that this is these are these are conversations that get us started in the into a new a new place uh, when we talk about these things like housing. Uh, so back to the what is on the table today. I, I really celebrate the urban forum that uh, the architecture, the designer team has uh, delivered. Mr. Sabo, Ms. Orb, um, the NBBJ team, um, you have set, uh, in my opinion, a new standard for the value that architects and designers bring to the public process and to the public realm. And I have also to mention here the very hardworking uh, planning commissioners, uh, Ms. Gehring, Peterson and, and Mr. Sarley, uh, who, who have accompanied this process and have been uh, channels for significant improvements throughout. Um, you delivered a project that marks a, a, a final departure, I should, I should say, uh, from the gray and beige and uninspiring repository of federal bureaucracy that we were used to uh, in this corner of Arlington for more than half a century, and we woefully uh, see as almost as almost obsolete today. Um, the composition um, gives us a new identity for Arlington. Uh, it's a gateway. It is. It will define how Arlington is seen from the district, also from from. Arlington from the river and from the air uh, to the comments of Mr. Cooper and Mr. Wilson. Uh, uh, I would say that indeed uh, for once uh, the ambition of the content of what is happening inside the building um, meets, so the focus on technology and innovation really meets the uh, innovative uh, spirit of the uh, environment of the campus and, uh, the, and its external presence. Uh, I would like to see to say a couple of things about what I liked in particular in in this. The number one thing I have to say, from uh, is the the delivery of the Arlington Community High School. Uh, this uh, this is for me a very important deliverable. I couldn't agree more with Ms. Sisk's uh, comments on uh, the commitment to education, and I thank I thank Amazon for this. Uh, this is really a big improvement here, and and pays forward. Uh, and has one of the highest uh, multipliers uh, to just to uh, you know tie back to Mr. Co to, to the comments of Mr. Dorsey on uh, how we think about uh, public benefits. The 30 million of affordable housing, the labor agreements, uh, Ms. Garvey mentioned them, and the overall economics of this, because after all, uh, we had some some discussion pre uh, previously today about you know the the effective tax rates etc. Arlington uh, used to be a place where 50% of the tax base was commercial, uh, and I think that one of the most sustainable components, uh, long-term sustainable components fiscal fiscal sustainability is the development of our commercial tax base uh, and recovery towards this 50% like Mr. Uh, different mentioned before. In the smaller parts, I really like the innov innovative um, uh, position of the timber pavilions. I cannot speak uh, you know high enough of uh, how how much I th I feel that these will cont will contribute to making this a more public space. Um, I think the bike storage is a, a, a the destination parking for 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 cyclists is a great innovation. The water tanks, the thermal capacity batteries that you built in, uh, which you know complements this one, the commission commitment to 100% renewable energy, to the lead platinum platinum scoring, uh, to the 30% savings on a building uh, that are still uh, you know built with glass facades and have a high thermal gain. Uh, the bird friendliness, uh, there was, uh, by the way, uh, very, very recently a, 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 an article in, in Bloomberg City Lab on this and, and the project was mentioned specifically and, and honored for that. 
So uh, I have some remaining complaint com concerns. Uh, I still think that the Fern Street gate uh, uh, composition, the green ribbon rendering, is still a little bit too linear and invites. Um, it's it's a little bit more multimodal as I would like to. I would like more of a, a promenade, this more pedestrian space that is interrupted by more uh, green space, uh, much much like the the New York High Line is is designed. Uh, but I can live with this, and I think that there there will be a lot of. Um, uh, that, that this will be a successful place uh, after all. And uh, the, my only, uh, you know, relative disappointment, while I recognize the technical constraints, um, uh, the 12th Street corridor, I believe that we should have uh, fought more or have, you know, tried harder to get a protected bike lane and, and cyclability on this place. All in all, um, it is an excellent project. Um, it's a high impact project uh, with the, the decision we make today will advance us one step forward to welcome Amazon and integrate Amazon in, in Arlington. Uh, while at the same time, you know, we always recognize the challenges that we have ahead. So thank you so much. I, uh, I think uh, I made clear enough that I will be supporting the motion. Thank you so much, Mr. Carantonis and uh, Mr. Dorsey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so. A lot has been said already that I certainly associate myself with. I appreciate Mr. Lutz earlier really framing this conversation where it needs to be framed and thinking about the uh, economic changes that have befallen the Crystal City, Pentagon City area as a result of job losses uh, in an area where we have extensively planned for there to be a level of job growth, as Mr. DeFerranti said, that would support our overall county goals. We have already invested in the systems and the infrastructure to ensure that that level of activity was accounted for, and uh, this project is backfilling that hole, which is tremendously important from an existential standpoint. It's also important to note that this is a project that is not displacing anything. It's bare site. What we're seeing here is emanating uh, and completely new, and what is emanating from the site is quite striking. I usually don't like to spend a lot of time talking about the architecture and other details, preferring that that be an applicant's uh, prerogative. But in this case, I have to, because it's quite striking. As people come and see the area from above, it will be incredibly striking. And then the at-grade experience, I believe, is going to be pleasing to so many. And uh, I think that's a result that's really achieved because the design team is so incredibly invested in this. I, I have to say that I kind of like feel the connection and passion that you all have radiating from over there to here. You all are caring about this immensely aside from just performing a job for a client and that really shows through. And um, you know, when it comes to what that delivers, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty impressive. I, I think when it comes to the uh, urban and biophilic elements of this site, I, it's evocative to me of on a smaller scale of some parts of Central Park, places that you don't quite know what you're getting into when you start, uh, but you're completely immersed in something amazing once you're in there. And um, even though it may not be easy to orient yourself with where you might go, uh, the process of figuring it all out is, is, is a great joy. And I see this happening at this site on a smaller scale. And, and as we think about our emergence into trying to be a more biophilic community, clearly this is achieving outcomes the likes of which we have not seen in any parts of our county, which I am very much appreciative of. Uh, on, the, on the sustainability side, it, it's been said, and I'll just simply sum up when it comes to the systems and the metrics that this project is delivering, it's off the charts. And uh, that is a benefit that will accrue not only for Arlingtonians of today, but obviously for future generations. Speaking of those community benefits, I won't say much more about it other than when it comes to Arlington Community High School. Um, you know, it's important to note, Mr. DeFerranti, thank you for spotlighting the students who currently attend ACHS. Uh, and to understand that historically, uh, those students have uh, been termed uh, uh, students of alternative education, different than the normative. But as we think about the facility that they're gonna occupy in the place where they might have, as 
Mr. Cooper talked about earlier, opportunities for apprenticeships and connections to emerging employment sectors. I have a feeling that the educational delivery at ACHS is gonna become normative and what we're gonna do broadly for all high school students. So yes, I am thrilled about the benefit that it's gonna provide for people who have been marginalized and left behind, but I'm very excited because I think this is going to portend the way we, we better equip and educate students in the future. Uh, connectivity and 12th Street, that conversation is very interesting and while I certainly respect the desire to look at 12th Street and think maybe we could have done more on 12th Street to accommodate more modes. I tend to look at the uh, holistic uh, nature of this site and all of the improvements that are accruing. And compared to the status quo, I believe this is a, an immeasurable improvement on the way that people are going to be able to walk and bike through the particular area uh, because of what's being done on site and the surrounding improvements. Uh, labor standards, Mr. Castro and Mr. Ackerman, thank you so much for coming and bringing that up. And, and also just personally, Mr. Shuttler, I, I'd like to thank you because it was three years ago that, uh, that I asked you all, we asked you all sincerely to engage with us on this issue. It wasn't an area that you were entirely, had, had entirely well thought out, uh, but you, you engaged with us in that partnership and have delivered some results in terms of uh, making sure that people who work on this project at all stages are valued in all ways and are protected from exploitation in all ways. And it has produced uh, the outcomes that I had desired. I had the opportunity to speak with some of the workers, none of whom knew who I was. I wanted to get a real reflection of what it was like to, to be on this project and whether they felt valued and heard reports that it was uh, among the best sites that they had ever had a chance to work on. And they really felt like it was, you know, not just simply a job where people were looking to get as much out of them and giving them as little in return. And, and, and that's exactly what we wanted to see happen and that you were going to continue to carry that forward here uh, and even look to uh, improve is, is really terrific. And then lastly, I'll just speak to the equity concerns that Mr. Heminger brought up. And, and while I was not at the Housing Commission meeting, so I'll have to take your word, that no one was able to speak to the uh, equity uh, analysis or perspectives of this project, I'll just do so now. Um, when you think about our fundamental baselines of equity, it's assessing who benefits and who burdens. So I'll talk about who benefits. It is the workers who are working on this project to construct it, as we just talked about, who are going to be well protected to ensure that they not only earn rates that are prevailing in the Commonwealth of Virginia, but we're looking at the metro area as a whole so that we can ensure that workers uh, throughout are receiving a fair wage for the work that they could perform in Arlington, in the District of Columbia, in suburban Maryland. Uh, also, the protections against exploitation, which I spoke about. There are also, of course, the Arlington Community High School beneficiaries that we have talked about extensively. It is adding part of the plan to add 25 at least thousand jobs to the area. That level of employment growth reduces unemployment, which if you don't know, disproportionately impacts people of color more than it does other individuals. So that employment growth will naturally accrue benefits to people of color, not to mention that the applicant has some pretty uh, market innovative programs to connect with underserved communities uh, through the work that they do with students in school to connect uh, people to technology fields. Uh, so uh, we hope that there will be beneficiaries there as well. $30 million that it's going to committed affordable housing through our <coughs> Arlington, uh, to our <coughs> AHIF uh, revolving loan fund is an important uh, consideration as it comes to meeting our, our region's housing challenges. and. Uh, then as we think about the burdens, Mr. Heminger brought up communities, Seattle, San Francisco, who have dealt with challenges that come from extreme, extremely high uh, income earners who are competing with lower income earners for scarce housing. Uh, I don't know how the interpretation that we didn't study consult with those communities ever came across. That was actually an extensive part of the engagement 
that we all did uh, before Amazon came to Arlington and that I did personally, uh, but beyond understanding exactly what went wrong in those communities, our community maybe would be happy to know that we've tried to address those in ways that directly learn from those negative experiences. One, by focusing extremely on increasing the housing supply, not just within a jurisdiction, but also within the surrounding region impacted by job growth. So we have intended to make sure that we can absorb Amazon employees and other employees who may be coming to the region through associated increases in housing supply targets and land use policies in Arlington, Alexandria, Fairfax, but also the district, Prince George's County, Montgomery County, and everyone within the National Capital Area region. And then of course, as we think about the current work that we're doing to uh, affirmatively further fair housing to ensure that we reduce inequitable outcomes in terms of our housing policies, that's work that we're doing in Arlington and region-wide. So I believe as you look at an equity analysis of uh, this project and the list of beneficiaries of which I've only partially described and our attention to the burdens, uh, if, if it wasn't forthcoming, how this measures up from an equity standpoint, uh, hopefully that gives you a flavor. And if anybody needs to have it codified, I'd be happy to do that for you as well. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Dorsey and colleagues. Well, everything's been said, but not everybody has said it. Has said it. So um, here we are. I'm really glad to, to be able to, to make just a couple of comments in closing. Um, uh, I am so glad to support this project. And thank you, everyone, who has not only contributed to this dialogue today and for really almost a year, more than a year before that, um, but who has stayed with us for the conversation today. I hope that you've heard your own comments and concerns reflected back um, because we are listening and we care very much about those who have contributed not only to put forth a uh, strong project, but to make it better. Um, you know, I, I think a, a couple of, of, of points to note too. One of the pieces we've not yet talked about really, which is one of our uh, primary points of deliberation we can consider a site plan, is its conformance with a sector plan. We have a brand new sector plan in place with Pentagon City. Uh, and it is really exciting that this first project out of the gate under that new sector plan um, not only conforms with it, but exceeds it, right? Quite literally in terms of expectations for the tree canopy, um, really putting a fabulous marker down for what that green ribbon will look like. I appreciated Mr. Cassell's comments about how that started as an aspiration or an idea of the livability to to a two community it was formalized through the sector plan and is now given life in such an exciting way on this project. Um, you know, beyond that, we look, uh, of course, to, to how a project will benefit the community. Um, we have talked uh, at great length about the open space on this project, what it will mean, how it will invite others in the neighborhood in. And I, I just wanted to point to something in particular, and, and I can't put this better than our Parks and Recreation Commission did. They commended the project for placing a high priority on the creation and interaction of spaces as opposed to a design in which spaces or public spaces are entirely dependent on and what is left over after structures are built. And this provided creative opportunities for the entire site. Um, and, and that is something that we still struggle with, right? The idea of putting that public realm front and center and rather than just trying to carve it out of what's left um, after uh, the, the, the commercial buildings are built. Um, that's wonderful. And, and, and looking at that kind of from the outside in has clearly reflected in what is such a, a strong and, and beautiful sense of place um, intended here. Uh, my colleagues have talked about the schools at great length in here and, and why this is so exciting. Um, uh, I, I would just note, you know, we focus, um, we have talked so much about this conversation about the need to realize proffers for schoolers and kind contributions for schools um, for so many years. In fact, this was kind of a key point of advocacy for many of the folks who ended up founding Arlingtonians for Sustainable Future, from whom we've heard today. And you know, I, to, to, to just kind of reflect the sentiment that, that we heard so often, you know, in the years, I'd say maybe largely between like 2014 and 2019, uh, a column by one of the founders of ASF, you know, really rightly called out the county to say that the county has failed entirely to request cash or in-kind schools contributions. Um, and, and that was something that I think really, really landed with a lot of us. And because that conversation so often focused on the idea of surrounding jurisdictions that maybe had realized an elementary school in a low-rise commercial development, I'm, I'm fearing that we actually might be mo missing the momentousness of this moment, which is the county working in close partnership with APS to find the facilities needed in their adopted CIP and work 
with a private developer to realize that space. This is the realization um, of what we were called upon to do, uh, and I hope it will be only the first time. It is also the realization of something else we were called upon to do. I remember very clearly at the time of the HQ2 decision, talking to community leaders that I respect and admire, saying, how do we know that our communities, our Latino community, our black and brown communities will benefit from the high paying jobs that will come with HQ2? How do we know we're not just gonna get left behind? The idea that the Arlington Community High School, which my colleagues have spoken to so well, has always been about helping students not only complete their high school degree, but also move into a pipeline, whether that's been through Northern Virginia Community College or others, will now quite literally move into a pipeline of those tech jobs by being co-located in the same building. Um, that is, again, not only the fulfillment of a long-held desire to show collaboration between county schools and the private sector on citing our schools, but it also, again, represents the fulfillment of that goal to make sure that these are tech jobs that bring the whole community forward in opportunity. We've talked to about housing. I think Mr. Dorsey described it beautifully. I will note, you know, um, the Housing Commission, for example, called for a displacement plan, which is a tool that we have in place for projects that quite literally displace residents, right? We know that when a project proposes to displace, especially residents who are either living in committed affordable units or market rate units, such as on the Pike, we expect that developer to bring forth a very specific tenant relocation return plan. Um, there's obviously, as Mr. Dorsey put it, no one's being displaced from this site. Uh, but I do understand that desire to say, well, what impact might the office market have um, on uh, you know, rents in Arlington? And I think you know, that question was such an interesting one. It can be answered in a lot of different ways. We have a really strong analysis from the Stephen Fuller Institute, which has really been kind of the premier source of, of academic research uh, on the effects that Amazon might bring and, and other commercial development might bring to Arlington. And they noted because of the relatively large supply of rental housing, and more importantly, the ability of the region to continue to increase the supply, the rental market will be able to accommodate HQ2 households without outsized increases in rents overall. That said, you know, that's in the aggregate, the aggregate, the impact might be de minimis. Um, in the lived experience, as Mr. Devonzo talked about, especially those closest to, it might be significant. Um, but I take from that, uh, you know, and the importance that Amazon contribute, uh, and $30 million is a groundbreaking contribution to affordable housing, and is far beyond what has ever been realized with a site in Arlington. I suspect if we were to try to calculate the, the sort of second order effects um, of, of Amazon uh, employment and the new jobs, highly paid jobs, the effects that that might have downstream on the market, um, it would come out to far less than $30 million. Um, but I really appreciate Amazon's willingness, not only through this community benefits package, but as my colleagues have talked about, significant investments in the areas of greatest need and greatest opportunity when it comes to affordable housing to really recognize and embody um, that no matter how big a part of the problem Amazon might need to be, it is committed to being a big part of the solution to our affordable housing challenges. Um, you know, I think uh, the, the last point I did want to make about that was, was how well Susan English, Ms. English comments made it when she said the restrictive policies of Arlington have much to answer for when it comes to our high housing costs. I think that is a comment that lands with me as I know it does with my colleagues and is a call to action for the work that we are continuing to take underway to contribute to the supply of housing in the county. Um, you know, so in conclusion, I think the, the um, the question of, you know, will our community benefit from this plan that is before us is a question of who is our community, right? And so on top of the fact that this is a building that meets even the most rigorous environmental standards, um, you know, as you all know, I, I think this might be the first time a project has actually met C2E2 standards for uh, environmental um, contributing to our, our, our climate um, uh, uh, action goals. Um, you know, it exceeds the aspirations of a new sector plan. On top of this public realm being delivered um, for the benefit of the community and the benefits for our small business owners, as testified to so compellingly by those business owners today, it is our community that will benefit from these thousands of career launching jobs in the construction trades that, that Met Park has already brought and that Penn Place will be. It is our students who will benefit from Arlington Community High School. We are one community and we will benefit from this all together. 
the the opportunity uh, to, to not only provide something exciting for the near neighborhoods, but to lift up the entirety of Arlington County um, makes this project a joy to support. Um, I've appreciated the hearing today, the contributions of all, including my colleagues. And with that, I believe we are already ready for a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Thank you. That carries unanimously. Congratulations to the applicant. Thank you to our staff and commissions. We will be recessing. I think we can return at 1.30 for a hearing on the Clarendon Sector Plan updates. We will see you all at 1.30.
to the regular meeting of the county board. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Um, we are returning at 1.37 p.m. Uh, and I believe our colleague, Mr. Karen Tonis, is again on the line with us. Is that correct? I'm here. All right, fabulous. Okay, without further ado, we will uh, reconnect to our agenda. I will ask our clerk to please call the next item. Of course, item number 39 is adoption of the following elements associated with the Clarendon Sector Plan update planning process. Um, 39A is adoption of the 22 Clarendon Sector Plan. 39B is the general land use plan map and booklet amendments. And 39C is the Arlington County Zoning Ordinance Amendments to Articles 3, 9, and 18. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn to the manager to introduce staff for a presentation. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Matt Ladd is with us uh, this afternoon as well as Jen Smith and uh, Matt will... Um, Oh, wait, I forgot. Yes, and Brett Wallace is virtually, he was going to be here in person, but he's here virtually. Brett is going to be giving the presentation. So, Mr. Wallace. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Brett Wallace with the Planning Division. I'm happy to be here today to present the Clarendon Sector Plan update. The subject items before you today include adoption of the Clarendon Sector Plan update including uh, amendments to the general land use plan and the Arlington County Zoning Ordinance. Uh, just a quick overview of the presentation today. I'll just provide a brief overview of the study background, uh, provide a summary of proposed updates uh, to the sector plan, mainly since the request to advertise, provide a quick summary of the GLUP and zoning amendments before uh, discussing commission review and community engagement and concluding with staff recommendations. So starting with the study background, you can see the study area as shown on the map here, which is bounded by Washington Boulevard, 10th Street North, North Hudson Street, and North Kirkwood Road. Uh, includes several private sites, including the county-owned 10th Street site that has the current uh, fire station number four and fire prevention offices. Some of the elements of the plan that were evaluated throughout the process include land uses for private redevelopment, building height and form, transportation, including new street locations and designs, potential replacement of fire station four, and guidance for public spaces. Uh, if adopted, this will be a comprehensive update of the 2006 sector plan, and the final formatting would be done post-county board adoption. So just to provide a summary of uh, this presentation is really focused on uh, main areas of continued focus and study since the request to advertise including the county-owned 10th Street site, fire station number four, affordable housing, new alternative maps for the county site, which was requested by the board uh, last month at the RTA to include a scenario uh, for the county site for with the fire station co-located with housing. Um, so we have some alternative maps. Um, also providing a little follow-up um, from last month as well on public open space, including some public space master plan guidance. Uh, we'll then discuss historic preservation for the Joyce Motors building uh, and then conclude with an update to the streets map um, to maintain a ped and bike connection between Wilson Boulevard and Fairfax Drive, which was a request uh, by the Transport Transportation Commission and the uh, Planning Commission. So first, starting with the county on 10th Street site and Fire Station 4, um, throughout the process, we've worked very closely with the fire department to understand their uh, operational and programming needs. Um, but most importantly, as part of the sector plan update, we'll be providing guidance uh, for the fire station uh, to be flexible to account for both on and off-site options. Uh, so therefore, staff is recommending that uh, four scenarios for the county on 10th Street site be included in the sector plan update. Two of the scenarios on the left uh, include a fire station that's replaced on-site, whereas the two on the right uh, assume a relocation of the fire station within proximity of the current site. Uh, the figure on the far left, figure 2.16, was requested by the board to be included as part of the RTA ex expansion of the advertisement. Um, this would uh, include a fire station co-located with housing. Um, one important thing to note here is that there would be a little to no uh, public open space with this scenario, which was a concern identified by the Planning Commission and the LRPC. Um, and I just wanted to note the Planning Commission uh, recommended uh, removal of this scenario uh, not to be included in the sector plan update. That motion passed uh, 8 to 1. The next scenario, 2.17, would assume a standalone fire station with approximately 10,000 square foot park 
with potential rooftop public space. Uh, the Planning Commission also recommended a co-location of public uses above the fire station that passed uh, unanimously. Uh, the other two uh, scenarios include, uh, as, again, assume a relocation of the fire station. Uh, figure 2.8 would assume a, a affordable housing project along North Hudson Street, approximately 17,000 square foot park. And then figure 2.9 uh, would assume relocation and the uh, L-shaped county owned property could be all become a, a park. So just going into a little bit more detail on figure 2.16 with the co-location, um, I mentioned last time there are many design challenges on the ground floor with both a fire station and a residential project. As you can see in the plan view here with the pool through bays off of, uh, North Hudson Street and the front apron uh, being open to the sky, there's also additional space adjacent to the apparatus or apparatus bays for decontamination spaces um, and then uh, a parking entrance on the northern end of uh, North Hudson Street. Um, so you can see there will be little to any room for any type of residential access or or loading or or service to the residential that would be above the fire station. Um, so it would be most logical to put the residential loading and parking access off of North Hudson Street or Irving Street, I'm sorry, as shown with the yellow arrow. But we also have to consider other residential ground floor uses such as lobby, retail amenity space, and elevator core space. Uh, looking a little bit closer at figure 2.7, this would be the standalone fire station with the uh, approximately 10,000 square foot park. Um, this is a ground floor plan, so it would be very similar to the previous scenario. However, as you can see in the 3D model view on the right there, that the uh, fire station could potentially uh, bridge over the rear apron um, to provide uh, potential rooftop public spaces uh, above the fire station. Um, I mentioned the new alternative maps for the county on 10th Street site, again, coming out of the request to advertise. You can see um, staff has provided an alternative uh, height and step back map for the county site with an inset map that's shown on the bottom right that's highlighted there. Um, and again, this map and the heights uh, permitted here would allow the development of uh, figure 2.6, the co-location scenario that was added. Uh, staff also updated uh, several other maps in the zoning ordinance uh, to accommodate that scenario. On the topic of affordable housing, I mentioned um, last time that Clarendon has the lowest amount of committed affordable units representing just 3% uh, in the RB corridor. And so a development scenario for the county site um, including affordable housing, such as figures uh, shown here on this slide, could potentially yield um, approximately 215 to 260 CAFs. I also just note here uh, policy guidance from the Affordable Housing Master Plan um, encouraging uh, uh, major uh, capital investment for community facilities. Uh, since the request to advertise, uh, staff updated the, the maps that I've previously noted, but we also noticed that the public spaces map uh, was not updated. So this is a new um, change since the RTA. It's also noted in the supplemental report. Um, so the change uh, it indicates uh, multiple land use scenarios for the county owned uh, 10th Street site that's highlighted on the slide and then also added to the legend on the bottom left. At the last county board meeting, uh, there was some discussion and questions about other public spaces within the vicinity of the study area. Um, staff has put together an inventory as shown here uh, of public spaces and their amenities uh, that are located within a half mile radius. <clears throat> uh, on the subject of historic preservation, specifically for the Joyce Motors building, uh, I just wanted to note the Planning Commission recommendations uh, that are consistent with uh, their uh, motions that passed at the RTA uh, for full frontage preservation in situ for the, the Joyce Motors building. Uh, the Planning Commission also uh, directed uh, the board to ask the manager to look at the historic resources inventory to ensure in situ preservation for all the remaining essential ranked commercial buildings in the county and that passed unanimously. 
In terms of staff's recommendation, staff is recommending that the facade preservation of the south and east facades uh, be relocated uh, to the corner of 10th and Irving Street with a 10 foot step back that is consistent with the zoning ordinance. Um, uh, staff is also recommending adding a, a symbol uh, to the map and a note in the legend uh, indicating the relocation of the facade to meet the build two lines um, that's shown here in the bottom uh, left with the red the red lines there. And staff really feels that this uh, relocation will establish a proper streetscape and urban form that will help frame the future public space on the county site. And I also just wanted to note that the uh, HLRB review will be required for the SPRC process for essential ranked buildings. <clears throat> uh, and then closing, um, I mentioned the Transportation Commission and the Planning Commission uh, had requested uh, to maintain a pedestrian and bicycle connection between the Northside Social and the TNJ Auto Body. Staff had previously uh, in the LRPC process had shown this connection that's highlighted on the right uh, removed just due to the private ownership of the space and some complexities that we've identified in the staff report and also the draft uh, sector plan text. So since uh, the Transportation Commission meeting, um, staff has evaluated this further and has added this connection back to the map as shown here on this slide and to maintain this connection with more of a multimodal uh, feel um, rather than an alley-like uh, character. And so staff has included uh, some uh, text in the sector plan uh, describing that connection. I'll just quickly go over the GLUP and zoning ordinance amendments. Um, these are mainly changes uh, to the block and the street alignment locations to respond to planned or built condition, including some uh, triangle symbols to identify future open spaces. And then I mentioned the alternative map, um, the maps that were changed in the zoning ordinance uh, for for the county owned 10th Street site. I'll just cover quickly the commission review and community engagement. Uh, the process kicked off back in October of 2020. We held six LRPC meetings, one uh, zoning committee meeting, multiple online opportunities for engagement. <coughs> um, we met with the planning commission, housing commission and county board in March for the request to advertise. And then since the request to advertise, we met with the Transportation Commission. I mentioned uh, some of their motions that passed with the connection between the Northside Social. Um, we met with the Planning Commission on April the 6th. They voted to uh, adopt the plan subject uh, to the amended motions related to the land use scenarios for the county site and the historic preservation uh, and transportation recommendations. We've also received uh, letters um, from, from both the HLRB and the Park and Rec Commission. Uh, the HLRB letter uh, strongly supports the motions passed by the Planning Commission for full frontage preservation in situ for Joyce Motors. The Park and Recreation Commission did not take any action. However, they did submit a letter expressing concerns about some of the planned green spaces and the potential loss of public space on the 10th Street site for affordable housing or private development. So in conclusion, staff is recommending adoption of the following elements associated with the Clarendon Sector Plan update planning process, including A, the adoption of the 2022 Sector Plan, which is an update to the 2006 Sector Plan, the General Land Use Plan Map and Booklet Amendments, and Arlington County Zoning Ordinance Amendments to Articles 3, 9, and 18, including maps 9.2.5 through 9.2.12. Uh, so that concludes staff's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wallace. Appreciate that very much. Um, okay, we'll go next to our commissioners. Um, I know we have uh, Mr. Weir present on behalf of the Planning Commission. We'll begin with you. Thank you again. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the County Board. Uh, again, for the record, my name is Daniel Weir, and I am here on behalf of the Planning Commission. Um, as reflected in the report, uh, the Planning Commission largely supports uh, the, uh, the recommendations contained within the staff report. Um, with some notable caveats, I want to speak to them in the two different areas, uh, 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 open space and historical preservation. The Commission's uh, <clears throat> recommendations regarding open space by and large reflect three threads. Um, first, 
is a recognition that the superpower of sector plans is their ability to articulate what is and is not within the realm of consideration uh, for site plan proposals. <clears throat> Excuse me, they determine whether staff, commissions, uh, and the board are able to say in brief such and such is or is not contemplated within the sector plan. Uh, second, that public uses like green and open space uh, currently envisioned in the sector plan are important enough that they should be preserved as best possible in the updates to the sector plan. Uh, and third, that it would be wholly inappropriate for the sector plan to envision any standalone single use public facility uh, such as a fire station only 900 feet from a metro station as an acceptable planning outcome. Simply put, there should be no toehold in the sector plan for the idea that a fire station could be built on this parcel without sharing its footprint with other public uses above the station. Uh, as Commissioner Gearin noted last month uh, when she was here for the, um, uh, uh, for the, when she was representing the Commission's recommendations concerning the request to advertise, the Commission has an obligation to protect the whole of the comprehensive plan. Um, in this case, that means balancing the aspirations of both the Public Spaces Master Plan and the Affordable Housing Master Plan. The, LRC, the LRPC proposed considering, uh, con, pr, uh, pr, the LRPC process, excuse me, uh, considered co-locating uh, housing, committed affordable housing with a new fire station four, uh, but at that stage of this project, there was little support uh, for further consideration as models presented to the LRPC all effectively ruled out the use of open space on a site where the existing sector plan envisions tens of thousands of square feet of open space. Um, the Commission discussed models for co-locating housing uh, that staff recommended following um, your direction at the authorization of hearings for the sector plan, uh, but did not believe that it would be appropriate for the sector plan to invite site plan proposals that would potentially eliminate the entirety of public uh, use open space from that block. I'll say a little bit more about this, but I want to turn to historic preservation. Um, the majority of the commissioners present supported uh, a recommendation of that the uh, facade of the Joyce Motors building be preserved in situ. Um, the vote, unsurprisingly, broke along the same lines as a similar uh, vote uh, um, at the RTA stage. Um, this is a <clears throat> As a, I'll, I'll preface this by saying that this is a, a recommendation in which I was very much in the minority. Um, and while I do my best to accurately and objectively advocate for the Commission's recommendation, I do want to acknowledge my own biases and invite you to, to do your best to see through them. <laughs> uh, uh, the majority opinion was, was driven by a strong sense of taking a stand on behalf of this site as one of the very few uh, essential, with a capital E, historical resources in the county, combined with a sense that the challenges faced by the anticipated applicant by in situ preservation are challenges that the applicant opted into. Um, it was a much more uh, it was much more limited concern in the LRPC process. Excuse me. The concern for in situ preservation uh, was much more limited was was expressed in a much more limited fashion than it ultimately was expressed at the RTA and final hearing stage. Uh, the, the minority opinion, I think, reflects a sense that the. Um, aspirational nature of the HRI and a realization that a by right applicant could just as easily preserve the facade in situ as raise the building entirely. Um, uh, a few commissioners were concerned that there was little offered uh, in the way of an alternative for the existing hardscape around the existing building footprint. Would it be open space? Would it be something else? Uh, it seems to be, I, I think that, that in the view of, of the minority, there was a it, it, it was there was little offered in an, as an alternative to the concerns that were being raised by a prospective applicant in public comment. <clears throat> Just a couple of comments about the overall motion. Uh, ultimately, the commission recommended the staff motions with few exceptions, as you see in the letter. Um, as noted, the commission recommends in situ preservation of the Joyce Motors facade, uh, the removal of figure 2.16, uh, and edits to the language of the sector plan such that figure 2.17 reflect a default presumption of robust co-location of facilities uh, as opposed to a standalone fire station uh, on that block. As noted, the commission also supported the pedestrian, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, pedestrian crossing from Wilson to Fairfax uh, behind the Northside Social Building, as well as a mid-block pedestrian connection across Wilson Boulevard. I think that that 
uh, additional point is also reflected in the recommendation from the Transportation Commission. There was one motion uh, that would have um, been slightly more flexible than the recommendation that 2.17 only envision co-located public use. Um, that recommendation would have allowed any co-located usage, uh, potentially including committed affordable housing, and left the initiative to a creative applicant to propose something that could be reconciled uh, uh, with the sector plan in the SPRC process. Uh, that motion failed four to five. Um, that concludes my report, and I will be happy to answer any questions that you all might have. Great. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. Um, I believe we are still joined again by um, uh, Mr. Heminger on behalf of the Housing Commission. Is that right? You with us virtually again, sir? No. Do we have another representative from the Housing Commission with us? Okay. No. All right. Um, well, in that case, uh, we will go to Mr. Rasmussen with Parks and Recreation. We appreciate your being here, sir. And uh, in the event anybody from the Housing Commission presents themselves, we would look forward to hearing from them, if so. What was the score? <laughs> I was just about to apologize for my... Uh... It's perfectly uh, within keeping of what you're here to present, right? I didn't plan this. This is absolutely um, Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Adam Rasmussen. I'm a member of the Parks and Recreation Commission, a new member uh, as of September. Um, and uh, we've been following uh, the private sector plan closely. We have um, folks on the commission who have been um, at, at meetings and, and, and watching it closely. Uh, we've had the opportunity to talk about it in uh, several meetings over the last few months. Um, and then on this past Tuesday, we received a um, presentation similar to what we received today uh, from the- Oops, from the staff, thank you. Uh, who, uh, I always think my voice is loud enough that you don't need a mic. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, on, on Tuesday. Um, and we wanted, we, we have, um, uh, provided some comments in the past on the 10th Street uh, uh, issue in the fire station. Uh, and we wanted to provide, had an opportunity to provide further comment uh, based on uh, the, the new information we received on Tuesday. Uh, so as uh, previously indicated, uh, the Parks and Recreation Committee supports the need to be flexible about for future opportunities that may arise at the 10th Street uh, North site, uh, including the potential for relocating the firehouse. Uh, however, we felt the four options that were provided for the 10th Street uh, North site um, and the additional proposed public space options in the Clarendon Sector Plan are wholly inadequate for meeting the park and recreation needs for the future residents um, of Clarendon and the identified need for ac acquiring park space in the county's public spaces master plan. Uh, the PRC strongly believes that the entire site should be des designated for park space and should not be um, developed for housing. Speaking of housing, um, that's the first issue we wanted to address. Um, we feel that, that the proposed housing development unnecessarily pits the need for open space against the importance of increasing the number of committed affordable housing units in Clarendon. We do not believe that one has to come at the expense of the other. Uh, the four adjoining proposed residential development projects that are currently being considered um, are all asking for a greater floor area ratio than in the 2006 plan. To achieve this, these projects will need to provide extraordinary public benefits. Um, and why should that not include a significant number of committed affordable housing? Additional future projects contemplated in the plan offer more affordable housing opportunities. Why should we give up existing public space to, per, to private development when all of these opportunities for affordable housing exist? Arlington has a goal of building attractive residential commercial areas within a sustainable and equitable community. A new park on the site does more to achieve these goals on the site, which is already surrounded by high density development with very little green space. Second, equity. Uh, the PRC strongly supports the county's affordable housing policy and goals, as well as the inclusion of the need to address equity and housing diversity in the Clarendon Sector Plan. We believe that ensuring um, 
access to open space and recreational park amenities is an environmental equity issue. Committing a significant existing county site for use as a con uh, contiguous park and recreation space would better support equity in housing and serve the future needs of a more diverse population than concentrating affordable housing on single site on a single site next to one of the largest firehouses in our in fire stations in Arlington. <laughs> As for the uh, proposed public space uh, outside of the 10th Street project, um, uh, the increase in housing density um, in Clarendon will only exacerbate the need for more park and recreation space than what was contemplated in the 2006 plan. Um, the county staff and planning commission have been creative in their effort to expand the, the, uh, the options, um, including the, the proposed linear park. Um, but while um, specific plans have, have not been decided yet, we don't think that proposed spaces can have offered this, the same level of amenities that a larger contiguous park that would be provided through the 10th Street Park um, uh, option. In addition, the 2002 Clarendon Sector Plan is dependent on acquisition of space. Um, being the triangle, the triangle Park and, uh, specifically, um, which is currently privately owned. And again, we're asking why would you, why would you give up currently owned public space um, for the possibility of having, um, acqu acquiring private space, which is not certain. Um, and if it does not go through, um, then uh, we'll be far, far, much farther away from being able to uh, achieve the level of service targeted for uh, active parks. I know the, the, the staff provided a list of, of, of the parks that are within a half a mile, but the public spaces master plan talks about five minute walking distance. It specifically talks about that. Um, and half a mile is not five minutes um, walking distance. Um, and, and again, this is a really uh, dense area. Um, and you know, with this increased uh, necessity for um, for park space, um, we're doing the exact opposite, uh, but providing that. And again, uh, the decisions about what will go in those public spaces have not been decided yet, um, and and so they don't, won't necessarily be park space. Uh, last area we want to cover is uh, again maximizing the park and recreation space on the 10th Street North project. Uh, we would like to reiterate the relocation of the fire fire station four should be pursued at the highest level of priority. Um, then, that being said, to achieve the park and recreation amenities level of service that the residents of Clarendon uh, require and that the public spaces master plan provides for, um, all proposed options need to be maximized to maximize the use of the 10th Street site as a park and recreation space. Um, this means that there should be only one, uh, two land use options for the 10th Street. Uh, one is with the firehouse and one is without. Um, uh, so, uh, which is which is uh, the one the one without is the, the 2.19 uh, from the plan, uh, and that is the one we support. Um, if there is a firehouse, we su strongly support making use of the space above the firehouse fire station for additional park and recreation amenities. Rooftop and elevation parks uh, have been a precedent in Arlington, uh, one namely the, the the Heights Building, uh, the APS Heights Building, and many other communities around the country have done this. Uh, we appreciate and agree with the county's pursuit of affordable housing, but do not concur that this site is an, is an accessible, I'm sorry, ex um, ex acceptable location for such a project for the many reasons outlined, I've outlined above. We, we urge the county board to adopt the well-reasoned and thoughtful considered position of the planning commission to eliminate the option to build both a firehouse fire station and affordable housing on the same site. We ask that you pr uh, prioritize the 10th Street site as envisioned in the 2006 uh, sector plan and approve an updated plan that maximizes potential park and recreation space on the 10th Street Park. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Rasmussen. We appreciate yep. your being here. Okay. Um, we've got, we're the, we do not have a representative from the Housing Commission. Uh, Mr. Krishnar, I do believe we have some public speakers, though, if you'd like to call them for us. We do, if you give me just a moment. All 
right. Our first speaker is Stephen Marcoux, followed by Mitch Crispell. Good morning. Afternoon. Good to see you all again. Uh, my name is Steve Marcoux. I'm the Government Affairs Director for the Arlington Chamber of Commerce. And I'm here to express our support for Claire. I'm so sorry, Mr. Coop. We will pause your time. I don't believe that mic is on. Can we? Oh. Um, it's probably at the base if you see it. Otherwise, we can. There you go. You're good. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, good to see you all again. Uh, my name is Steve Marcoux, and I'm the Government Affairs Director for the Arlington Chamber of Commerce. And I'm here to express our support for the Clarendon Sector Plan. Now, the previous plan was put in place in 2006, and it's very restrictive in many respects. This draft plan offers a good compromise that will better serve the needs of the community today and help move the neighborhood forward. With a metro stop just blocks away and a highly dense area surrounding it, Clarendon offers a great opportunity for additional housing density. Now, we'd have preferred that the plan go even farther to add more density to the western portion of Clarendon. Uh, this is an area that's run well behind the rest of the neighborhood and continues to have many outdated structures. However, the additional density offered will bring more units to this part of the neighborhood, we'll revitalize those blocks, and it'll bring them more in line with the character of the rest of Clarendon. And we also appreciate the change in step back requirements from 20 feet to 10. While maintaining 10 foot step backs is uh, still a bit more restrictive than we'd like, it represents a compromise that'll enable new buildings to make better and more efficient use of their available space than the current plan does. And we also believe that the approach taken by the county staff to the Joyce Motors site is the right one, and we support the staff recommendation. Now, the approach taken as part of the proposed redevelopment of that site will incorporate the materials and name into the facade of the building, maintaining that essential historic resource for decades to come. Uh, this project really represents the best way to preserve it. Failing to allow the site to be a part of the planned redevelopment would take too many units away. Uh, it would make the parking and garage access unworkable. It would really render the whole project financially infeasible. And in recommending full preservation of the Joyce Motors facade in its current place, uh, the Planning Commission didn't show that their proposed alternative of building a new building atop the existing one would really be viable. Uh, what's clear is that the option of preserving the facade in place is inconsistent with the character of the rest of the neighborhood, and it would unnecessarily hold back the progress of this portion of Clarendon. The plan redevelopment is consistent with the type of walkable, mixed-use urban neighborhood that the county needs, just two blocks away from Metro Station. Clarendon's evolved a great deal over the years, and this western portion of the neighborhood has so much potential. We urge you to approve the Clarendon sector plan, including the staff recommendation for the Joyce Motor site, without further delay. And thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Mr. Marcoux. Our next speaker is Mitch Crispell, followed by Ginger Evans. Good afternoon. Hello, my name is Mitch Crispell. I'm a director of real estate development at the Arlington Partnership for Affordable Housing. Uh, we're so pleased with the Clarendon Sector Plan update and encourage you to pass it today. We urge the county to preserve the land use scenario that envisions co-location of a fire station and affordable housing at the county-owned 10th Street site. As one of the largest owners and developers of affordable housing in Arlington, APA knows firsthand how difficult it is to find available land to build. Land costs, a competitive market, and zoning restrictions make it economically infeasible to build affordable housing in the vast majority of North Arlington. That is why county-owned land is such a critical resource in delivering housing. Building housing on public land offers the potential for reduced costs, which requires less debt to finance, and in turn, the potential to serve lower-income families. Building more affordable housing in North Arlington is an explicit goal of the 2015 Affordable Housing Master Plan, which also emphasizes the need to consider affordable housing when upgrading county facilities. Despite this, to our knowledge, no affordable housing has been built on county-owned land since our own Arlington Mill project in 2014, despite several opportunities. We agree that a modernized fire, fire station is also critical to the growing Clarendon area, and we support building a replacement facility on site. Co-locating affordable housing here is imminently doable, considering the 110-foot height proposed in the sector plan update. Housing above a fire station, are these really compatible? Yes, there are several local examples of creative development, such as the West End Fire Station in DC and the Rosalind Fire Station Number 10. We've seen it succeed before here, and we can we've seen it succeed before, and we can do it again here. Everything has trade-offs, and we are empathetic to the perspective of wanting more green space in Clarendon. From reviewing the plan, it seems that even with housing and a reduced park on the 10th Street site, this plan still achieves more open space than before. In sum, meeting our affordable housing goals will require being bold and using all available public resources. Co-locating housing with a fire station is just the kind of ambitious thinking that the county needs to meet our goals to serve low-income families in Arlington. Therefore, we ask that you preserve this option in the plan. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, our next speaker is Ginger Evans, followed by Audrey Clement. Good afternoon. Good day. My husband and I and the many neighbors we've spoken with in Ashton Heights fully support and appreciate plans to develop Western Clarendon. We appreciate staff's hard work today. We welcome new residents to enjoy our wonderful community. We welcome affordable housing, including on the south side of 10th Street where uh, property values are less. We support building a new fire station at 10th and Hudson. The fire department's need for modern facilities as well as their ability to respond quickly using nearby arterial streets is essential. Since the fire station is likely to stay, the public spaces master plan developed an accommodation of these joint needs, designated alternative 2.17 in the plans before you. While conceptual alternative 2.17 creates the opportunity for a unique and much needed active park for the thousand plus new residents along 10th Street, as well as for fire station personnel. This integrated park would connect to the mature trees next to Verizon on Irving Street, which includes a marvelous mature cherry tree, and would extend toward the county's rain garden farther, farther north on Irving. Besides providing active park spaces, it would be an oasis within the long row of tall buildings on 10th and enhance the county's existing investments on Irving Street. Further, it's across the street from the Irving corner of the Joyce development, which contemplates restoring the very deteriorated facade and using the old garage doors to provide outdoor seating along with landscaping. This uh, in total will augment the visual appeal and encourage pedestrian visits to the retail shops in the new buildings. I was glad to see that uh, Brett's presentation always includes a park on that corner. In, in it's, it's less desirable to show a gray, gray something on that corner. So we were, I was glad to see the green on the Joyce Development site. The Zero Park Alternative 2.16 should be removed from today's county approval action. This would be responsive to the many letters you've received from residents, the neighbors in the five civic associations, planning parks, and we wisely have asked you to preserve plans for a park so we can have a true urban village. It is misleading to say that having four alternatives provides flexibility. Once county-owned land is zoned for residential, the floodgates are open and we know what's going to happen. It's going to be residential. Please consider our treasured values of communi community and livability and preserve plans for an active park. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Audrey Clement, followed by David Orr. Uh, can you hear me? We can. Good afternoon, Dr. Clement. Thank you. Uh, welcome, members of the board and the county manager. I'm Audrey Clement, candidate for Arlington County Board. It's unfortunate that staff continues to ignore the pleas of nearby civic associations to preserve the green space on 10th Street in Clarendon, which has been part of the Clarendon sector plan for years. Given that this update reduces Clarendon to a concrete urban canyon on par with Roslyn and Ballston, the need for usable, public, available green space has never been greater. Likewise, it is lamentable that Joyce Motors must beg for a few tiles from its original facade and that the iconic Silver Diner must be reduced to rubble to satisfy developers' greed. I share the Park and Recreation Commission's concern about zoning changes that would impact the possibilities for a public park and desire to retain 43,000 square feet of public park space on 10th Street in its uh, December 2021 20, letter to the board. Further, I concur with community activist Suzanne Sundberg's criticism of the Clarendon sector plan as follows. Counting a street as green or open space is dishonest. This plan packs more people into a small space while reducing meaningful park and recreation areas. The fact that the county board controls the amount of density on most of the sector map makes its density limits pretty much irrelevant, especially now that the affordable housing bonus density cap is gone. Likewise, the tapering step back map is largely irrelevant because there isn't sufficient width of sites along 10th Street abutting the residential areas to provide meaningful tapering of building height. The promise to provide it is inherently dishonest and meaningless to those who live nearby. Brick and mortar retail is in the toilet in this plan. If you force buildings to contain retail space on the ground floor, why not make its uses as flexible as possible so that the space can actually be leased? 
preserving three whole building facades in the entire sector. Wow, I guess we cannot retain anything remotely human scale that might be appealing. Building right up to the sidewalk and minimal real functional green space amplifies climate change. It accentuates the claustrophobic nature of excessive building heights. It makes the streetscape hotter, more sterile and less pleasant for walking. Anyone who would ride a bike in a traffic choke congested area like Clarendon has a death wish. Adding more density won't fix that problem. The plan's wall-to-wall -wall concrete and asphalt space means any trees that may be planted are unlikely to survive to maturity. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is David Orr, followed by Brooke Alexander. Mr. Clerk, do you have our slides? Yes, we do. Give me just a moment. Uh, good afternoon. I'm David Orr. Um, it's nice to see everybody again. And on the heels of the momentous vote, um, really a tremendous vote for our county, I thank you uh, for finding a balance of meeting the, the objectives with Amazon, uh, the, the great balance of the county objectives and that momentous occasion. Thank you for that. And I'm here to also, as a developer of the Joyce Motor site, to talk to you about finding an equal balance uh, with the county objectives for that particular property. Um, next slide. Um, so the plan we, we submitted was accepted by the county under the 2006 sector plan. And um, we had an opportunity at that point in time to demolish the building. The building was uh, labeled as essential, and we took that very seriously. And so we spent a year working with county uh, historic preservation staff to find the right balance between the county objectives in preserving that building. The HRI policy specifically asked for finding a balance between future growth and other county policies, in particular things like affordable housing, sustainability, transportation, and open space planning. And we strived very hard in meeting those initiatives. And in doing so, we worked with county historic preservation staff to determine the character defining features of the project. Next slide, please. And here this slide shows you those character defining features for that building, and most notably the porcelain enamel panels, which we will take down one by one. Uh, they've been painted over. We will preserve them to their original um, construction when they were built in the 1940s as a Texaco gas station and reintroduce them, all of these character defining features, back into the building. Uh, the next slide shows um, the rear of the building, and you can see it's really, it's just run down cinder block, and most notably in the upper right hand corner, you'll see the red parking lot. Um, we'll be able to remediate um, this heavily contaminated parking lot um, if we do the, the construction that's proposed. The next slide shows you the ex uh, existing Joyce Motors building, and this is what, if it's left in situ, what it'll look like now and forevermore. And we think that the following slide is really a better example of um, good urban planning and a balance between the various objectives of the county for getting some sorely need housing units two blocks away from a metro while preserving the integrity of this building. The next slide gives you a little better example of how this building will be 10 feet set back out from the building. It'll be its own presence. It'll be restored to its original um, uh, uh, position and most notably, it'll be uh, very accessible to the public realm. A quick note on the next slide is the composition of the property. And um, what we have today is on the left and what we have on the right is the swap that we've worked out with the other developer, Tom Schultz, who's developing the rest of the triangle. Notably, the shared parking, the shared garage access ways will be defeated if we have to leave the Joyce Motors building in place. The next slide shows some of that infeasibility and how it chops up um, the site. And finally, the last slide shows you the building as it's intended to be. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is Brooke Alexander, followed by Mitchell Jorstad. Yes, and would you like these on the screen? And would you like these on the screen or are you just talking? I'm, I'm just, okay. Oh, I, I do have some slides, I have four slides. Okay. Um, These ones. Oh, here you go. 
Hello. Thank you for coming back for us. I'm Brooke Alexander from Ashton Heights. Um, you'll see on slide one, um, at the county board meeting last month, the board asked for metrics on recreation. I'd like to speak to that. The metrics you requested are called level of service. This is priority action number three on the public spaces master plan. There are two level of service metrics, population-based and access-based. The population level of service standards indicate how many of a particular amenity are needed per population. For example, one basketball court for 3,000 residents. The access level of service standards indicate where amenities are located based on travel time. Slide two, please, which should be, yes, thank you. Um, note that Clarendon, as an urban village, is based on the travel mode of walking. Indeed, the vision statement for Clarendon, and I'm quoting now, defines Clarendon's urban village as a place where walking is the travel mode of choice. Slide three. Thank you. So now that we know that we are looking at walking time, here are the access standards for recreational amenities. Note that Clarendon, since it's in a high density area, has a travel time of five minutes for basketball, community gardens, multi-use trails, off-leash, excuse me, dog park, playgrounds and casual use spaces. Travel time is 10 minutes for diamond fields, tennis courts, picnic areas, rectangular fields, and volleyball courts. We have measured the walking times from the center of Clarendon to various parks within a half mile radius. These parks meet very few of the access level of service standards. Know that adults walk an average of two to three miles per hour. That means amenities need to be one sixth of a mile to one quarter mile for those level of service amenities with a five minute travel time and one third to one half mile for the level of service amenities listed with the 10 minute travel times. Children are slower and note that people walk along streets, not as the crow flies. The maps in your packet, packet do not accurately reflect the level of service in Clarendon because they include all four transit methods together. So one flaw in these maps is that they were not based on walking travel time. Um, slide four, please. We need... Thank you so much. We do have your presentation, which we're Thank able you. to consult. Thanks, Ms. Alexander. All right, our next speaker is Mitchell, pardon me, our next speaker is Mitchell Jorstad, followed by Omari Davis. Hi everyone, my name is Mitch Jorstad. I'm a recent transplant from Missouri and I live in and I live in Buckingham. Um, I'm addressing the Wells Fargo, Verizon, and Fire Station block. And I fully stand behind the Park Commission statement that the proposed public space is wholly inadequate. Um, recently I've traveled to other cities, namely San Francisco, Philadelphia. Um, and one of the things I loved about the cities, as you can see above, is that they had these massive urban oasis parks that were planted right in the middle of the action. There were amazing gathering places where people from all walks of life would come together and do all kinds of crazy activity, from slam poetry to yoga classes, reading books, or even playing beer pong, which is funny enough to see. But um, people love these parks. They're great spots. And one thing I've noticed, Arlington doesn't have a park like this. Um, there are other parks like, say, Quincy Park, um, which are specialized sports fields areas or other or pocket neighborhood parks, but we don't have an urban oasis park like this in the middle of the action. There's Washington Square Park in San Francisco right there. This block, um, bounded by Hudson, Irving, 10th, and Washington, is prime for a park like this. And we are really robbing ourselves of an opportunity for a generational signature park located right in the heart of Arlington if we develop this block. I think that the Planning Commission and the board should take this into account. There's Meridian Hill Park, and I'll be going there after this, actually, because those kinds of parks are a valuable amenity for people 
all across Arlington, including people like me. If I see a future in Arlington, I want to see a future that includes parts like that because those places are beautiful. They bring people together in a way that allows intermingling of, again, all walks of life. This is a golden opportunity to add a crown jewel to Arlington's rich park system, and once it's developed, we can't get it back. So with this park, I hope that Arlington can develop this and embrace its urban future while providing for its current residents, the block in question up there. Um, so I hope that the Clarendon Sector Plan can accommodate a, an amazing urban oasis park like those shown above. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. All right, our next speaker is Omari Davis, followed by John Spilsbury. Hello, uh, dear members of the board. Thank you for your time today to speak today. Uh, my name is Omari Davis. I'm, a, I'm the vice chair of the Circle Affairs and Landmark Review Board in Arlington. Our board strongly supports the sequential motions pa passed by the Planning Commission recommending full frontage preservation in situ for Joyce Motors and the Clarence Sector Plan update. Built in 1949, Joyce Motors is one of 10 essentially ranked buildings in the county's historical resource inventory, HRI for short. The building is a lone surviving example of a once popular porcelain enamel panel service station type found throughout Arlington. Current plans allow for the station to be dismantled with some portion of the panels reapplied to a new building at 10th and Irving Streets. However, this is not preservation, nor is it in line with the HRI goals adopted by the county in 2011. The HRI calls for material preservation of historical buildings to the maximum extent possible. The Clarendon Sector Plan is out, is, out, is out of line with the spirit and letter of the HRI. In situ preservation, moreover, in situ preservation provides a wonderful opportunity for placemaking as well as, as a wonderful opportunity for uh, community memory. Finally, as you know, the Planning Commission also adopted a second resolution unanimously directing the county manager to begin a process of reviewing HRI inventory to provide clear options available to the county for ensuring preservation in situ for all remaining essential properties in the commercial inventory. This is something that needs to happen. The HLR strongly, sorry, HLRB strongly supports that review and urges the board to follow up through with the county manager on this. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Mr. Davis. All right, our next speaker is John Spilsbury, followed by David Cheek. Good afternoon, I'm Chair of Board Members. My name is Jack Spilsbury. Oh, I think the, uh, Mr. Spilsbury, I think the microphone. microphone might have gone out. Could you press the, the base? I, there we go. It's not still. Nope. Oh, we had it. Was on. There you okay. go. <laughs> Can I get my time? Yeah, good. Of course. Um, yeah, my name's Jack Spilsbury. I've represented Ashton Heights in the Clarendon LRBC. This has been my first time participating in longer term county planning, and I've greatly appreciated the planning commissioners and staff for their professionalism leading the way. I've also had the pleasure of working closely with the other four civic associations participating in the LRBC. In a series of joint letters to the board, we've asked the county to prioritize realizing active park space on the county owned site on 10th Street. We applaud the commissioners for listening and acting on this with three options. We realize many things have changed since 2006. First, that Verizon and the fire station are no longer likely to move. And um, the Clarendon obviously is continuing to grow. The plan now projects a total build out in Clarendon of 10 million gross square feet of residential office and retail density, which is a 40% increase in density over what existed in 2006, according to the plan. But one thing that hasn't changed is the need to preserve open space, which is more critical than ever for Clarendon's continued vitality as an urban village. The reality is the county site is the one place in Clarendon envisaged, envisioned and suitable for active recreation uses like a basketball or pickable court, a children's playground, or a larger grass area with trees. The other open spaces, the proposed linear park and the triangle adjacent to the power station, can also contribute to Clarendon's visual and public space. But each has severe limitations, and neither could potentially work for the types of active park uses, any of the active park uses I described above. Um, these uses are not found elsewhere in Clarendon um, or within a reasonable 
distance according to the PSMP standards. To address Clarendon's active park needs, our five communities put together ideas for integrating a smaller ground level open space with rooftop park amenities co-located above the fire station. This would be a uniquely positive asset for Clarendon and an exceptionally effective co-located use of the fire department site. I don't know why 2.7, 2.17 is still labeled standalone firehouse because the discussion has been focused for months and months on identifying a priority for a park co-located there. Did I use up my time? No, 15 okay. seconds, yeah. I'd like to express the strongest possible support for the commission, the planning commission's recommendation. 1B, recommend that the updates to the Clarendon sector plan remove the land use alternative for the county owned site, labeled 2.16. Thank you. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is David Cheek, followed by Bernard Byrne. Hi, I'm Dave Cheek, the uh, Clarendon Courthouse Civic Association president. Thanks for letting me talk. I agree with the other civic associations that uh, Clarendon would be best served with the 50,000 square foot park. I had three initiatives when I took this job last summer as president. One was to fix the Clarendon dog park because uh, I realized pretty quickly there's a need for green space. Since many of the dog owners, they won't go there just because it's dilapidated and they'll go to like 11th Street Park, which is now a de facto dog park. One resident told me, I don't have kids. I have a dog that's my kid. I pay a lot of taxes. I give way more in taxes than I get back. I just want a nice place to take my dog. And she's right. And what I found talking to dog owners, they need green space. And same with residents without dogs. They want more green space. Uh, I, I ask a lot of people when they walk by or if I'm just go around, around town. Clarendon is one of the most unique neighborhoods in Arlington. A lot of active young single people. It's more than like any neighborhood in Arlington, Arlington probably. They go out a lot. They want things to do outside. There's other parks around, but like uh, Mr. Krishner said, they want five minutes of walking, which is true. And this would give residents a short walk. It's also good for the developers because when the prospective residents go to their leasing office, they can point to the new park. This will help uh, increase their property value, as Mr. Wallace noted in a previous brief. And uh, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for generations. Once it's gone, it's gone. The mental health benefits from a green space is more important now with, with climate change and the problems for younger generations facing. You can put the fire station, affordable housing, and other places. There's also a lot of developments going between Whole Foods to Wendy's and Courthouse, like 12 to 70 stories. So where are those residents going to go? The second issue was the unleashed dogs at, Claire, at the 11th Street Park. I kind of let that one go because if you look at next door for the hostile debates on dog issues, I, I'm not getting in the middle of that. And the third one is how do we get uh, safe streets again in Clarendon? Um, a lot of people walk their dogs and walk around between Northside Social to Rocky Run Park and same with cyclists too. And 2020 map applications started sending drivers to the residential uh, streets because they don't want drivers to wait at red lights on 10th Street North. And um, the problem with that is you got all these people exercising and then you got these cars speeding by because uh, there's no police presence. You know, how Google Maps, Waze, and TomTom Tom is basically directing the streets. As Audrey Clement noted, it's one of the most dangerous areas probably in Arlington. It's just that it's been lucky that there's not a lot more people got hit. It was only one got hit so far that I know of. So we need to follow the progressive cities like Portland and Palo Alto. They keep cars on the main arterial roads and use tra traffic calming measures instead of letting, you know, so the residents that are walking and cycling can be safer. And this is, goes with the Arlington, you know, Vision Zero, away from car-centric. In the two years I've been trying to get this fixed, I got nowhere and no support. And in fact, the uh, DS transportation engineer I talked to was kind of hostile towards me about looking at policy change. Police captain said they're not going to patrol there. So drivers basically get to go as fast as they want. We got some video guy going like 60 miles an hour down our streets, like eighth mile. It's pretty, it just happens a lot. A lot of families here. I don't think engineers in India working for Google Maps should direct our streets. And we got Chris Slatt, traffic engineer, or he, he could be, he's a visionary doing this, a lot of good road work on the Orange Line corridor. We need people like him in DS transportation to start looking at alternate ways to keep people safe. I really appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Yes, your time is left. Yes. We appreciate your coming in on behalf of the Civic Association, though. Thank you, Mr. Cheek. All right. Our next speaker is Bernard Byrne, followed by David Schutz. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? We can. Good afternoon. Okay. Yes. Um, the Clarendon Second Plan update requires several changes. Some of these have mentioned, others have not. Uh, the most important need to change is added emphasis on the need for new green spaces in natural areas, and particularly natural areas, to increase biophilia in this uh, densely developed part of Arlington. This development has replaced much green space with buildings and pavement, including 
paved plazas. This update will continue this trend if the board does not change it. The colors in many of the uh, second plan diagrams are very deceptive. Every proposed uh, green space is open space is colored green, even though nearly all of the green spaces are actually paved plazas or will become these. As an example, the text of the plan describes a, quote, West End Plaza that the country county will consider a short, will construct a short distance west of Crown and Circle, north of the north side social and east of the Borbale Church. Diagrams is for proposed plaza and the, and, the, uh, and the plaza west of the west metro station and river escalators colored them green, which they won't be. The area containing the west, the future west end plaza presently contains a green space with trees and shrubs. The um, staff has explained that the public plaza is needed at this stage to, to re remove the green space to accommodate events that the Borromeo Church will conduct or for a, 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 a meeting area for the uh, church. This is an unacceptable use of a, of a public plaza uh, open space uh, to dedicate a, that, that church. Uh, the, uh, the second plan should be changed to convert the, the plan, quote, West End Plaza into, quote, West End Park. This is important. It's probably the most important thing I can say today because nobody else has mentioned it. Two, two existing plazas already exist near the West End Plaza. One is next to the metro station escalators. The other is in front of the George Mason University campus. There is no need for another plaza. More green space is needed, especially in this area, uh, and, and which will be, of course, at the at the at, at, at Linear Park uh, at the east end of Fairfax Drive. It will be right next to it. Regarding historic preservation. The Hispanic Commission is concerned about the loss of the Joyce, Joyce Motors building on the site, which is on the direct and essential of the historic buildings a, 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 a inventory. The Commission has recommended the county board, board to, to, to uh, begin a process for reviewing the, the inventory and provide the options for providing it, providing in situ all the essential uh, properties in the commercial inventory. There's no reason to change to for a study such as this. Anybody can nominate a, a property for designation as a new ordinance as a historic district overlay. Uh, despite the building's perceived important, nobody's bothered to do that for this yet for this building. They, they could still do it before the, the site plan is approved. So somebody needs to do that if they want to save it. You don't have to go moving the policy when it's quite obvious what to do. Um, note also that um, this has been an issue for two years. Also, if the applicant says that he's going to write the, uh, place the word Joey Motors right above the windows, that's absurd. Those will be real retail offices that the retail people are going to want to put their own Thank logo you, in Bird. front of. Not George Motors. Thanks, not Mr. Thank you, Mr. Bird. Not Joey Motors. All right. Our next speaker is David Schutz, followed by Scott Clark. This is absurd. And is my, micro my microphone is on? Yes. 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 Hi, I'm Dave Schutz. Uh, one of the things about going last is most of my thunder has already been stolen. Um, I'd like to associate myself with the remarks of Mr. Rasmussen, Ms. Alexander, Mr. Jorstedt. Um, I, am, I, I am the one who walked from the War Memorial to various of the parks shown on the bullseye diagram. Uh, and yes, I can assure you that um, there, there are 10 minutes or, or a number of the of the sites being relied on are 10 minutes or more by, by, by foot from Clarendon. We're moving in over a thousand units into this area. Um, that's a couple thousand people. Uh, parks existing in the area are not underutilized at this time. Uh, dropping another 2,000 people on them is, is gonna be substantial. So that's my reason for suggesting that we really ought not uh, keep the 2.16 uh, plan. Thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate your modeling the ability to yield time. <laughs> okay. Our next speaker is Scott Sklar, followed by William Gearhart. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, happy the day after Earth Day. <laughs> uh, so the Ashton Heights Civic Association, we have 600 homes and 150 apartments. And we border along Clarendon, along 10th Street North. I've lived in Ashton Heights for 38 years, living one block from 10th Street North. And as you know, I teach two <coughs> uh, graduate urban studies courses at GW here in North Arlington. Our Ashton Heights Civic Association has joined with our four sister civic associations, Lion Park, Lion Village, Courthouse, and Boston, uh, Virginia Square, all together for the first time about the Clarendon Sector Plan. 
supporting a 50,000 square foot park. Now I sent to you as part of the application to testify today, my, our joint five civic association press release, a fact sheet, and then my PowerPoint presentation on this in the committee of 100 last week from a loftier view focusing on the Clarendon sector plan. And again, we've all joined on this issue for the first time. Redevelopment of the Clarence sector is two buildings now being built, five more under consideration right now, another two on the come. So this is a huge step in urban densification. It's a signature development. We have some big issues we're confronting even before all this is built. I get calls on noise from rooftops uh, all the time now, and we're trying to actually push for violations that are never uh, sent to these rooftops so families don't get waken up in the middle of the night. So we have tensions already. Just think when we get these nine more buildings. Arlington staff is doing their best to drive setbacks, tapering in new buildings, and AHCA, Ashton Heights Civic Association, looks to the Arlington board to address extraordinary community benefits, which has to include native trees and plants surrounding these buildings and along the streets, and major set-asides within each of these five buildings for affordable housing. And I, I'm told that somehow they can't do it. I'm here to tell you virtually every single metropolitan area in the USA is moving towards larger open spaces in center cities and integrating affordable housing within mixed-use buildings, not standing alone not concentrated. We're years behind the time here. So what we're really, our signature issue is to ensure that the county owned land that has the fire station, we have the, the park around it and space on top of it. I do see it as one of the earlier speakers uh, mentioned and showed the picture of a real viable community center in this dense urban area that has multi-use potentially a community garden as well on top of the firehouse. And the, the concept that little overutilized parks surrounding Clarendon address this issue is really nonsense. And so we really need to uh, have places for concerts, events, a signature green spots in the midst of massive concentrated development. I want to be emphatically clear we who live next to and astride the center of Clarendon want a livable community as it changes and urbanizes. To us, this park is an absolute priority. The county can address the worthy goal of affordable housing by driving larger swaths as mandatory within these new buildings coming online. We have absolute unanimity within our civic association surrounding Clarendon. We urge you to set a high bar for livability, green space and community, energy savings and greenhouse gas emissions reductions, affordable housing within the upcoming built environment, and the administrative control of noise, light, parking to remake this new urbanization the very best model in Virginia and our nation. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Sklar. All right, our next and final speaker is William Gearhart. Mr. Gearhart, if you're with us, either uh, unmute or star six to unmute. Okay. And not seeing. All right. Well, um, thank you very much to all of our speakers. The conversation is now with the board. Um, you know, if Mr. Carantonis is ready, I might propose that we begin with a motion. I know there are a couple of items of discussion, but um, should board members wish to uh, deviate from the manager's recommendation, I think that could probably be best effectuated with an amendment to the main motion, and so I think we could most effectively structure our uh, conversation with one on the floor. I agree, Madam Chair. Let's, for the purposes of conversation, of, uh, of discussion, uh, uh, proceed with a motion, and then we amend as... Uh, as appropriate, because I believe what uh, what the amendments will be will be fitting within this motion as amendments. So, um, I will move the county manager's recommendation to adopt the 
uh, following elements associated with the clarinet sector plan update planning process. One, resolution attachment one of the staff report to adopt the 2022 clarinet sector plan and update to the 2006 clarinet sector plan attachment two of the staff report. Second, resolution attachment three of the staff, staff report to amend the general land use plan map and booklet attachments four and five of the staff report and third ordinance uh, attachment six of the staff report to amend reenact and recodify applicable provisions of the Arlington County zoning ordinance articles three nine and 18 including maps 9.25 through 9.212 which uh, is in this, these are in attachment seven of the staff report this is a motion Thank you so much. That's been seconded by Mr. DeFranti. Uh, Mr. Cantones, would you like to start with some discussion or questions? Uh, yeah, first of all, just, just in general, this is a, a long overview update of, uh, of this plan. Uh, it provides a blueprint for, for growth uh, in a place that has, you know, I, I will dare to say, is almost surprisingly excluded from the general patterns of growth in Arlington. Still, is dominated by low-value land use, by extensive surface uh, parking lots, and a distinct car center. Still, a distinct car center at uh, lifestyle, despite the fact that it's on uh, the uh, you know one of mo of our most important transportation assets, Metro. Uh, I definitely had the opportunity to talk with the uh, with. Um, the civic associations. I personally am uh, convinced that 216, uh, the option 216 that uh, would eliminate any uh, park is not a desirable option, and, and we can discuss it later. But all in all, I think this is a, a very, very good update on the historic preservation. I uh, we will have this discussion, I guess, uh, as we go forward. I see a lot of value to preserve the facade of uh, the Joyce Motors building, uh, but in an appropriate um, uh, in, in what I believe is a is a better location and uh, the way the plan is uh, proposing that. Um, but for that, I will leave it to the conversation now. I think we have uh, many aspects uh, to explore as they have been brought up in testimony. Thank you so much. Well, I, I might suggest it makes sense for us to begin with historic preservation. Uh, it's not necessarily the easier of the topics, but it is perhaps the more straightforward. So um, we can begin with some questions. Uh, I'm happy to get us started, which is, um, you know, I think as as referenced in the Planning Commission discussion, there's there's some conversation about facade preservation, and um, uh, I understand that within some corners of historic preservation, that's sort of seen as a dirty word. Um, but it's also my understanding that we have quite a few examples of successful facade preservation um, uh, here within the county, and I wonder if that's something that staff might be equipped to speak to a little bit today about some um, examples of what we've seen um, previously uh, in the county, and and uh, as examples of what might be expected out of facade preservation not just in um, perspective renderings, but in real life. Yes, uh, we can do that. I'm also joined by Lauren Ferris from Historic Preservation Staff, and uh, bear with me, I'll pull up uh, some visuals. Um, Great. Good afternoon to Ms. Ferris. Glad to have you with us. Good afternoon. So yes, we have a couple slides that can help answer uh, this question and kind of give an explanation of how historic facades have been done in Arlington County. Um, I think the slide 40 that you have right there, Brett, would be perfect. So over the past 20 years, Arlington County has been experimenting with its approach towards preserving historic buildings while allowing for new construction. Um, and here are some of those examples that we have. Um, so there are two commercial buildings you see in the image at the top left. They are located in Clarendon. Um, this site plan project ultimately helped protect these buildings through historic preservation easements, one of our strongest preservation tools, by conducting facade preservation with setbacks while allowing substantial new development on the site. These buildings are ranked as notable on the HRI. The Arlington Post Office at the top center is another Clarendon example that shows the success of full building preservation with new construction. The post office became a protected local historic district in 1984 and was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1986. This building is ranked as essential in the HRI. Lion Hall, the image at the top right, was part of the site plan project that involved the Arlington Post Office building. Mm -hmm. It effectively illustrates the preservation of a small-scale one-story commercial building with prominent new construction around it, and the building became a local historic district in 1988. This building is ranked as essential. 
the corner of Columbia Pike and South Walter Reed Drive, the image at the bottom left, is an example of the form-based code project that included the preservation of multiple historic commercial buildings and facades as part of a larger development project. These buildings are ranked as notable and altered non-historic. The Lee Gardens Shopping Center, the bottom center image, is an example of retaining historic architectural design elements in new construction. In 2007, the County Board approved this site plan for the property, which demolished the shopping center but salvaged the historic limestone panels that were then installed at the ground floor of the new building. This was also the approach with the Bob Peck Chevrolet showroom in 2008 with the retention of the diamond canopy in new construction. And lastly, the Three Sisters building right to the bottom right is an example of facade preservation with a minimum setback. The site plan project associated with the Three Sisters building also resulted in the protection of the Underwood building, um, which is the corner building with the, the red awnings that you see there in the image um, that was preserved with a historic preservation easement. So these are just some of the examples where we've had approved projects that show creative ways to do uh, to take historic buildings and incorporate them with new construction, with some practicing full building preservation. Um, in place, some having facade preservation with extensive or minimum setbacks, and mixing of historic architectural elements into the new design. Excellent. Thank you so much. This is really helpful to me, at least, and I appreciate um, pulling them together. I think the only question I have before we move on, and um, forgive me, this is such a basic one, uh, but could, could you talk to us a little bit about the philosophy in historic preservation um, behind the idea of why preservation of setbacks and sort of the in-situ nature of the building um, is important for the goals of telling the story. Sure. Um, I don't think we have any slides that really can kind of explain that, but, you know, based on what we came up with in the staff report that you all have seen is facade preservation allows for a certain level of flexibility. It's not a treatment, a preservation treatment, and there's really no guidelines nationally to follow. It's kind of to determine what's going to work for what the community is, is seeking to try and adapt a historic building to something possibly with new construction. And, and Ms. Harris, I'm so what, sorry if I could just interrupt you. I'm actually, so let me, I'll tip my hand. I am very inclined towards the idea of facade preservation here. I'm trying to understand um, the criticisms of it, so to speak. So um, I guess the question I would have is philosophically, um, what are the problems with what is sometimes called facade-ism? Why is it important uh, to, to preserve a building in situ? Thank sense? you for clarifying the yeah. question. Um, Facade preservation is seen as uh, it affects the integrity of the building and its historic significance. Um, whenever we're looking at uh, a property to determine if its historic significance, we look at seven aspects of its integrity. And when you move a building, um, you are affecting its integrity of association, its integrity of setting, its, in set, its uh, integrity of location. Um, and that really means that you're you're losing a level of of, a, of the full story of its history and its significance. Um, now, when and then when you end up doing that, it no longer can be um, considered uh, for something like a, a, a federal or state historic tax credits. Um, and um, it basically kind of tells like a false history of of a property. Um, and uh, you really would have to have some, some very good reasons to end up moving a building. In fact, anytime you move a building, that's always seen as the very last resort mm -hmm. towards possibly being demolished. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and again, it just starts to lose its historic context. Okay. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, Mr. Dorsey and then Mr. Carantonis. Thank you. <clears throat> very helpful conversation. So in, in looking at this issue, I want to get a little bit more into the actual uh, current Joyce Motors, but historic for being a Texaco service station back in, I believe it was 1949. Um, from what I understand, when uh, added to the HRI, the characteristics that made it um, worthy of its essential designation had little to do with its situation on the site, but more to do with it being the last remaining example of a pretty distinctive architectural style for gas stations that no longer existed, the porcelain enamel steel. Is that a fair characterization of what was the predominant reason why it was included on the inventory? 
Yes, very much it is. Um, the when looking at the Joyce Motors building when it was being surveyed in between 2006 and 2008. Um, the um, surveyors really noticed the, the level of um, intactness that it has. Um, and when you get down into the details of it, the building was constructed in 1949 and there were changes made about 10 or 15 years later, um, but that still had the, um, it still had the spirit of the building and its design. And even though that did have some minor changes done to the facade, it still had a, a high level of integrity with its material. Um, with its design, uh, workmanship, and again, that's part of the different ways that we look at a building when we're determining its historic significance. And again, um, uh, in fact, maybe, Brett, if you would be so willing to go to the slide that tells a little bit of the history of Joyce Motors, um, I believe it is slide, pardon us, it just says Joyce Motors Building for the description. So, um, so again, this building was built in 1949, and it was a, a great example of its building type, which was very popular from the late 1930s to 1950s. And, you know, it was a building that was constructed by John DeLashmet on um, property owned by Ashton Jones, um, one of the developers of Clarendon and several other residential developments in Arlington County. And this porcelain enamel panels that um, even the <clears throat> property owners talked about um, that was really a great way to kind of use corporate design um, that Texaco specifically used and many other gasoline service companies use nationwide. Um, it was inexpensive, it was durable, it was almost maintenance free, and um, it could be quickly applied to concrete block structures, which is what we have here with Joyce Motors. Um, it also allowed for it to be very, um, it would have been very modern and very flashy for a gas station, which would have gotten the attention of the travelers on 10th Street North. Um, and basically, when it was constructed, Clarendon had grown from a planned residential subdivision to a commercial, social, and cultural center of Arlington County. Um, but by the late 20th century, there was only about six of these um, types of structures in Arlington, and now this is really the last one in Arlington. Um, and it is significant for, although I know some people kind of are... Um, um, might find it interesting to, to consider it, but it is an aspect of our history. It definitely resembles the increasing dependence that Arlington County had on the automobile, as well as the commercial development of Clarendon and the growth of the subdivision. And so when the surveyors were looking at this, they they knew a little bit about what it's um, what it signified, as well as just being able to see this building and say, wow, this is a great example of this type of stream modern architecture, as well as this architecture for a service station, which would have been very flashy compared to maybe other service stations. Thank you so much. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, so Mr. Karen Tonis next. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the very, very insightful conversation. Um, I have two questions. The number one is, so uh, let's assume that preservation in C2 is in the plan, and that means that basically this uh, this part of of this of this block will be very difficult to redevelop. Um, who will be taking care of the asset as it is today? So the should we be worried that this asset will be just left to decay without any? remediation to this decay or what are the instruments? What does the historic preservation mean for the viability of preserving actually the building? So if this, uh, let me see if I can try and sum that up as much as I can. The um, Basically, we won't know what would happen to this building. The property owner would still continue to own it. They would still continue to find a use for it. And if this is not, if they find that it's not viable to retain this building in place to be able to do redevelopment, they can decide to tear it down and they could build a building that still is um, possible by right. So I believe that in the Planning Commission, there were many examples of this could be another CVS building. And that's something that we were considering when we were looking at this property, is that it would still be uh, the right of the property owner to do what they want with the property. And we cannot um, put any restrictions on them because this property is not protected by a local historic district and it's not protected by an easement. Therefore, it is, it, it is up to the property rights of the owner. Um, and so when we were looking at this and we were making our recommendations, we definitely had that possibility in our mind. 
And, um, you know, we felt that uh, we were being able to work with what we could with what was being proposed, as well as having some element of historic preservation to still give an idea that what was there and what was what was this area of Clarendon used for and, and how did it work for the community back in the 1940s and 1950s um, and how we've been able to adapt it to the needs that we need today. Thank you. Uh, and and with regards to what you referred to integrity of setting, um, how does a parking lot, a front loaded parking lot without more, how is that included in the preservation concept? So, for example, in other in situ, you know, situations, I can imagine a small placeta or, you know, something that has significant urban and contextual value uh, for for the building uh, that this is included and therefore in situ begins to be you know a, a value by itself uh, in this case how should we consider a front-loaded parking lot without any i mean at, at least not that i know of without any specifics that link the building to link it to the building and to the story that the building is telling us. That's a very good uh, detail that, that you're looking at. And I think it is something too important when we're looking at a historic building, it's not just the matter of preserving the building itself. It does have to have context to it around it. And that's the environmental setting. And sometimes that can always be a discussion that comes up. It's much easier to look at it with a residential property. We've seen a couple of them before where we have the building and then how much of the area do we end up retaining as well to kind of tell the full story so that it's not, you know, a, a historic house with, with a bunch of things built around it. So here we have the service station, the parking lot, the parking lot served to help the service station with customers and whatnot. I feel that if that was something to be considered, there, there, there might be a need to keep some of it. But again, I don't think that it would, I think it would, it would be something that would need to be discussed. It would need to be something that would be evaluated to find out what's, how could we still provide its context to the building? But again, it's, uh, you know, I think it's really challenging to say, well, should we retain this parking lot to be able to tell the story of a building? Mm -hmm. That's a tough one, and that's kind of a hard one to get a lot of people on board with. I think that if it was maybe the, the last gas station ever the maybe but I, I think it's a hard one to come up with thank you yeah thank you so much yeah, Ms. yeah I'll just kind of pursue that because I listening to this I realized um, if you want to preserve it in situ and 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 tell the story you know I, can, I mean the, the the parking lot I don't think anyone be, it's an ugly parking lot I hope every, everybody's I mean that's part of the context. I think most parking lots are ugly yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> So if we want to preserve that context, we need to preserve the ugly parking lot. To, to, to like pretty it up or something would actually be unfair to the context. Is that a reasonable thought? That is definitely a thought that would be considered in it. I think that there could be creative approaches to it. I think that, you know, um, there could be ideas of maybe mimicking what could have been a parking lot, but it not actually be an asphalt covered parking lot. I think that there could be some approaches. The question is, how much creativity do you want to have applied to this particular exactly. site in this type of example? Thank you. And if we're insisting on preserving it in situ exactly the way it is, that feels like cheating. Um, just saying, but they'll have this is a broader discussion. Could you talk a little bit about the um, what they are? What and of course we're not actually proving this building. This is going to come back to us. I, I realize that. But um, Mr. Orr talked about cleaning up the the, the signature. Um, I, I, are they ceramic? I'm, I'm sorry, I forget what they're called that they're made of. The porcelain enamel panels. Yeah. Um, from from what. Um, uh, or as representatives have been telling us, and we have been in discussions with them multiple times on, you know, really how to kind of perfect their first design that they wanted to present to the public. Um, uh, they are asking to, um, they would be uh, removing the panels, they would be cleaning them. I believe they'd be removing the paint off of them. They also have agreed to the idea of if there's any that are too damaged that they would find actual porcelain panels that are out there that are similar um, to replace them in kind. Um, there's also a lot of other details like the fenestration pattern, 
um, as well as um, retaining some type of garage opening um, that could be really kind of cool and design when you're adapting that space to something other than a service station. There's also some really great details. Um, I can't remember what they're called. They're bumpers really to prevent people from smashing into the building. They're, they're saying to retain those. So they are keeping all of the major character defining features of the building. The only question is, is that when you're looking at preservation, again, there's not really any direction. There's no, um, there's no kind of national acceptance of what facade preservation is. And I think it can really be challenging um, to try and actually say that it's true preservation if you're only keeping a certain part of it. But when you are retaining a building in situ, then you really are going to be removing a lot of other opportunities or require a very high level of creativity creativity to make it work. Right. And and actually, if you did that, you'd probably still need to clean up those porcelain. And I don't know if anybody would. So um, to, to sort of change this, and when we come to that building, come just, so for me, and a lot of this is individual, um, it would be really helpful to see some of those pictures, like the original one from back in 1949. Um, so what's wrong? What would be the possibility of having a historic plaque or something with pictures that actually show what it looked like so that people can see. I think this Joyce Motors site will really catch people's eye. Um, and I'm, anyway, it's, it's interesting. We will get more to that. But is that another possibility for historic preservation? And actually really setting it in the context is to have a picture of where it was and what it was like then and maybe an explanation. That's a very good point to bring up. There's some really great opportunities to do creative ways of site interpretation. And as we were coming towards the end of our conversations with Orr and his team, we definitely were talking about the idea of incorporating some type of um, sign that might be in one of the like uh, in one of the windows that could possibly show what it used to look like. Maybe have a have a screen that continues to move and tells the history, gives other photographs. Maybe we have all of the um, plans of the building, you know, sharing that with the community to help tell that story. And I know that they were open to that. I cannot remember. It's been a while since we've had those discussions, but all of those things would come up during the site plan project. Right. And so we'll, we could have those discussions later. I think we've, we've Great, probably yeah. talked about this quite a bit. <laughs> um, and um, I felt I had one more, but I can't even remember what it is. So I, I know, Historic Preservation Spencer. Master Plan. Oh, great. Okay. Let's just, I did want to bring up that point. We are working on a re, re, renewing our Historic Resources Master Plan, yes? That's right. Yes, so, yes, we are. So I will just park, and I think that's where we, this is a huge discussion, and including that inventory, we need to have that discussion as we work on that, um, you know, when that comes to us later, because these are major issues for this particular site, for some of the reasons I think I probably hinted at. I do not think it would be a good idea to preserve it in C2. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to move us on to the other big topic of conversation, um, which is the, the uh, multiple models and renderings for um, the potential for uh, the, the proper or the parcel that is currently home to the fire station. Uh, perfect. Mr. Wallace, you hit it exactly where I was hoping. Um, so we have a number of items for discussion. I'm going to let Mr. DeFerrand just start us off with any questions, and then I'll have one myself. Sure. <clears throat> so the... <clears throat> The first, the first question, I guess, is for Mr. Wallace. Um, I mean, our 2006 plan, uh, I think I'm correct, Verizon still owns that building. So um, at, what has changed is that at some point we thought that they were going to move off of that site, and we no longer do. Is that correct, that they still own that site? And that would be a limitation on the scale of, of the of the largest of the parks that is, is part of the plan? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and then um, that's helpful. Um, the other question I have is, um, is if we include figure 2.16 with the co-location of housing, that does not preclude the possibility, if there were a, a, an effort to move forward, of um, a site plan that could be submitted that would still, you know, if Verizon were to move, there's still the possibility that we could get the larger park if the um, those who want to develop the private spaces in that figure, that same size for all four of these figures, want to do that in relation to the community benefits. There still is a possibility of a park. We are just by adding figure 2.16, allowing for the possibility of co-location of housing. Is that right? Correct. Um, as you stated, um, for our conversations with the applicant, 
the Verizon building is to remain in place for the foreseeable future and not to redevelop. And in fact, they're transferring their density to the Wells Fargo building uh, just to the north um, there on Washington Boulevard. Um, but I guess it, it could be a possibility as a, a very long term solution that the Verizon building could come down or relocate. Um, so that is a, a, a long term option. Thank you. That's helpful. It sounds, I think your tone sort of reflected that it might not be the most likely of options, but from uh, I guess that's those are all the questions I have. You have thank you. Have so more. yeah, if I could ask just a question myself, um, Mr. Wallace, because of the inclusion of the two point one eight option, is it correct that irrespective of the inclusion of two point one six, this um, the zoning and glove designation for this parcel as part of the amendments with its adoption would reflect the potential for residential with or yes. without the inclusion of two point one six, right? Correct. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and then a, a um, very specific question. Uh, if we were to, as one commenter asked, rename figure 2.17 standalone fire station to save fire station, you know, with surface park or co-located with park, um, is that something we could effectuate pretty easily just through a, a friendly amendment to Mr. Karen Jonas's motion? Or, or do you need to, does that have cascading implications for elsewhere in the plan? Mm -hmm. So this is a recommended option that's been in the, <clears throat> excuse me, my allergies are bothering me today. Um, this is a, a recommended option that is in the sector plan and um, in the description of this scenario, we do indicate uh, the potential for rooftop public spaces. So um, that is already in the draft plan that's before you today. Okay, so I think for the purposes of, I think as one of our commenters noted, I imagine as Mr. Weir and, uh, uh, articulated at some point, we will be coming back when it comes time to, to um, actually plan for the future of the site to, to conceive of what was envisioned. I imagine we'll be looking at this exact page. Uh, and so it may be helpful for it to say, not standalone fire station, but instead to be entitled fire station co-located with park. Um, my last question, and then I'm gonna turn it to my colleagues. Um, Probably for Mr. Manager, let Ms. Smith may be able to, to speak to this. What are the next steps uh, for um, Fire Station 4? Um, I know you're working on the CIP right now. Would you characterize this as something that is um, imminently to be renovated or redesigned uh, some point in the next decade further out? Um, we're, we're still weighing that, but it on my list of fire stations that need attention, even though this is the oldest one in our inventory, it is not the first one on my list to be focused on. As I've mentioned in the past, the west end of Columbia Pike is probably likely to get more attention. Okay, that's really helpful, thank you. I think I saw Mr. Carr and hand go up first and then we'll go to Mr. Dorsey. Uh, Mr. Wallace, you mentioned uh, on, on figure 217, uh, you mentioned some good reasons why uh, a collocation of a fire station and on top of that residential on the footprint of the fire station with uh, maintenance of the, I mean, with keeping the, the park on the left side, uh, why this is not um, likely or, you know, not, not preferable or desirable. So I, I, I get, I get that it will be difficult to, uh, you know, to replace a fire station because this is an expensive item and build on top of that uh, affordable housing and have the, you know, the entrance uh, and, uh, and the elevator uh, shafts properly solved, etc. But is it is it appropriate to preclude that completely and not to um, leave the option there and do uh, and, and say uh, the and not go with a recommendation potential uh, collocation for other public uses which would include of course a public uh, a rooftop a, you know park like rooftop or other uses i'm uh, quite persuaded by uh, the fact that you know what Mr. Weir mentioned that said, I mean, having a solo far parking station at walking distance from Metro is not necessarily, you know, a, a desirable planning outcome. And uh, this is what I'm trying to explore here. Yeah, so as I mentioned, and um, you're referring to figure 2.17 okay. with the standalone fire station. This is, um, I, I explained the ground floor requirements for the fire department uh looking at the ground floor plan there uh, which would yield a, approximately a 10,000 square foot uh 
public space on the corner of Irving and 10th Street. Uh, once once you factor in the uh, the sidewalk and the streetscape, you would uh, could be able to achieve uh, roughly that size park space. Um, and looking at the 3D model view, this is just uh, one uh, concept conceptual model here um, showing a standalone uh, fire station that's approximately three stories in height. Um, and, and again, this is just a conceptual uh, model, but you know we could potentially explore uh, rooftop public spaces above a fire station. We'd have to work uh, very closely with our Department of Parks and Recreation and Fire Department because um, you need to think about access to rooftops would require elevators, uh, stairs for egress. There's a parrot pit, you know, security, you know, there would probably need to be some type of fencing. Uh, so there's a lot of things that we'd have to consider, including some of the other uh, rooftop needs for the fire department, including any kind of mechanical pit house or any kind of solar PV panels. Um, so the, it's something that we have in the plan text that we could potentially explore, but it, it will require a lot of coordination with uh, both the fire department and, and parks and rec staff. And, and collocation with housing there, so with the fire station in, in, in there, because the problem is that the way it's presented right now is that there's, this is either look, the, the fire station or housing, right? Correct. Yeah, it's, as not, I, yeah. it's not both. Correct, this would be a standalone fire station with uh, potential public spaces ab above it, as shown in the the model here. The the concept, as I described earlier, to have co-located housing above a fire station would look something like this, um, understanding all the ground floor uh, spatial needs for the fire department along North Hudson Street, um, you know, which would make it more logical to have residential on North Irving Street. Um, but I will point out, though, that in our Heights map and the alternative that we've provided here. Um, this wouldn't preclude anything creative from happening. If you know, once there was an architect and an engineering team on board, if they were to figure out some way to 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 do this to provide uh, housing above a fire station and some amount of public space, this the Heights map alternative here uh, would would permit that from happening. But um, at a conceptual level, in our studies throughout the process. This is what we had come up with again, working with the fire department. Um, but again, that that could change if you know once a design team is is on board. So, so the description under what was that two seventeen uh, that says um, potential rooftop parking space that doesn't preclude anybody with coming with a creative solution to uh, add housing on top of that while preserving the park space that is on the left side there correct. and enhancing it, that. Correct, there could be a creative solution. And the heights map here, these are maximum building heights. So the new alternative map could permit heights well above that three-story model that was shown previously up to 75, 95, and 110 feet with a permitted additional height above the 110 feet um, in exchange for community benefits up to uh, 128 feet as identified with the red uh, polygon here. So again, if, if there is a creative solution, the, the, the map shown here would allow such a scenario to develop. Okay, thank you for now. We go to Mr. Garcia and then to Ms. Garvey. Thank you. <clears throat> that was actually a very helpful uh, line of questioning, Mr. Carantonis and Mr. Wallace. So it seems to me, though, that one thing that would preclude one of those really creative solutions, which I agree <clears throat> conceptually should be possible, one of the things that would preclude it would be if there were no uh, discussion of our desiring that uh, housing exists with other functions on this site. So without plan, guidance, or language that indicates that we desire to see all of these things put together, no one is likely to come up with a plan to deliver it. So with that, in mind, um, is there a way that we can maybe think of maybe adding some language to the text somewhere else, inviting that level of des design creativity to try and effectively meet all of these goals for open space, uh, necessary uh, public facilities like the fire station, as well as potentially options for housing? I 
That's so, so in other words, sort of taking these these concept maps, understanding how they're read, and you know maybe some sort of a, an addendum somewhere. And I'm not wanting to wordsmith it today. We can we can do it at any point. Um, but to somehow note that we invite uh, proposals that you know try to meet all of the established community goals on this site. Okay, I'm, and just looking at figure 2.18 um, with a slightly modified footprint to resemble something of in 2.17, I suppose this scenario, and it, in addition to the heights map, um, the way it was drawn could permit an all-in-one scenario. Um, so that's something to consider. Mm -hmm. Right, I guess from, just to be clear, I'm not suggesting that we draw another scenario. I, Get it? We're a little bit late for that, but illustrating that we, as you just discussed with Mr. Karen Tonus, even though we have not conceptually been able to design something that accommodates everything, there is more than a small chance that there is a creative design team that can. And just noting that we are open to such creativity that allows for the inclusion of all of the preferred community uh, needs for this site in one in one uh, in one concept we can we can use language verbal language not schematic diagrams to to actually signal that right i think ms smith may also want to weigh in on this is that thank yeah. you uh, we can certainly um illuminate on the uh the text and describe that as a future aspirational vision um i think we can you know continue to clarify the the intricacies of this site but i think that we can we can add that to the text to clarify um, the intent of what you're describing here today to try and achieve all uh, multiple elements yeah i was trying to make it easy thank you that would be great and i i mean i'll also ask just for head nods around i mean i think this is very much the will of the board and so hopefully the minutes of this meeting will reflect that um, you know, if possible, we can uh, certainly not draft from the dais, but indicate that it is our direction, actually, that is very much our preferred outcome. So I think that is, uh, I, I don't see any uh, dissent from that general perspective. Okay. Um, Ms. Garvey, next. Yeah, thank you. I think I'm going to just kind of continue in the same vein a little bit. Um, yes, I, I think that's great. I mean, one of the things that I think I've heard, just to sort of put it a different way, a lot, a number of the people coming to talk to us want us to take things off the table and have less flexibility. And I'm never comfortable with that. And when you look at all of these possibilities, there might be something else. Maybe that Verizon site will go. We you know we understand it's not, but it could disappear someday. We sure would want to be able to take advantage of that and not have to tie ourselves in knots to adapt something that we've already adopted. So, and as a board member, I always want to have maximum flexibility. Whenever people tell me I, we don't want you to be able to talk about this, I always kind of get my back up, and, and I just don't respond well to that. I think maximum flexibility is a really good thing, continuing considering all the things we're trying to do. Um, Real quickly, because I think staff, if you don't have it prepared, um, but the staff did pull up for me, um, I think it's slide 36 maybe in your deck as a backup on the PSMP access gap hotspot map. Do you have that easily? It says on my, my email it's slide 36. If it's not easy to pull up, then um, we won't take the time to do it. But what it shows is where the gaps are for, um, for space. Uh, maybe not. Okay. There it is. Yeah, there it is. There it is. Um, I mean, I thought this was sort of interesting because I know everybody wants parks. We all do. It would be great if everywhere could be a park. Um, but looking at this, while this area has the least affordable housing of any of our quarters, it's doing much better for access to space than a lot of others. You can argue that you don't like the space, that you have to walk too far, or it's not quite right. But even, this kind of points out the things that we're looking at. And as a board member, as this board here, we have a lot of things to consider, including the entire county and, and needs that need to go everywhere, including housing and parks. And we need to, I think, make every decision, particularly this kind of planning decision, keeping in mind all of the different needs that we need to be addressing. And to take anything off the table right now, I think, would be poor governance. So I'm going to be fine to um, accept the uh, and uh, happily uh, vote for the staff recommendation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. DeFranti. Um, uh, I, you mentioned the possibility of a title change to 2.17. I'm kind of ready for, to just offer a really brief concluding remarks. If that's, <laughs> um, so um, I'm mindful of the Planning Commission's um, 
views and the residents who come to share them, uh, share views about uh, the one scenario co-location with housing. I've lived near that park in San Francisco and it's, it, that uh, was referred to and it's a great park. Um, ultimately, I just have, I just struggle to get around the 3% affordable housing in the area. I know that it is public land and not private land. I just, I'm challenged to get around that. I lived in a part of McLean that was too many World Bank people, including one of my parents. But, you know, is that diversity? And what are we doing um, to, with our policy decisions with respect to that? So ultimately, that's where I land. I also think that absolutely there are equity issues with respect to access to, to park and open space. Uh, I just uh, I feel that this is an area where we want to keep that flexibility and I also want to keep the possibility of of uh, that additional tool with respect to affordable housing, even though there's the public and private land question. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Um, Mr. Dorsey? Sure, I'll do concluding comments as well, <clears throat> if it's okay. Please, I'd welcome that. All right. So, uh, Ms. Garvey, thank you for speaking about flexibility. You know, I see it as something that's a benefit not only to me as a board member, it's a benefit to any board, but it's also a benefit to the entire community as things change, you want to know that there are land use plans that govern areas that accommodate options to meet whatever the most uh, pressing needs of the community are or the most acute needs of the community are. Uh, that said, I feel that we're accomplishing that by uh, being able to present a number of options, but also being very clear with the text of our overall intent to accommodate uh, all of these opportunities. And if uh, someone can come up with a creative way of delivering it on site, it's great. To speak to the other controversial issue in terms of in situ uh, preservation of the Joyce Motor site, I found that to be a fascinating discussion. And we'll just note that uh, preserving uh, in situ what exists now would also be preserving a, uh, a land use design that is clearly in disfavor in Arlington County for very good reasons. So I am not sure. Uh, how in any way it would be responsible in this specific case to do that. And I think that just speaks to the larger issue. Uh, in situ preservation uh, attached to certain uh, properties in our inventory is, I believe, too, uh, too broad a solution for what uh, we, we learned from Ms. Ferris is a very um, contextual issue. You know, what makes something historic and worthy is going to be unique to the property and what makes it worthy of preservation in whatever way is going to be unique and requires that fine lens of looking with granularity and policies with broad brush strokes are probably not going to meet the public's interest very well. So in this case, uh, I'm, I'm not actually interest in, interested in this or any upcoming update of making any broad declarations that don't recognize the contextual nature of this. And I realize for some people who are really uh, studious in historic preservation, that, that's a risk because the less concrete the protections are, the more there will be a fear, not unfounded at all, that things will just go away. And so I think we need to figure out how to up our game to ensure that there are options for preserving what matters, that is contextual and circumstantial, without using those really blunt tools that are really not appropriate. So with all of that, uh, great work by staff. I appreciate the update, understanding that the uh, relatively recent plan of 2006 um, could even be improved with new information and knowledge. And I think this very much does it. And I look forward to voting yes. Thanks so much. I'll give just a couple of comments and then give the maker of the motion the last word. I really appreciate the discussion here, everyone's involvement in it. Um, you know, I think my colleagues have, have well expressed where I am, which is the opportunity to allow for things to change in the delivery of emergency services, in what housing might look like, in our ability to co-locate things. Um, I take a lot of confidence from the fact that this is not highest on the manager's list um, uh, as the next fire station to be redeveloped. If I thought that, you know, we were about to start 
talking next month uh, with the CIP about imminently um, constructing some some set of uh, multiple uses on this site, um, I, I might feel a little uh, more confident that, that limiting those decisions would be appropriate. But, but here, um, I think we would be foreclosing something. And, and I actually think, although it is not cons my where I've landed is not consistent with the Planning Commission's recommendation, I was very taken by the, the way Chairman Weir characterized it, which is to say, um, certainly given the proximity to the metro, we would be remiss if we thought of even one use. So perhaps we can take it even further and say we'll be remiss to think only of two, at least when it comes to everything that could potentially come forward. Um, but I do appreciate those from the neighborhood that we've heard today talk about the importance of open space to you and to the community. Um, and to Mr. Sklar's point about the desire for more integrated housing, um, I often find if something seems to be an innovative and thoughtful practice uh, in use all around the nation and Arlington isn't doing it, there's usually a reason for it. And in this case, we are from inclusionary zoning policies um, by uh, the law of the Commonwealth of Virginia, although we do our best through our affordable housing ordinance and other strategies to try to get mixed income housing wherever we can, because like you said, that is also very supportive of strong communities. Um, uh, the final thing I'll note too, just this has been a really interesting conversation on the historic preservation and just want to express my appreciation for the HLRB and for the Planning Commission. Um, I think this was very thoughtfully explored. Um, I am going to I'm probably going to regret making this analogy because it already sounds like a like a war on cars hyperbole. But I can't help but think as we're talking about this, and particularly with that you know really thoughtful description Ms. Ferris gave about how what's historic here is that it embodies the growth of the subdivision and the increasing reliance on automobiles, right? This is making me think about what we've been wrestling with with Confederate markers, right? Which is how do we acknowledge that history, learn from that history, um, uh, and, and teach about that history without uh, in some cases, literally putting it on a pedestal, or in this case, kind of preserving um, everything that is uh, contrary, as, as Mr. Um, uh, Dorsey said, you know, not only disfavored, but contrary to our goals, right? Um, the, knowing what we know now about the, effort, the efforts to, in fact, um, redress some of the exclusionary policies on which the growth of the subdivision was premised, um, knowing that in an age of, uh, of a climate crisis, that um, you know, all of those policies that, that embodied the increasing reliance on the automobile um, you, you know, formed our country in some ways, but also put us uh, on a path that, that it is now incumbent upon us collectively in 2022 to Address. So I think it's incredibly important that we learn from it, and I really associate myself with with Ms. Garvey's um, uh, comments about the interest in interpretive signage. Um, uh, we don't make sector plans with any particular applicant in mind, but I will note that I found it helpful that the owner of that site uh, was was nodding, nodding enthusiastically as well. And so I think the opportunity to 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 I loved the way you put it, Ms. Ferris. Tell the story, not tell a false history, but tell the actual history um, through that skillful signage. Um, um, uh, and other tools of historic um, uh, recognition, if not the formal tool of historic preservation in situ. So um, I'm, I'm pleased to be able to support the motion. Um, I do think the spirit of conversation around the, the aspirations we have for the Fire Station 10 site um, will be well captured uh, in the record. And I know I think our staff is very much on the same page. So um, I am hoping we're you know, still a few years out from really entertaining with spe specificity. Um, what's going on that site, and I'm hoping that that allows a little more time for creativity to um, germinate uh, and and some some good solutions to come forward. So with that, Mr. Talk, Mr. Talk is Mr. Karen Donis. The last word goes to you, sir. Um, so thank you, uh, thank you for the thorough discussion. Um, I don't believe that I would have a, a majority to propose the removal of uh, 216, uh, but I, ju I just want to. Uh, to state that the element of a park, even if it's a smaller park, is an important, you know, statement in a site plan, in a sector plan. It uh, tells us tells a little bit about the intention of the board. Uh, and while I, I perfectly understand what Ms. Garve is proposing and preserving flexibility in a, you know, a very dynamic place with a quite you know peculiar situation with the Verizon building which is old and you know is at the end of its uh, you know useful life in my opinion and uh, you know you, we should be thinking about what happens next there uh, not only about the fire station but also about the adjacent building there uh, I think it's uh, making a statement that we want to see some uh, uh, green space we want to see a, a this type of use along 10th street which is a pretty urbanized place that very dense uh, 
would be this would be in my book uh, an appropriate response to the whole mix of uses. Uh, I also recognize uh, for me it's also a matter of principle that we have to become able to collocate affordable housing on top of public assets like a fire station. Uh, lots of cities uh, achieve that. We have done it in Roslyn, uh, granted with, you know, uh, you know, special conditions, uh, especially the density that is on top of there, of, uh, of that of that place there. Uh, but uh, we shouldn't uh, just shut the door to this. Uh, this uh, this should should be our our um, you know the standard expectation collocation is is very important and actually one of the major strategies to um you know be consistent with the affordable housing master plan uh, i also think that there is a significant or let's say significant potential for affordable housing uh in mixed use uh, in a mixed mixed income situation in the in the other in the other uh, blocks that we have uh uh, plant in this uh, update. Uh, we haven't spent any time discussing the major improvement on the Fairfax Drive uh, um, linear park or linear plaza public space there. I am uh, absolutely excited about this. I think this is one of the boldest deliverables of this plan. This is a definitely a, a big departure from the previous linear park, which was the which is the Clarendon Plaza, which is, you know, a, a public space sandwiched between two, you know, very busy streets. And that doesn't make it really a very attractive, very accessible public space, not a place where you want to spend too, too much time there. Uh, while the new linear park there is for me a absolutely a gorgeous deliverable and I and I'm very excited to see that uh, going forward and creating a, a quality of life that is uh, uh, that that the neighborhood will be very proud of. So, uh, pending of more conversation when these side plans will be coming about the historic preservation has been, uh, we, we have talked a lot. I, I align with uh, uh, all of you, my colleagues, uh, on uh, on how this uh, corner should be, or how choice motors should be treated. Uh, I think it's appropriate uh, to put it on the corner uh, and for all the, the reasons have been mentioned already. So, uh, that that would be for me. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Carantonis. And with that, I believe we are ready for a vote on your motion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay, that carries unanimously. Thank you again to all involved and who joined us today to share perspectives. Um, I believe, uh, Mr. Uh, Clerk, that that is the final item to come before the board. Is that, that correct? Is the final item. All right. In that event, we are adjourned until we join at 3 p.m. on Tuesday for our recess meeting. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.